my pleasure to welcome our uh, plenary speaker of the day two, uh, Dr. Alisa Durgarayan. Let me introduce our plenary speaker. Alisa Durgrain, ma'am, he, he is a trainer of ESL, EFL, ESP, and also a teacher trainer, global educator, and international speaker. He did her doctorate at American State Pedagogical University. After KH Abhiyan uh, Pedagogical Sciences, and he, she took her uh, MAs in the fields of psychology and foreign languages. And she is an LS, uh, ESL teacher at uh, Residan Basic School, N11 after William Saroyan, and ESL trainer at Sky English Lecturer at Elta in University in Krish Republic, Republic, and Dean of the Faculty. Conflict and Peace at World University of Leadership and Management Teacher Trainer in many countries. She is really uh, she is a teacher trainer at Edu America British Council American Branch, IT, TI America uh, Armenia, Armenia etc. She has taken part in many different international conferences as a speaker in different international projects as an EFL trainer. And she is also the author of many scientific articles in the field of teaching English as a second foreign language. Pedagogy. Currently, she is a volunteer in different international projects and companies such as HETT, Edu Armenia, uh, especially during war period, uh, Elta University, etc. She is in lifelong education. And she's also training on Tesol and TKT modules, uh, CETFL program at uh, American University in Armenia, business English course. She has participated in different international projects as an EFL, ESL, ESP trainer. And she is training foreign, um, she has trained foreign students and teachers, professors, et cetera. Ma'am, uh, Alisa, ma'am, really, uh, Alice, ma'am, really, we feel very much happy to have you as a resource person for this today's uh, uh, international conference. And uh, ma'am, now the session is yours to begin your uh, thought-provoking speech, ma'am. OK, thank you for the introduction. Good morning, one more time. Uh, Good morning. It's ma also a pleasure for me to be here and also to try to uh, represent a very important and at the same time a very interesting a topic because um, being a psychologist, being an educator, it's very important one not only for teaching, not only for learning or transferring some kind of education or knowledge or skills, but at the same time, uh, being a psychologist, it means uh, also a very important thing, first of all, for you as an identity. Because for a person, it's not only important to be educated, but also to be able to be like a person who can solve his or her problems alone, not only alone in some cases, also with the help of the friends, but also to be able to be cautious to understand every kind of uh, simple kind of problem. Uh, that's why today we are going to talk a very important um, topic, which is called like identity crisis. And let me at first share my screen and then we shall <coughs> we shall continue our topic and now just to be mm -hmm. okay uh just a question do you see my screen is it visible for you Yes, ma'am, it is visible, visible. Okay, it's great. Uh, now we are going to talk about the identity crisis. Later, I will make it full screen. Uh, but at first, let's uh, start what is identity. Uh, is it in like, a, like a definition of a word, of a person, of someone, or it's going to be like something that really we need to explore, to investigate, and to know more. 
um, having different kinds of definitions starting like it's a person can be uh, in some cases it can be like a personality different this is it has different kinds of meaning starting from the aims that usually people have starting from the goals or objectives in some cases also no outcomes even the stress um, different kinds of distresses or any kind of failures our success and many other things can be everything can be like in a globe in the framework of identity because it's a personality with all the sides with all characteristic features that usually we have and it is called like an identity it uh, differs depending on what part, on what sphere, or what point of view we are going to explore the identity of a human person. And according to it, we are going just to know and investigate more and more details about the identity. Uh, now let's go and start about another thing about the crisis. Because in many cases, it is said that crisis, it can be like a solution of a problem. Crisis can be uh, another success of a person, depending on can be positive and negative things. And many psychologists have explored this question, this problem, and have different kinds of words on it. Uh, today, a little bit, I will uh, talk about only Eric Erickson, one of the fam most famous psychologist in the world because Eric Erickson was the one who uh, paid more attention to the stages of the identity and the, at the same time to the development of the identity. In other cases, we, uh, in other words of psychologists, we can see uh, the stages of identity, how the person develops starting from um, before birth uh, and after birth time and during the whole life, but let's a little bit uh, pay more attention to the development of identity from the point of view of Eric Erickson. Because he was a fundamental psychologist, uh, psychoanalyst, who uh, for the first time uh, brought the fundament of uh, identity cruises, starting not only describing the person with it. Um, Features, but at the same time trying to uh, give a um, real description of the personality. And also we introduced the ideas of identity crisis because um, we tried to give not only the description, but at the same time uh, what are the sources and how can be the description of identity crisis because it is connected with the life crisis crises and in this case it can be just uh, described like a life crisis because only having this the uh, people the human the person uh, who just recognizes or this trying to describe this or her condition at the same time, especially in the framework of crisis, uh, he sometimes has a barrier because it's a barrier of life stage crises. And according to it, the psychologist or the person who is working with this person can just identify it at the same time, find out what is the problem and while uh, investigating the problem, they can come to a solution and solve this problem. And especially, it's very important part from is not all going to all the stages through the identity crisis. Um, for example, we can just describe the midlife crisis, which I see uh, one of the most important periods of the person is the person where you are consciously knowing uh, where you are, what do you want, and where you are going, uh, what uh, are your goals, 
uh, what in general do you want to learn from the life of what you have achieved? Uh, is cases um, in order to understand uh, the psychology of Ericsson from the point of view of identity of uh, crisis. Let's go uh, see what can we need in this psychology. A sense of identity which helps people to interact, to um, can play, reduce the confusion, anxiety, guide a person's choices. It, in a nutshell, it can just uh, help the people to go through and to know more about their identity, about their choices. And according to these choices, they can come to a real uh, and also at the same time uh, such kind of solutions that they will not only just solve their problem, but at the same time reduce uh, the uh, possibility of uh, being in crisis. And on the other hand, Ericsson just um, argued that can help to reject incongruent uh, self evaluations because he said that in order to come out to overcome the age crisis, the identity crisis, it's very important to be flexible and not to stress only for a strong identity, just giving too much importance and at the same time too much let's say attention to that I am in an identity crisis uh, I can't do this one like uh, in some cases uh, to think negatively from this point of view that's why it's very important thing to think about the identity uh, crisis from the point of like positively and um, just to be flexible in order to be able to solve it um, and in some cases to describe, to realize it, to accept it like something, like a problem that really you would like to solve um, as a usual problem. And because when you pay much more and more attention to it, it can just deepen and deepen and in there will be time and there will be no other solution you can find, or even if there are any kind of solution, you will just think that it's not enough for you to um, solve this problem. So that's why everything knows from the surface, but not to go so deep. You can go deeper and deeper in order to find the source, the roots of it, but not so much. And uh, let's go and find out first of all uh, what is symptoms, what can be the symptoms of um, having uh, identity crisis. Because uh, sometimes we say that identity crisis can be like a confusion and unsettled situation um, for identity, for exploring and developing in some cases. Why not? helping them to know more about the identity. But at the same time, we can have some kind of uh, symptom that really can work for us in order to know more about identity crisis. And uh, sometimes uh, in the literature, you can find different kinds of um, um, sources, different kinds of maybe uh, books or work or researches uh, which can tell you a lot of things about the identity crisis. But at the same time, uh, in some cases, we can say that identity crisis uh, can um, usually occur when there is a change in person's life and can happen at any time, uh, starting from uh, going to school, which can be a crisis for a seven or six year old child when for the first time he opens the door of the classroom and enters, starting from um, the maybe, maybe a little bit when you are adult and you can face which kind of problem when you enter the university or when you get married or when you want to get adapted after your marriage or for after the first 
uh, birth of um, the birth of your first child, etc. Um, it's very important because it can also be a way to structure some parts of our lives and choices and to make uh, more manageable. Uh, in some cases, for example, if I uh, think from my point of view as a teacher or as a trainer, uh, in order to find some solutions, I can think that it's really an identity crisis or when I'm getting a new job and I try to be accustomed to this new place, it's also uh, going to be like an identity one. Uh, and in my uh, identity can include also being an extreme outdoor person or make travel plans or um, why not to learn something, uh, some uh, new information or and maybe uh, let's say it's not short, not deep for a profession, but maybe something um, I will be interested in dancing, I don't know, or cooking or something, this also will be. And also it's important for social connections or overall, overall well-being because it can often be tied to communities like religion, political or social values, a shared language, cultural experiences and more. And um, in this case, when you have strong communities, you are better positioned to build and to have your place in the world and also to build strong social connections. And it, at the end, like an outcome of it, it can bring like it's kind of relationships can help straighten your mental fitness, your mm, physical health, your mind, your ideas, and why not to set up new goals and to go ahead. Uh, in some cases, uh, in order to know uh, if you are having a crisis, uh, identity crisis or um, not, some, sometimes we can be even in the middle of it without not realizing that there is a crisis or so just explain, claiming about it that, oh, well, why it has happened, why it is it, etc., etc. And in some cases, um, maybe different kinds of symptoms for it. For example, starting from the low self-esteem or in some cases, not feeling a sense of purpose or having no idea or no um, sense of living uh, because identity crisis can have its uh, positive and negative sides at the same time. It can be positively when you try to find a solution uh, or when you want something new in your, some changes in your life, but at the same time from the negative uh, point of view, you can have um, also negative results, uh, even in some cases a person can go to suicide uh, in order just uh, thinking that this is the only solution for the problem. And let's, <clears throat> let's go and look at the symptoms at identity crisis. Um, and there are some kinds of um, points of view or maybe points that can help you really to go through asking some questions yourself in order to find out really it's going to be a, a identity crisis or not. The first one is going to be about the questioning who you are. Uh, overall or with regard to certain life aspects such as relationship or age or career. Meaning, uh, from my point of view, I can just have uh, what kind of relationship my family, my, my family members, our relationship with my children, with my husband, or uh, with other family members. <coughs> Wait. Um. <coughs> From the point of view of career, I can just speak about my career. Let's say stairs where I am. I'm still downstairs. 
or I am growing up, on what stage I am in my career, have I achieved anything, and everything just try to discuss, to analyze from this point of view. The next stage goes to you are experiencing great personal conflict with the questioning of who you are or your role in society. Because at first I can just take a sheet of paper, a pen, and write down um, like sometimes uh, we think, I remember sometimes when someone asked me, can you tell me, write something about your biography, who you are? Who am I? Or there is a very interesting uh, icebreaker. Sometimes we ask the participants, please um, throw a star, uh, write down five facts about you. I think from the first side, it's a very interesting and it's very too easy, I'd say, task for me. But when you draw a star, I've tried to remember what five important facts I can say. I can tell other people about me. Mm -hmm. Let me think of maybe I am this one. I like this one. Mm -hmm. I would like to do this or I don't like. I have never been, uh, etc. Trying just analyzing and trying to find five more important facts. It's Sometimes makes you trouble because you don't know which one is more important. It's uh, this one or this one, or you are writing something from your personal, about your family. Oh, I have forgotten something about my education. I have achieved this one, or from the point on in my career, I have promotion, etc. This is a uh, one that comes from the first stage goes to the second stage because. You try to find out all the details to write down, but mm, then you see that questioning, okay, I have written these facts about me, but who am I in real life? What I have achieved? Um, or what would I would like to have? Or what am I going to do in my life to get something? And the conflict starts from this point of view. <coughs> from this part, because you are starting questioning, really, you have find some kinds of uh, points, and you are going to see mm -hmm, yeah, I have a problem, I'm going to solve it. And then there may be some kinds of mm, big changes. I have got a promotion in my career, or I, I have got married, or mm, some kinds of things that really um, have had a big impression on you. And from this point, you are going to explore yourself, to get adapted to it. And from this point, you are going to be like, mm, to find your values, your goals, etc. And also, <coughs> sorry, a little bit ill. And you are going to ask your questions about your values, about your dreams, about your aims. What do you want or what have you achieved? Why? And try to find solutions in this field. And as you see, we are starting from the general one, and step by step, we are going to specify what is the problem in real life. And in some cases, <coughs> you are searching for more meaning, reason, or passion in your life, because at first I can just think of the one that we've I'm having some kind of problem and I can do this one, this one, but at the same time, when I'm going to go through the stages and specify all the problem, I will come uh, to the last stage of uh, symptoms and I will see that really not, I'm 
just having this one general so many problems no i have this specified problem and i'm going to solve this specified problem because uh in some cases we can say that really <coughs> um we have many problems but when we analyze when we try to find the meaning the definition or the characteristic features of this we will see that really it's one problem It may be just one problem, but with different kinds of branches. Um, it can be even a very not um, so important problem, but it at time just feel or see that it's really important. But when we specify and find the source of the root of it, we will uh, just be able to solve it very, very easily. And in some cases, uh, we can say that identity, one identity crisis can go through, first of all, uh, just consciously realizing that it's not so such kind of real deep problem for us that we can solve, that we can, or something. No, if you just think of, if you just analyze, if you try to find some solutions, not one solution, some solutions for it, and after it, just trying to identify which one is the most appropriate one, uh, it will just make you, it will just uh, help you just to cautiously to find out the real uh, just solution for it, and okay, you have no identity crisis at this moment, because you have solved the problem that you really was troubling you. And also, in some cases, it is said that if I have some symptoms of identity crisis, I should go, uh, maybe I would apply for a psychologist if I'm not able at this moment to go deeper through it, to find what is the problem. And in this case, or you can visit a psych psychiatrist who really can be helpful for you and um, can help you to just to cope and go through it and at the same time to solve this problem for you. Uh, in some cases, as you see, I have told symptoms of a depression or a stress. These are, let's say, the first signals for us that make you assured that you have and crisis time, you have a problem, uh, and you are going to investigate and find some solutions for it, and try to find real uh, solutions for this problem. Uh, it can start from the mood, it can start from the loss of interest in many things, it can be changes even in appetite or weight, issues of concentration, energy levels, motivation, um, and sleep, everything that can be considered uh, be in the uh, framework of identity crisis. Because identity crisis, uh, first of all, is the main question that is going to be built, who you are. Are you on a position that you really want it to be, or you are going to be, or something. And according to it, starting different kind of like negative things that make you think, or um, when you have failure, you always own, I failed. I'm not the one that can have a success or something. And while thinking, you just gaining more, more, more things about that. And there is a time that it can be like an explosion of frustration, depression, or stress, or some kind of negative situation that makes you realize that you are in a trouble, you are in a crisis, and you are not alone, and you are going to really to solve this. And, but in some cases, if you are 
experiencing an identity crisis, and you might be just questioning your sense of self and identity. They um, can often occur due to big changes or stresses in life, or due to factors such as age or advancement from a certain stage, for example, from childhood, going to school, or something. And completely normal, for example, to question who you are, especially when we change throughout our lives, when we change our career, when we change our profession, when we change our uh, place of e even uh, unsettled unto another, or when we relocate to another place. Um, however, when it begins to affect your daily thinking and functioning, you may be having a crisis of identity. In some cases, it is said that it is more serious than we think, and but we should just think that any type of crisis can also result in a decline in your mental health because uh, during your self uh, or on your life or what negative things or something terrible has happened that can make you bring to a crisis. Uh, it has shown that to be a marker in some cases like to underline to know more about the depression about the stress and it makes you just think and go ahead without mm, being afraid of losing or something because you are going to solve this problem. And sometimes if you have any such kind of uh, signs of depression, consider seeking help. Don't be afraid to ask your friend, your colleague, your family member to help you to solve this problem. And in some cases, that you can just ask that your family member even or a psychologist to help you. And but um, some there are some cases that really are very troubling and not giving you enough time or enough, uh, let's say, a sensitivity just to feel it or to find a solution. And uh, oftentimes, the identity crisis or other mental uh, health issues can arise due to major life stressors. And these stressors don't have to be like bad, but they can still cause a lot of stress for us, which can bring to identity crisis. So, and these and um, such kind of stressors can certainly, that I have just mentioned here, can certainly have an impact on your daily life and how you see yourself. And there are going to be different kinds of uh, like signs or treatments offered by uh, other people in order to find out uh, the source or the root of it and try to help you to solve this problem. Um, let's go and a little bit talk about the treatment because uh, there are different ones, different sides, different points of view on it. And according to it, we can just have different kinds of uh, help, starting from the psychotherapy, going to the group therapy or medication. Uh, depending on the source and how important or how difficult uh, crisis you have in your life, depending on it, uh, you can choose the type and the psychologist also can offer you the type of treatment in this case. For example, I can say that uh, my identity, for example, or this identity crisis is very, really negative one and uh, it's very um, just impossible in some cases to solve or something. And according to it, you can just go through it and try to find more solutions for them and try to know what is it, how you can just do it and how you can go through it. 
uh, one of the first ways that DOA is represented is going to be life cycle therapy, which is uh, can be helpful for addressing some of the underlying issues that might be contributing to your identity crisis. And in some cases, especially in uh, psychology, we know about the cognitive behavioral uh, therapy, uh, which works to address the negative thoughts and behaviors that may um, just be the issue with you or your point of view. Uh, this therapy is very important one because in this case, uh, the person and the psychologist, they are going to work uh, out the behavior of the person who is having uh, the identity crisis. Uh, not only working, finding out, but also trying to change the negative one into the positive one. Uh, while changing them, you will see that really these are uh, a real great work done by the person and the psychologist, a cooperation work, a teamwork or uh, which will just give its result uh, going to solve this crisis, identity crisis problem. The second one is going to be like a group therapy because some studies have found that group therapy to be helpful for treatment, identity crisis, especially in some cases when um, it can give you positive results or when there is a group who have nearly the same problem, like for example, uh, a person who can have uh, uh, some uh, fellows in his career or personal life, and it has brought to the massive usage of alcohol. And in this case, while having a group therapy, you will see many people or even people who have already had such kind of problem. And now after solving it, they are the ones that really help. The group has helped with their stories, with their motivation, with their encouragement in order to solve it. And also medication, which are accompanied in some cases if uh, a person has an anxiety or depression, uh, you can just go some kinds of medications like anti-anxiety or antidepressant medicine in order to help you. This is from maybe a solution from the point of uh, medicine, but in some cases it can bring you to a dependence of medication because there can be a period when you can use this medicine, take this medicine, but mm. after some time when you just stop give up, doesn't give you off a little bit. Some more, oh, I'm going to use or uh, no other time like the medication really helped me. But I think that from the other point, uh, first of all, the identity crisis can be solved not maybe with the psychotherapy or a group therapy uh, medication, but for a short time, for a short period, but not so seriously concentrating on the medication. Because it's a good thing, but at the same time, it has its negative. Uh, just it works too. And what can we do in order to cope with an identity crisis from the point of psychology, from the point of the uh, just psychology and what solution it can have in our life? Uh, in many cases, uh, there are some kinds of steps that really can be workful, uh, working one or helpful for us. Uh, and one of them is acknowledging and accept your feelings, because when you seek to identify and understand the feeling, your senses, uh, what you have about your identity, that acknowledge and accept that. There can be a situation, for example, when I say, oh, I am a tailor, 
uh, in passing my exams. What is it? And then try to explore myself to find out um, for real why I always spend passing the exam. Try to find the real cause for it and to accept, to acknowledge it. For example, maybe I have a fear of being in a stressful situation. I fear of, I have a fear of failing, not passing the exam, or not remembering, or not giving much time on it, etc. etc. There are many different kinds of questions that really can be workful for us. Uh, there are different kinds of situations that will be really workful for uh, the solution of such kind of. Um, try to accept everything. Um, trust, tell yourself that it's okay that to feel the way you do. Or extending some grace to yourself as you would uh, be when you are a friend or when you are just trying to help your friend in the same situation. The second point, the second step is going to be to explore your beliefs and interest. Sorry, uh, just is my screen so, is it uh, okay? Just a second, it just stopped. Let me make it. Okay. To explore your beliefs and interests and try to find what you want, what are your interests, and which can be helpful really to solve the problem. And what you are interested in, um, uh, are there things that you no longer you don't like, no longer you like them, or maybe in some cases try to find new interest uh, and help yourself. For example, if you want to train your brain, you can start learning a new language, which really trains your brain because uh, you have, or you have, you are too tired. You have a stress and you don't want to work on your article that take a little bit higher stage when you are writing an article on and in the stress i have no time i can't manage etc etc try to relax try to mm, really think of about the interest maybe uh, i like reading very much and maybe i will find or i will take a book to read it and in order just to a little bit think, maybe while reading, I will find an interesting a bright idea for uh, my article, or maybe I will take a motivational film or book or TED talk, listen to, and it really can help you just to know and what you believe. If I believe that I can do, the first maybe believe for me, and really I will do it. And will succeed at the end. And also consider your goals. What do you want in your life? Because in some cases it is said that um, knowing what kind of goals you have will help you to consider and to find, let's say, your place in the society, in your life, in your career, in your family, etc. And what types of things First of all, to consider that make you be joyful and happy. Um, maybe if I am very happy in my scientific field, when or when I publish an article or write a book or something like it, it will make just me joyful or happy. Really, let this strain strong point you in order to struggle against the negative, let's say, atmosphere, negative word that just disturbs or troubles me to work positively. And having a real and concrete goals, it will help me to make a plan, to go through the steps of the plan and to make my goal achievable for me. And it will really make me happy and joyful. 
And also, uh, it's very important to get support, to get support from everyone, to get support from family, from colleagues, from friends, and why not from uh, psychotherapists or from the psychologists, which also they can be helpful for you. Maybe it will be a problem that you you realize, or in some cases not realizing that it's a problem. Um, you take um, everything analyzed from the point of view, but it's very important to know everything from other side because when you also analyze the same problem from the other side, you compare, you try to find some differences and also similarities between them, it will help you just to know more, to differentiate what is important for you. Um, in this case, maybe your friend, psychologist, or someone will be really helpful for you because you can get a right solution. You can make a right decision, let's say, for it. Um, from this point, you can really very, very easily solve your problem. Um, go to the part that Really, it will be helpful for me uh, to go and to know more about the problem and to find maybe a real solution for my mm, problem. And in some cases, when we have an identity crisis, it can be like an uncertain and confusion part of a person's life but it doesn't mean, um, mean that we can't solve this kind of problem and you, can, you can't find a solution for it. Now, just try to go through all these points and try to find a real solution for it. Because when you question, when you like to find, in some cases, a real uh, solution for it, you will say that, this is not going to be like an identity crisis for you. You have already achieved something. You have already get your place in the society. And you are on a position that it, at this moment maybe is enough for you. But for promotion, for having more and more achievement, you have to go uh, ahead and know more. That's why it's always try to go through it, try to find a solution, maybe coming from, a, a starting from your help, going to professional help, and in some cases, maybe the evaluation of uh, having a treatment or being acknowledged what you have done, what you have uh, achieved will be really very helpful for you because it will just help you to know more about it. And next time, we will be like consciously go and try to find yourself uh, for you. But let's say that it's really, um, in some cases, like uh, symbols or something that makes you just be always awake to know, to just to accept some negative things and challenge. Challenge in some cases to turn to change your negative thoughts, your negative ideas, then express yourself, engage in some cases, learn more, avoid negative coping, and etc. I think there are different kinds of maybe mm, uh, in some cases, different kinds of uh, just uh, opportunities for you that you can just go and according to these opportunities to solve your identity crisis. Uh, I think it's all uh, can be helpful. All these um, points to know, to realize what is identity crisis, uh, what can you do, and how what kind of solution you can go through in order to find the best one for it. 
thank you. Sure, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. It is a great honor for me to introduce the chairperson of today's first session, Dr. M. Subhashini, Associate Professor, Department of English, Sri Saraswati Tyagaraja College, Bulaji. She has more than 15 years of teaching experience. Being a research supervisor, currently she is guiding six research scholars. She had published six papers in reputed international journals and attended numerous faculty development trainings. She was also the part of various national and international conferences and organized numerous guest lectures. She is one of the members of the professional body English Language Teachers Association of India and have established a digital language laboratory in STC to improve the students' language efficiency. She is currently acting as a public relationship officer and soft skills trainer. Ma'am, you can take over the session, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mithila. Uh, thank you, Mahamam. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Am I audible? Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, thank you. Oh, good morning, all. So it's uh, I'm very much a privileged and a pleasure for being a chairperson to this technical session too. At this juncture, uh, I really thank Mahamam Hachudi, Department of English, and Dilavati Ma'am principal for giving me such a wonderful platform for me. So actually, uh, we had been discussing several decades about this uh, subaltern uh, studies. And um, I really uh, feel happy uh, that is, uh, Mahamam have uh, taken such a um, uh, great uh, topic. Uh, but still, we are experiencing, we are uh, sensitizing so many issues related to all those uh, marginalized people. But um, uh, several discussions and several uh, debates uh, we have been undergone. And we come across with uh, so many criticism and debates regarding this area of field. But still, we are experiencing many identity-related issues. Uh, uh, still, it's prevailing around us. But scholars like us and uh, like you argued to recline those uh, history and to retake them. Uh, uh, we are uh, so many scholars and crit uh, criti critics. They have argued they are ready to appraise their um, identity crisis, but uh, still we couldn't uh, get a good uh, a positive report on the A side. But actually, uh, they have no platform to express their concerns and no voice to demand a, a fairer share of society's goods. Actually, um, uh, uh, at this uh, time, that is, uh, Dalit literature is a much needed outburst of an exploited people uh, who have been robbed of their identities. So I feel this is the right platform to explore all those identity crises in this uh, area, I, uh, I believe. So I uh, heartfully, uh, uh, what to say, I congratulate all the participants and presenters uh, to do justice to this area. All the best. Thank you. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. You can proceed with the first presenter, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I, I, first presenter. One second. Baiju, uh, Shiva Shankari, I believe. Shiva Shankari, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, Shiva Shankari. Yeah, you can proceed uh, now. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Is my screen visible to you? Visible, Kana. Visible. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, should I run the video? Yes, you can. You can.
Good morning, one and all present here. Uh, my name is Sashivi Shankari. Uh, I am from Erode. I am currently studying my first MA English Literature at Congo Arts and Science College. My title is uh, Dalit Feminism in the poem of uh, Meena Kandasamy and Aruna uh, Gulgul Manda. Uh, now I am going to uh, say about uh, Dalit Feminism. It is about a female perspective and it deals with how low caste women community are suffering and uh, uh, faces the problem. Uh, first, the Dalit word uh, uh, appeared in Marathi in 1930s uh, as depressed, uh, depressed classes. Uh, later, it uh, translated in English as Dalit. Uh, now, uh, I have taken the works of uh, One Night by Meena Kandasamy and the Dalit woman in the Land of Goddesses by Aruna Bilbul Manda. Uh, uh, Meena Kandasamy, uh, she is an Indian poet, uh, fiction writer, translator. Uh, she writes uh, columns for Hindu. Uh, next, Aruna. Uh, Aruna is an uh, is a Telugu English poet. Uh, she is one of the famous five Dalit. Uh, she is one of the five Dalit English poets. She was. Uh, she is a famous uh, English poet writer. And her themes. Uh, she wrote under. Uh, she wrote uh, themes such as like uh, gender and caste. And she is also a bilingual poet. Uh, caste system in India. Um, uh, mm, uh, the Dalit uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, foot of the Brahma um, and then feminism and Dalit uh, feminism is a political movement uh, whereas we, when we compare to feminism Dalit women faces uh, more suffers than the fe fem fem feminist uh, feminine women mm. Problems of Dalit feminism, uh, the oppression faced by the Dalits more than the 300 years ago, they face uh, uh, poverty, suffering, um, domestic violence, uh, brutality, and then they were dominated by the high class people. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the poems, uh, One Night and the Dalit Woman in the Land of uh, Goddesses, uh, uh, reveals the suffering and the pain of the Dalit woman. Uh, Meena Kandasamy's poem One Night shows how Dalit girl neglect by the society. Uh, even the pot and uh, uh, pot and uh, glass uh, uh, thirst the uh, sees an eager and thirst of the Dhanam, a Dalit girl, but the society, the teacher, even the edic educated teacher, prayer school, neglected her because she belongs to a low caste Dalit woman. So she was neglected by the society. Um, next, uh, a Dalit woman, the land of goddess by Aruna. Uh, this reveals the present scenario of the Dalit woman in the society. Um, in his poem, uh, Aruna portrays the Dalit as a goddesses. Uh, the Dalit women uh, can't uh, achieve their dreams as uh, they are uh, uh, dominated by the high class people and uh, they are uh, lives in the fear of the society. Um, comparing these two novels, the uh, poets uh, try to uh, upfill the a marginalized woman. Uh, uh, in these two poems, reveals the woman's rendered voiceless and suppression of society. Um, so Dalit woman uh, suffering silently and faces many problems in the society. Uh, both poets' motto is to uplift the Dalit woman community. Uh, and then Aruna's works uh, uh, towards the upliftment of the marginalized woman. Uh, so there is no exact solution for their upliftment. Uh, uh, 
so uh, education and uh, equality uh, brings some homes for dalit women community uh, so people want to change their mind and want to give respect and education uh, equality to them uh, though the indian constitution ab abolishes untouchability even the dalit remain same uh, in the reality uh, they are suffering more other than the feminism or other women in the world um so uh people uh, want to change their mind and want to give respect and education to them uh thank you uh, this two poem shows the dalit women suffering uh and pain uh hello shivashankari ma'am uh, yeah it was a good presentation thank so, you ma'am question uh, for you who's uh, meena kandasamy's favorite poet can you say ma'am ma'am rip, uh, repeat uh, one more time ma'am who's the favorite poet of meena kandasamy Um, I'm done, man. <laughs> It's okay. So Sylvia Plath, actually. Okay. So is she a really diasporic writer? Hmm. Hmm. Yes, of course. She's a genuine diasporic writer. Okay. Okay. Sorry, man. Okay. This is my first time. I'm a little bit nervous, okay, okay, confused. Okay. <laughs> okay. no issues no issues it's actually a good experience for you good platform to to enhance yourself okay okay ma'am don't get now okay okay ma'am okay any other questions participants are you there do you want to question her hello okay shall we move on to the next participant is she ready yes ma'am by you thomas ah uh, yes yes i am ready yeah okay okay so you can continue good morning to all of you uh, my topic is a critical analysis on dalit feminism literature a parent paradigm shift from oppression to liberation myself father bhai jitom hame research scholar in ramakrishna mission vivekananda educational research institute faculty of disability management special education vidyalaya campus coimbatore tamil nadu Russian the phrase dalit feminism perspective designed a collection of information that includes first person account of the struggle faced by disadvantaged women who live inside more visibly established social structure dalit women in india have been silent for a long time they have hopelessly witnessed their exploitation mistreatment and violence they are helpless over their own lives finance or bodies they are instead under the control of someone else their severe exploitation brutality and oppression include rape illiteracy poor health unemployment insecurity and inhuman treatment they have suffer from hunger famine illness physical and mental torture and other condition their lives have become a nightmare due to the caste and patriarchal work together The Dalit movement started in the middle of the 19th century to help many of the sun privileged people still oppressive Dalit movement and mainstream feminism literature have not addressed Dalit women's issue as women work to curb 
out a place for themselves. They must also fight the unfairness and basis perpetrated uh, against them. After Ambedkar, Dalit women used literature as a weapon to criticize mainstream feminism. Autographs, autobiographies, papers, books, flash fiction, and poem fit this genre. The meaning of the term Dalit. Dalit are the modern name for sutras. The term Dalit refers to several disadvantaged people. In, in Hindi, it is, means ground. The, the words Dalit and Dalita means oppression have a common etymological ancestor in the Sanskrit. The term Sudra or Dalit used to refer the person who perform manual work and rare feats to benefit the three classes of Brahmin, Kshatri and Vaisva in the social culture of India. Mahatma Gandhi called the Sudras Harijans or people of God. Dalits are the lowest caste in India. Their name, name originates from the Sanskrit word for broken or scattered. The very act attempting to a translation from the classical Sanskrit conjures up the thoughts of brokenness. Someone who does not identify with one of the Hindu Hindus four primary castes called the outcast or term first used in the 18th century. The condition of Dalit women in India. Uh, sorry to disturb you, Mr. Baiju. Your slide is not changing. Changing, madam. Not changing. Yes, yes, it's in the first page. That's some problem. I will once more. I will start. Now you can see, ma. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Now it's okay, now. Yes, yeah. you can continue. The condition of the little women in India. The gender, the gender gap is a major issue in India. Feminism yes, in India yes. face limited opportunity and disadvantaged countries' traditional gender rules. Women in India culture have traditionally been tasked with the care for the home and children. This meant that a set of procedures were put on hold and people would go to the broke work or school as usual. Before India's independence, it was unlawful for women to own property. Women profited from this up this pro approach in many ways, including their personal lives and academic performance and leadership rules. With the seven decades of freedom, India's caste system and gender inequality continue to generate concern. <clears throat> Dalit women's fight for justice. Dalit women in India face terrible poverty, constant verbal and physical assault, and social exclusion. Feminist scholar Jail Omert claims that women in India's Dalit community face discrimination since they are Dalit among Dalit. As per Dr. Ambekar, Hindu society caste system is like a pyramid made of clay jars. Dalit women in India have learned to hide their caste and ethnicity due to the the decades of discrimination compared to the rest of India's female population, Dalit women have unique challenges. They have been denied every basic human right, including living with respect and dignity and practicing their faith freely. They are compelled to engage with the wide world due to their desperate financial situation and urgent need to care for themselves. They did not, they did little as their people were oppressed, persecuted, and led to revolt or severity. They are no longer in the charge of their lives and have no say over their bodies or property. Hunger, malnutrition, disease, suffering in body and mind, rape, in the ignorance, poor health, unemployment, insecurity and cruel treatment are full forms of violence and exploit and injustice. Injustice. Dalit feminist movement in India. Women in Dalit community should see us subject rather an object because they play a vital role in the well-being of the families and communities. Before the 90s, when Dalit feminists recovered, began there, were all, already Dalit women's group and border participation in various political activities across India. At the turn of 2000, there was a rise in the cyber feminism 
He among Dalit Bahuj, Bahujan, the authors of the publication represented a coalition of feminists who support the political struggle of Dalit Bahujan. This is becoming more common for Adivasi women to express their task on Dalit feminist perspective. Women of lower socioeconomic status make up the majority of Bahujan feminist group. While women in the Dalit community need to speak or how together people of both sexes, Dalit and non Dalits, have already done so. The Dalit feminist movement has benef benefited greatly from the connection with the Savarna feminist movement. They support the consecrative worldwide that typically give more weight to the needs of Dalit women and those of women from dominant caste. Dalit feminist critic of the term woman has generated a demand for the new vocabulary to describe feminist politics in India. Women's role in Dalit literature. Dalit literature refers to the writing that focused on the oppression of the Dalit people. Any Dalit or a Norton might have written this. However, the works of others who have not themselves, Dalits not considered Dalit retraced by the Dalit community. During the Sudras, Smritis period, about 500 to 30 BCs, when women were treated quite harshly, the lawgiver Manu established his court. However, most Dalit writings celebrate the motherhood and relegate women to secondary roles stereotypically reflecting a patriarchal view of the women. For the same reason, Dalit politics do not prioritize private prioritizing promoting women equality. One of the main purposes of Dalit writing is to raise attention to the oppression, injustice, hope, hopelessness, and hardship they face. A group of Dalit women are authorized to educate, educate, organize in the response to ideas of Dr. Uh, Ambekar, Dalit women are dictator in two India's most well-known epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Women in Dalit literature, any discussion on Dalit, Dalitism is likely to be incomplete unless we take into the consideration of a strong un un undercurrent of Dalits, women and their Uh, incomplete, we take into the consideration of a strong understanding of women and the predicate of a unique stream under the entire, entire domain. A paradigm shift from oppression to liberation. Women, in, women of the Dalit caste in India experience double discrimination due to the globalization. The government has promised to address social isolation and discrimination concerns, but this problem remains. However, a small but outspoken Dalit community aware of this right began to raise India in the early 20th century, partially due to the effort of Dr. Ambekar. Women from the Dalit community are aware of the widespread cons concerns between upper caste and the feminists of and the Dalit men. The Dalit women autographies, what written talks about the society for and not a personal spirit. Women of the Dalit community highlight the most important concern facing their people from the perspective of their identities and the forms of oppression they face. Split in the Dalit liberation group may be have resulted from the disagreements of a strategy and leadership and cooperation. Grassroots group continue to mobilize around the problem like racism and discrimination in the employment and the just and the justice system, as well as a concern like identity politics, politics, educating, housing, and immigration. It appears that the priority of safeguarding individual rights rather than maintaining the paradigm shift from oppression to liberation. Conclusion. This is the issue might be concerned by looking how the modern feminists have originated, originated among Indian women. There have been increased calls for the discriminating sex laws since they are minority groups. Notably, mm, notably, Dalit women have seen the economic development lag behind the, the general population. It is commonly held that all the Indian citizens have certain legal protections. 
the outcome of this study lends lent credence to the claims that Dalit women experience discrimination in the workplace and education opportunities, that their human development indicates a symbol at a slower rate than those of the Dalit men or non Dalit men or women. And they are responsible for the vast majority of the productive work. When designating the most effective and positive form of political participation by Dalit and non Dalit women and men, it is essential to have a thorough understanding of the historical struggle limitation com complexities of the Dalit women lo location within a range of accumulative layer based technology. Feminist movement among formerly oppressed groups can serve as a useful check on power. In, the, in this area is the Dalit movement. movement. Men, we may learn more about the feminist movement and Dalit organization by comparing their fight for a paradigm change from the oppression to liberation. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to present my paper. Thank you, madam. Hello. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Baiju Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. See here, uh, it is not actually a question. Mm. Um, the one thing, uh, though this era has been declared that there is no feminism, right? Eh? This era, mm. this era, this era, ah, yes, it's yes. Already, it has been declared that there is no feminism. Okay, okay. Are you accepting this? Uh, not fully, I am accepting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. still, yes. but still, we are experiencing uh, yes. that is sustainability of suppression ah, around yes, suppression us, right? Is there. Suppression is there. Yeah, suppression is still it's prevailing, mm. right? Uh, mm. Even yesterday, I can see that I can witness uh, that in the media too, because mm. uh, while um, showcasing uh, females, those are getting good uh, positions or uh, what to say, uh, mm. they are uh, exhibiting like in such a manner. They are emphasizing it highly. Mm. And also, uh, men who are uh, taking the charge of uh, cooking, uh, like uh, domestic works, that is mm. also they are emphasizing high in media. Okay. So it shows uh, even the media itself showcasing that a, a female are mm. <laughs> uh, subordinate, right? So in yes. this world, uh, Dalit people they are already marginalized, right? Among us, yes, yes. Among those Dalit people, Dalit women are very poorer to reach their societal uh, status inside their community too. Yes, yes. Ah, yes. Yes. So these are all the uh, acceptance of which we are experiencing, which we are seeing around us. So can mm. you give few recommendations or suggestions in policy making? Uh, we can give uh, because we are to involve uh, like Ambekar. Ambekar has uh, given a lot of. Uh, uh, his uh, books and all is given a lot of notes on women, especially he worked for the uh, empowerment of Dalit women, Dalit people mostly. Okay. So we okay. should give uh, opportunity to all. Should not uh, we have to first of all we have to abolish the caste system. That, uh, mm. We should uh, uh, abolish one thing, but we cannot do it to the pop uh, because there's a lot of problem will be there. In the, already we are we are uh, born and brought up in that structure it is not uh, very difficult to abolish in a uh, uh, in a straight way but uh, we can accept the people the mm -hmm. people and we should work for them we should involve them in the uh, in the policies like uh, when we the government uh, bring a new policies for the women or any people we should also give a uh, 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 good, um, more important to the women, uh, women group, especially this uh, uh, Dalit people. We should give some uh, uh, new projects for them to bring them to the mainstream of the society. We should uh, also put, and also education field also. We should give uh, more important uh, in the areas where the Dalit people are staying. We should. Uh, uh, government should uh, provide some uh, good colleges or schools for that we can bring them because only through education only when we educate uh, a woman all family will be educated so we mm -hmm. should educate the women and uh, then only we can bring the uh, uh, bring a new society where all the people will be uh, equally accepted and equal uh, opportunities they will be getting 
Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, participants? Do you have any other questions? Uh, Ma'am, I'm Babita uh, from Kerala. Uh, it's not a question, uh, but I'm saying that uh, whatever policies we make, whatever the government uh, make rules uh, for the protection of women and Dalits, uh, caste still, still exists in the minds of the people. Uh, it mm. is, exists as an invisible thing everywhere. Uh, uh, that is what I, I, I want to say. That it's not that much easy for us to abolish it. Uh -uh. As it is invisible uh, and, and it exists. Mm. So we do. It exists in the minds of the people. Mm. Uh, yeah, as uh, Frost says, miles to go. Right. Yes, yes, yes. I also agree yeah. to that. Yes, yes. Yeah. But we are initiating, we are taking steps yes. towards equality. Yes. But it's already inculcated in our minds. It is mm. incorporated. It's designed. It's mm. already designed. So yes. it will take generations to overcome. Ah, yes. Well, we can see some uh, some of the facts uh, also no? in the society. Also, we can see women are coming up uh, in the coming, yeah, coming forward. There. Yeah, last uh, even last month we have uh, submitted a project uh, to ICSSR related to Dalit literature only. Mm. Uh, been there, uh, but uh, we have witnessed so many people. They have started uh, even uh, more more uh, female. They have started self girl groups and mm. uh, through self help uh, groups they have initiated so many education policies and they have started ed mm. uh, giving education to their community itself. Mm. So yes, many sir. policies they have changed even in their uh, health ways. Uh, education wise many uh, their mindsets are slowly they are uh, it's changing so maybe in another uh, 10 or 15 years they will also come forward they will also mingle with us definitely yes, yes. Um, but we are take we are initiating it let us see mm. sir hope. Uh, hope yeah hope. it's a hope thank you okay, thank, thank, you, thank, madam. You. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you Next participant. Uh, Hi, good morning. Uh, uh, am I audible? Am I uh, audible? Yeah, you're audible, audible, audible. Yeah, Honorable Madam uh, Mahalakshmi and uh, the Madam Dr. Subhashini chair in this session. Uh, should I start my presentation then? Yes, of course. Yeah. So I'm really grateful to provide such a wonderful platform to all these research scholars as we were just discussing yesterday also in these technical sessions I was there and listening to a number of these scholars it was really wonderful uh, is my screen visible now is my screen visible to you no oh. sir no not at not at Okay. Yeah, no, it's visible. Visible, visible. visible? Okay. okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I hope it's visible. Is it, ma'am? Is it? Yes, sir. Yes, it's yeah, visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the title of my paper is Dalit Writings uh, Voices of Voiceless, and I'm Sanjay Kumar, PhD research scholar from Department of English, Desh Bhagat University, Mandi Gobindgad, Punjab. And uh, previously, I was a student of Himachal Pradesh University. I'm very happy uh, to have this opportunity. Uh, I want you to know, Madam, see, this is a question of my, actually, I do have the curiosity that number number of uh, numerous participants are uh, taking part in this uh, international conference and uh, based on Spartan studies. Uh, still, uh, that uh, I, I, my mind was uh, again and again asking me a question that, uh, how many research scholars can be there who themselves belong to some such kind of category? As a number of uh, these Dalit writers, uh, you may feel whenever you are reading them, that the true feel that the pain of that Dalit writings can be realized by a person who himself or herself belong to that particular category. I hope uh, uh, if others are listening to me, they will agree with me. Uh, do you mean? Yes. Yeah. See, uh, my research paper is a part of my PhD research thesis titled as Narratives of Dalit, Dalit Autobiographies and Their Contribution in Dalit Consciousness. 
a comparative study of selected Punjabi, Hindi, and Marathi Dalit autobiographies based on primary text, Juthan, that is written by Um Prakash Palbiki originally in Hindi, and secondly, Changi Aruk, Against the Night, originally written by uh, written in Punjabi by Balbir Madhopuri, and another one is Dastan, written by Lal Singh Dil, a Punjabi writer, and another one is Outcast, a memoir by Narendra Jadhav. After reading these uh, four autobiographies, I feel, see, if myself, I do belong a community of, uh, like, uh, let's say, Om Prakash Valmiki or somebody else, as we are talking about these Dalit autobiographies are the voices of voiceless. And secondly, it's covering as a part of that Dalit autobiographies are playing their role in Dalit consciousness. So you people will believe me. See, when you read these autobiographies, you feel that something is happening inside you that you are not reading that autobiography of Om Prakash Valmiki, let's say, Balbir Madhavri. You feel somebody is telling you the life story of your life. Uh, I may not be contemporary to them, they lived uh, decades back to me, but still you can see, uh, I'm not talking about Punjab, Maharashtra, some other states. I'm from Himachal Pradesh and basically from Shimla. But uh, I'm very much sure these caste discriminations still prevailing all over, all over the situations somehow are similar in every place. So. Quickly, I'm talking about the abstract of my paper. The research paper aimed at, aims at highlighting the treatment given to Dalits in the Hindu caste-dominated society. The term Dalit is synonymous to poor, exploited, oppressed, and humiliated and marginalized, known as untouchables and downtrodden in the society. The reason for all that is long prevailing caste system in the society. Caste is the driving force of Hindu social system and one's birth in the particular caste is his or her true virtue that I have realized after reading these number of number of Dalit writings and autobiographies as part of my research work. Birth is one's true identity. Your place in the society is decided on the basis of your caste. The place is accessible to you depend on your caste. Your work and profession is predetermined by the basis of your caste. 101% in short, I must say caste is the most powerful weapon used by human beings to exploit another human being. May, it may be my personal opinion, may not be everybody agree with me. Whichsoever the Dalit writing, may it be Lal Singh Dil's uh, poetry, uh, some other uh, narratives of a part of his autobiography, I may be talking about Om Prakash Valmiki's uh, titled his uh, autobiography as Juthan, you once read it when he's saying that standing with his mother at the outside of these high caste people on the occasion of some marriage when these people or the guests, they finish their food and throwing these Juthans in their basket. Even then, they are chasing them away. And I, I can't even use such words they are using for them. And uh, the, such kind of treatment and atrocities and humiliations are given to them is really unbelievable. Trust me, if you belong to some such kind of a community, it may not be happening in your locality, but still you will feel that something is happening inside you and you want you to do something for that. Moving ahead, Dalit writings and Dalit literature is a literature of personally lived experience by Dalits. I may be talking about uh, Narendra Jadhav, Balbir Madhapuri, Om Prakash Valmiki, or uh, Lal Singh Dil. These are their real life experiences. These are not. Uh, just uh, imaginary stories or some other kinds of works. These Dalit writings are based on individual experience of Dalit authors, but on the other hand, these writings are presenting their entire community as a whole. And uh, Dalit writings are the tools to bring forth the unheard voices of marginalized and uh, deprived communities known as Dalits. If I'm talking about these Dalit writings are the voices to voiceless, you number of uh, such instances you can find if you are reading uh, Narendra Jadhav's Outcast, a mem memoir uh, originally written in Marathi, where it's talking about me and my father and us and all. You can see a great touch and the impact of Ambedkarism in that. How how it was a revolutionary text. You can say when the number of Dalits reading it 
they came to know about the, what is actually happening to society. Today we talk about Manu Samriti, we talk about uh, that uh, Varna system in Hindu society. How many are, I'm not just talking about Dalits, how many are the non-Dalits who know the exact uh, history behind that, how it started, how it has been exploited uh, for the personal interest by a number of peoples and the caste in the society. Uh, may not be the, so many people are not aware of, about it. And Dalit literature is a tool to express the personal language and pain, resentment, atrocities, poverty, and exploitations. In its various forms, like poems, short stories, and novels, novels, Dalit writings uh, unveil the hidden face of the Indian social system. So, moving ahead, Dalit autobiographies, why uh, I do consider it voice of many voiceless people, are heard stories of caste discrimination, discrimination and uh, ill treatment in the society. Uh, this and missing, I'm extremely sorry for this clerical mistake in writing its end and providing Dalits a platform to raise their voice against social discrimination. Voice of Dalit authors are unifying millions of the Dalits together, maybe from any part of the country, any state or any 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 region. And the Dalits self-narratives are the significant tools of Dalit consciousness. If I'm talking about Dalit consciousness now as a voice in the voiceless, when the other communities from other parts, uh, what is happening to the Dalits or some other uh, parts of the country, other states, somehow you feel that uh, they are somehow connected to each other as so to what is happening in my state. Similarly, some of it is happening in other states also. And today, as uh, we were just uh, during the previous uh, presenter's presentation talking about, about feminism. So as uh, that field of feminist uh, discrimination and in the society, uh, only women can realize it, how you feel painful when you are being uh, discriminated on the basis of your sex. Similarly, I, my part of saying is how Dalit on the basis of his caste is discriminated that real pain only and only can be realized by a Dalit. You may be uh, sitting on a very high position. Uh, you may see uh, the example of Om Prakash Valmiki. He worked in that ordinance factory uh, during his uh, government services. On the other hand, you may talk about Narendra Jadhav after getting a higher and higher rank in his profession. But still, when he was sitting over there at the last moment, again, that uh, uh, thought comes in in mind. So whatever I have done, but still in the society, I'm being treated as a Dalit. You may be sitting on a very high chair. So definitely providing Dalits a platform to raise their voices against the social discrimination. Voices of Dalit authors are unifying millions of Dalits together. And Dalit self-narratives are significant tool of Dalit consciousness again. And autobiographical rights has helped Dalit literature to claim its place in the mainstream literature. It is uh, what I feel is that Dalit uh, autobiographies are today the most marketable genre of the Dalit literature. And literature of interest for not only for the Dalits but for the non Dalit also. So, quickly, I'm concluding my presentation. Dalit writings are the voice of numerous marginalized communities. And these writings, especially autobiographical narratives, are used as means of protest. Dalit writings are treated as voice to voiceless because it has revealed the hidden face of independent India where the constitution guarantees equality and justice for all. But the reality is exactly opposite to that. Maybe whatever the provision is made in our constitution, but what is happening in ground? You may see the number of news, number of reports these days. And uh, I can still remember, I think it happened two months back in a government school. A boy studying in just fourth class, he belonged to a Dalit community. He dared to drink a glass of water from principles uh, uh, that uh, tumbler and he was thrashed and he died there and after uh, some time so can you just realize how painful it is that the, just a boy was beaten to death just because he dared to drink a water from uh, a teacher from the higher caste then we are talking about uh, that uh, provision of justice and equality on the constitutional basis so thus, it can be concluded by saying that the different forms of Dalit writings not only have power to attract the curiosity of Dalit readers, but Dalit authors, but also today, it has become a subject of great interest to research for the non-Dalits readers, authors, and research scholars, and everybody. So with this, I end, uh, I hope, uh, am I audible now? Hello. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, so like, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, ma'am, please. So, I like uh, Punjabi and uh, Marathi uh, Dalit writers. So, we do have a famous uh, autobiography, uh, female writer in Tamil also. Uh, you might have uh, known, well, well known personality. Bama? Yeah, yeah, yes, obviously, man. Obviously, I have referred her in my research work also. Yeah. The number of female writers. Karik. 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 That was his uh, first autobiography, also. It's a subaltern yeah. writing, too. G. It is also about an uh, Christian, actually it is a Christian Dalit woman uh, hmm, uh, who realizes uh, that her identity as a Christianity, as a Christian, uh, she is yeah, heavily mediated by her identity as a Dalit and that she must fight hmm. the discriminatory practices both within the church and also outside. Also, thank so you. That, uh, so it is a really autobiography. And also, hmm. um, you might have heard about more about a curriculum. It was a translated piece also, translated in English also. Yeah, yeah, very true. Uh, participants, do you have any? So, thank you. In fact, ma'am, see, we are talking about because the topic is Barton studies. See, even uh, I'm very much sure, I'm damn sure about it. There may be number of uh, such scholars, number of students studying in different universities okay. and uh, working on a different higher positions. But why, why still they are afraid of uh, revealing their identity in the society? Can we realize that uh, real, uh, what is the reason behind that? Uh, let me share with everybody. I am working as principal of uh, Sandnik School in Himachal Pradesh, and uh, I do belong to a Dalit community. Okay, but I you. never, never, I never ever hidden my identity to someone else, from someone else. Because what happened in the society? Let's say I am talking to a stranger. Uh, he is also on equal equivalent post to me. Okay. He regard you everything. He is very much honourable towards you. But as your identity is revealed that. Uh, you are being uh, treated as, uh, as inferior after that. Why so? Your education, uh, your qualification, your accomplishment, it hardly matters. That matters uh, on the top is your caste. Mm -hmm. Do you? So, yes, of course. I, I do request if there's uh, students, research scholars like me, we must dare to reveal your identity. You are doing a great job for your communities. Uh, if you really want uh, that uh, independence and that uh, to bring bring up your communities so if you are hiding behind uh, the curtains so i don't feel there's any purpose and uh, accomplishment of your research work you're just doing it for the sake of your degrees nothing else <laughs> maybe May, uh, uh, not for the sake of the degree uh, maybe uh, hmm. uh, many social groups many studies many critics may more um, most of them are arguing to exclude yeah. from dominant power structure actually mm. right exactly exclude from dominant power structure uh, let us see uh, th that is what uh, earlier i said so miles to go so let us see exactly okay. but Anyways. it's not it's not name as as uh, i read in uh, these autobiographies uh, most of these authors they written it's never never easy mm. to raise your voice if you belong to such community you it means uh, you are going to have a bar in the society so it's a daring daring task definitely mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Our next, our next presenter is Ashwin. Are you ready? Ashwin? Ashwin, are you there? Sorry, Ashwini. Hello. Hello, Ashwini. Ma'am, actually, Ashwini is there. Yeah, Ashwini, Ashwini is there, but uh, Poonam Patel, are you there? Ashwini, yeah, okay, ma'am, okay. I'm here. Okay, okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, let's start with Ashwini now. 
Yes, yes. Ashwini, Can you hear are you ready? It's audible. I hope I'm audible. You're audible. You're yes, audible. I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. I'm yes, ma'am. You're audible. You can start your presentation now. Yes, I. Can you hear me? You're audible, ma'am. You can start your presentation now. Yes, you are audible. I hope I am audible now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. This is Ashwini. I'm working as an assistant professor. Of English in Bhattavasal Memorial College for Women. Chennai. My research paper is titled that Sivagami is unmaiku mundum pinnum, a narrative of protest and identification. So I have uh, made this presentation as uh, in this way. I have chosen for this paper and the summary of the novel, and I will present the argument of the alluded. Here with what is Dalit? Okay, the Dalit Dalit writers, most of them, they don't want to uh, identify themselves as Dalit because see, when a Dalit writer when he writes about something, why it is regarded as Dalit literature? So this is the question of uh, most of the Dalit literature, I mean Dalit writers, and uh, as Everyone said earlier it started in Maharashtra. Dalit writing started in Maharashtra and it spread to other uh, states in uh, India. The most important point in Dalit literature is the Ambedkar centenary celebration. So many scholars, activists, they have uh, invited to this conference. From there, new writers have emerged. New writers have started uh, writing about their experience. So we have novels, short stories, poems. Drama, essays, autobiographies, memorials in Dalit literature. Okay, usually Dalit literature is discusses about uh, caste issues. It's the predominant theme, but Dalit writers they do not stop just by discussing about caste issues. 
they also discuss about the issues in the society they also uh, bring the theme of uh, nature in their writing so that's about like that is literature and apart from that the narrative style of the writers each one have their own way of telling their story uh, they have their own of uh, narrating the stories so the narrative style in dalit literature should be good important then coming to the author she is sivakami most of her she is very famous in uh, tamil literary circle and she was born on 30th november 1957 in tarmalu tamil nadu and she was an ias officer dalit feminist activist and politician she has written six novels and more than 60 short stories she also written number of critical essays as well a writing career has started when she was a student a first work was parayana karidalum it was uh, written in tamil and she has uh, translated it in, it in english as uh, the grip of change so about the novel that i have chosen for uh, this paper it unmaikku munnum pinnum it was originally published in 2012 and it is comes under uh, the journal novel and it was written in tamil it is not yet translated into english yet and it has 37 chapters so a you know a brief summary of the novel would be helpful in understanding uh my discussion so what the novel is about the novel unmaikku munnum pinnum so we can translate uh, just translate it as uh, truth the life of neela so neela is the character in the novel and she is the protagonist as well as the narrator of this novel and neela is some ideas of visit in the novel so we'll see what happens next she fights for the underprivileged people she uh, conducts uh, meetings she, uh, she arranges uh, workshops and she educate a lot of uh, underprivileged people she not only educates uh, dalits she also educates uh, and give awareness to transgenders tribes and landless people so in this novel we read this novel we come to know about how uh, you know dalit movements have emerged after the 1990s coming to the argument of the paper this paper presents how narrative is being used as a weapon in the novel the novel is a narrative of protest in two ways firstly the novel talks about how many movements so as i mentioned earlier uh, we come to know about many movements dalit movements in this novel as well as the writings of the character act as a protest against the ruling class the character neela here her writing it acts and it shows how the how she has been done dominated though she is a she is an ias of officer how she is been dominated in her own circle so that we will see in this novel and then uh, not only the cat so the protest is being um, not shown the reader coming to the vision of fiction is nothing but autobiographical fiction autobiography and fiction so it is a mixture of or combination of authors life was blent with fictional information sivakami she is an ias officer the car evident that it's an autobiographical fiction yes so here um, in the north well the author captures our experience and tells it to the reader to through the character neela so usually the cat character is not talking here it is the writer the author that is 
Sri Sivagami, she is talking through the character of Neela in this novel. So Neela is projected as a woman who fights for equality in the government office uh, to meet the, you know, officer. The reason is uh, she has been waiting list. Uh, she was working in IAS officer. She has, the reason for her uh, so is organizing lots of movements, as I said earlier. She is organizing lots of movements and, um, you know, uh, awareness program. The government thought that. Nila is working yeah. against the government, so they have suspended her. Of course, the novel talks about equality, equality in the terms of gender, class, and caste. Though uh, the character Nila, she is an IAS officer, she is not given equality because she is from a lower caste. That is, she is a Dalit. That too, from Dalit, she is a woman. So Dalit women, they always faces the dual identity. Okay. And here, writing act as a powerful tool to express herself. Neela, she not only conducts the movements, or she is not only participating in the movement. She is not only uh, giving speeches in the uh, program, but she also writes. She contributes enormously. To the monthly magazine. She runs her own uh, magazine itself in the novel. Conducting meetings for the underprivileged brings a sense of. So, uh, conducting meetings like this for the truth is very important. The government do not know what she is actually doing. So, the truth is being present here. As I told earlier, the nature of the government, the nature of the government is always in. Different towards um, Neela. They are, uh, you know, though she, she's been in a um, higher position, she's not given, um, what can I say, not given proper treatment. And she gets a lot of response from the public as well. Even very important because the thing is uh, she has divided in to the Divided the novel into 37 chapters. In each chapter, she describes about and uh, each event, the narrative, uh, the way in which she tells the story, that is very important. As a reader, as a researcher, the narrative should be given more importance. And coming to the significance of the title, Unmai for a suspension and after suspension. So, that, uh, that, uh, no, it needs a close reading. The title, Neela, the character, she's from a Dalit background and she has become an IA officer. Uh, though she became uh, becomes an officer, uh, you know, she doesn't get that kind of. Um, how writing, I mean, how Dalit writing move beyond the mourning of the past and the protest through writing. So usually when we take Dalit literature, uh, even in the in our previous discussion also, we said Dalit writings, it always talks about their, uh, you know, sufferings and mourning. So it is not, uh, you know, We cannot conclude Dalit writer, uh, Dalit with this frame, right? So we should widen our um, thoughts, and we should see, and we should look. Dalit writing from from 
queries but perspective so a protest of course the narrator is acting as the protest here the lab true language the writer is carrying out the theme of protest in this novel ma'am can you hear me now hello Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. In between, the there was some of a technical problem, some sort of technical problem. Okay. Experienced. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyways, it was a nice presentation. So, uh, okay, so actually, uh, so that is writing is a common, uh, mm -hmm. a common, uh, common thing. So, but Dalit literature is actually uh, is to deconstruct the orthodox. Uh, not only uh, deconstructing the yes, conservation, yes. Uh, conservative and uh, reactionary mentality actually. So due to dissimilarity, yes, particularly yes. in circumstances, those things are emphasizing the mm. domin uh, domination. But after the postmodernism, yes. government is expecting a fair society. Okay. Uh, yes. Even now, yes. uh, they are supporting a lot where uh, humans would be on the same ground, irrespective of their caste and color. Um, yes. uh, so even uh, why I'm saying this is even in my college, in my department, there mm. was a girl who all over come from mm. Mariyur. You have all known about this place on the way mm -hmm. to Muna, to near to Udmal Petre. So uh, she mm -hmm. couldn't survive, survive here because she herself felt like alienated and suppressed that maybe because of their complex. Uh -huh. We all uh, educated her. Uh, we gave uh, like um, so many advices, uh, so many support to her, but still um, uh, she could not change her uh, mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, because might be mm. that maybe because of the complex. So when it could be changed only by education, right from primary. Yes, yes, true, also, very true. Yeah, and also they are not ready to live in plains. Also, uh huh. Uh, playing area, they are. Uh, they are not. They are not coming forward. First of all, mm -hmm. men they are not ready to come out. Uh, even yes. our social work department, they have toiled much to take care of, uh, take care of them, uh, particularly mm -hmm. during the period of the medical emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, so they should first cooperate with us, uh, also to lift them up. Yes. What do you think? True, ma'am. Yeah, they should cooperate with us definitely. Yes. And yes. 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 We can give and also we can care them, even the government can support them. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, Thank you, Ashwini. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Poonam, Poonam Patel, are you there? Yes, uh, yes, yes ma'am. You can see now. Uh, my screen is visible. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it's visible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning, chairperson, and all the intellectual present here. Uh, 
My name is Poonam Patel, uh, and I'm serving as a lecturer in Pilla HOC College of Engineering and Technology, Navi Mumbai. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present my topic, exploring the sensational image of a woman in Shobha Day's second thought. I would like to begin my topic, my presentation, with a quote. You, like, you look like a beautiful garden today. This is a quote from Second Thoughts written by Shobhadi. It This particular uh, quote, it celebrates and cherish women's beauty and it appreciates women's beauty. In modern era, women is you know, seen as equal as men, making a lot of advancement in all the walks of life. But underneath this colorful picture of colorful image of a woman, there is a dark truth hidden behind. We all live in the 21st century, yet the status of a woman in the patriarchal society of India is marginalized and objectified a lot. Women are conquering the globe with their achievements in every field, yet our patriarchal system is deeply rooted. No matter whether the woman belongs to an urban society or rural area, she is rich, poor, elite class, affluent class, doesn't matter. Injustice, violence and discrimination, it continues against the women in the contemporary society as well. Many women, many Indian writer, uh, novelists have voiced their uh, opinion against the prevailing women issues in their novel. Women like uh, Anita Desai, Kamla Das, Amrita Pritam, they all have presented and touched frank opinion uh, on both the urban as well as traditional women's situation. Shobha Day is one such eminent writer who has dealt in the sexual subaltern issues of women suffering, patriarchal hegemony, marginalization, exploitation, violence, and abuse, both emotionally as well as physically, at the hands of male dominated society. She is called Jackie Pauline of India. Mainly, she focuses on the pathetic conditions of ultra modern middle class women, projecting complexity in relationships failure of marriage institution and lack of freedom and satisfactions in their life. A novel like Starry Nights, A Socialite Evening, Snapshot, Sultry Days and Second Thought powerfully takes a society through a psychic of a woman who suffers subjugations in our so-called modern society. All her female characters are modern, educated, they are literate, making all the efforts to rebel, revolt, and refuse the patriarchal, do uh, patriarchal dominance which is still prevalent in our society. My paper is going to attempt uh, an unraveled sensational image of a modern Indian married woman and this projection of metamorphosis, transformation of traditional silent sufferers to a rebellious, free, frank, and aspiring woman. The paper will also explore the character Maya in Shobha Day's novel Second Thought that is published in 1996. This paper revolves around three main aspects of the novel, wherein I'll be discussing about the theme of identity crisis and existence issue, women's struggle for existence. Second, the transformation of women's image as a result of subjugations and patriarchal dominance. And lastly, the self-realization of the protagonist to redefine the traditional set of moral values and expressing uh, expressing to redesign and you know enjoy their rights social status with the men now coming to the novel second thought we know that marriage is a bond a loving relationship between a man and women but in the second thought this projection of maya the protagonist as a silent sufferer of you know both ethically and spiritually uh, is collapsed in the modern society maya here is married to ranjan and is in ignored she is tortured she is subjugated by her husband maya is stuck and suffocated by the restrictions of her arranged marriage to a man who is traditional and disinterested in her emotional as well as physical needs and desire she uh, she marries a man just uh, she uh, ranjan marries a, ma marries uh, maya just for the sake of her mother to you know complete the household responsibility and domestic core her dreams to live a lavish life in mumbai is shattered and she feels isolated leading her to fulfill her desire with the another man outside the marriage called nikhil nikhil is a neighbor who satisfy her needs she falls in love with him 
but eventually leads to disappointment due to Nikhil's betrayal. Her illicit relationship with Nikhil is due to her mental abuse and agonies that is inflicted upon her by her husband, Ranjan. The novel reflects the psychological and social economical dynamics of middle class society. Her revolt against her husband and slipping into an extramarital affair is a sign of transformation, shifting power dynamics that a man can never accept. In shooting from the hip, selected writings by Shubhadi, they say that eventually every relationship is a power struggle either on an overt or sublime level. Let us see the identity and existence crisis which is paged by Maya in the novel. Maya feels trapped in matrimony. She feels like a full-time household maid, a full-time unpaid maid servant to Ranjan and his mother where she makes an attempt for her self-identity and existence. The relationship of Maya with Ranjan has no substance and it is completely hollow. We can see that Ranjan's advice to Maya in, uh, uh, in one instance to follow his mother's footsteps uh, is an example of a patriarchal society, which is deeply rooted. His restrictions for her to use STD or not to use STD phones and televisions or even air conditions or even to pursue her career has a major impact on her identity. Ranjan and his uncle, Mr. Malik, talks about Maya's parents with disrespect. Here, Mr. Malik is a product of patriarchal society and is of the opinion that in any Indian family, husband's comfort comes first, as he stated in the novel. Even in women's writer in 20th century literature, Monica Gupta says, the experience of the literature writers world over has focused around women, particularly the issue of identity, alienation, and separation. Similarly, in the second thought, we can see it is portrayed that the struggle of Indian women, uh, they suffer sufferings and isolation, insult, abuse, and subjugations at the hands of Indian men. In one instance, Ranjan calls Maya nipomanic and turns her sexual desire as if turns down her sexual desire as if she is an object. She is not made up of uh, flesh, blood, feelings, or desire. Thus, Maya continues her search for identity and respect in her married life. Now let us see the transformation, uh, which is uh, which is because of the uh, circumstances, the situation that is the injustice that is uh, inflicted because of patriarchal society that leads to a transformation of her image from a silent sufferer to someone who is bold and fearless. In this situation of total despair and depression, and you know because of the perplexed mindset, Maya is pleased with Nikhil and she enjoys his company. She sings, she laughs, she liberates with Nikhil. Maya is a way, in a way, rebels against her husband and his ignorance. She let herself fly with Nikhil, and as the title rightly suggests, she gives herself a second chance, a second thought. Nikhil's character here liberates and transforms her image into free, bold soul. She denies to surrender the surrender at the cold demeanor of her husband. Day's women character seeks to you know, get happiness, freedom, and right to seek pleasures at all cost. Maya, though was having satisfaction with Nikhil, she was also guilty about deceiving her husband. But on the other hand, she says in the novel that going outside and breathing fresh air is not at all a scene. Here, she believes that you no know, making asking for rights or seeking for happiness is not at all seen and she can do it so this suppresses her guilt at a particular point to some extent her image is transformed into audacious admired and fearless entity from a silent sufferer to emancipation as a bold victor personality these women characters are emotional and sensitive, but simultaneously they are brave enough to rebel, revolt, and accept and realize the truth. As the novel proceeds, Maya discovers her own identity with Nikhil. She discovers pleasure and ecstasy of physical intimacy. She was emotionally invested, but ultimately she was exploited by Nikhil. This also reveals the nature of men in our society. They treat women as an object to satisfy their need, to satisfy their demands. 
Nikhil betrays her and exploits her for his sexual pleasure. She, she is just a lonely married woman on his list to satisfy his desire, but never had an intention to marry her or to keep her happy for a lifelong time. Maya is portrayed as a victim of a patriarchal society. Even if she tries to break the fitter of the mute victim, she is victorious for a short span of time, but accepts and realizes the terrible reality of her fate, that she is left with no choice but to endure her life in loneliness with Ranjan. On the other hand, she has Ranjan's impotency, and on the other hand, she is betrayed by her husband, uh, by her lover. That puts an end to her desire. To conclude, Shobha Day presents a masterpiece and sheds some light on the urban Indian women's suffering, the emancipation of weak, dependent, and suppressed wife to a totally free and liberated woman who protests against her husband and rejects his slavery to a large extent. She goes against existing norms and she continues to indulge in, indulge in uh, physical, act, uh, physical uh, desire, sexual activities with Nikhil, um, unless and until Nikhil gets married. She realizes that Nikhil is getting married. She again liberate, again liberate herself from the clutches and returns to her husband. An example of uh, Maya is an example of victim to victor who represents women suffering humiliation suppression and exploitation in the male dominated society to end maya attempts to live life on her own terms women's of day novel comes with flying colors transforming themselves with self assertiveness carefreeness and confidence challenging male domination in their own sensational way enjoying status of the new women new modern women indeed thank you so much Hello, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Ma'am Shubha, ma'am? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, yes, I said earlier, that is, uh, this era has been, this era has been declared as no feminism. Right. Uh, but still we are experiencing, even in workplaces particularly. Yeah. Uh, uh, so to conclude this, actually give, uh, this is to advocate that everyone should involve themselves and should actively participate to demand their rights. So not but, only Dalit women or uh, uh, other, uh, whoever it is. So right. everyone should actively participate and they should demand for their own rights. Correct. But uh, one thing that it is not about feminism, it is about humanism. Like first, uh, we yeah. or anybody needs to be treated as a human first, whether it is emotion or uh, you know, in the workplace, uh, this distinct, uh, this division, uh, human, I mean, human or feminism or male or female, white, black, this distinct, I mean, this differences must be eliminated. And that can be through education, I feel, for both men and women. Yes, ma'am, uh, of course, of course. The, the current uh, example which I can remember is was a Me Too movement. Okay, it was, uh, it was really strong. Uh, you know, a revolt against uh, this patriarchal society, which is still prevailing somewhere in the mind, and that needs to be educated and you know changed. It it, it needs a transformation right from the scratch, from the basic through education. I feel. Yes, of course, ma'am. Of course, only through education we can change. We can bring changes. Right. Of course. So not only this uh, feminism, but even the Dalit the Dalit literature, it has been uh, progressed as a key literary branch you now. So it has given a right to many revolutionary issues in a Dalit community, not only um, in a, even a, this has brought a, a new kind of woke up in everyone's consciousness. Now yes. in my maximum universities and in many colleges, they uh, they already they have uh, uh, they uh, set up a separate branch for this uh, literature too, so as to broaden the marginal. So if yes. we judge not, uh, not if we judge not on the aesthetic aspects, it is merely impossible. Instead, mm -hmm. everyone should take a sincere and authentic effort based on their own consideration. That is what I believe. Genuinely, I'm true, so true. Then, then only genuinely we can bring a lot many changes even in the society, ma'am. Right, right, ma'am. So thank Correct. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you, Mahamam. Thank, thank you. you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for spending you. your valuable time. 
uh, with Thank us. You. And also, you have shared your, your uh, beautiful ideas and opinions towards the presenters' uh, uh, titles. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Once again, I thank all the participants for the valuable effort. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Bye. Ma bye, 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 bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, I thank the presenters. Uh, we, uh, now we'll begin to we'll move on to next session. Technical session eight. I think the presenters are ready, and also our uh, chairperson, Dr. Narmada Shivashankari, ma'am, Narmada, ma'am. Narmata ma'am, are you here? One second, I'll check. Uh, Mano, uh, Maha ma'am, is it audible now? Narmata ma'am? Ma'am, I'm here. I'm here. Is it audible now? Yeah, yes ma'am, you're audible. You're audible. Yeah. Welcome ma'am. I'm good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. Fall, I welcome you, you for this wonderful uh, uh, two days you. international conference. Uh, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you, uh, Mahama. So I think all the presenters are ready, no? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Let us have a small, dear presenters, let us have a small intro about our uh, chairperson, Dr. Narmada Sivashankari. Mirtila, may I now invite yes, you to introduce the Chapos. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, all. I have the great privilege in introducing the session's chairperson, Dr. S. Narmata Shivashankari, ma'am, Associate Professor, Department of English, Tripur Kumaran College for Women, Tripur. She has more than 15 years of experience in teaching, and as a research supervisor, she has produced seven MPhil scholars and is currently supervising five PhD and two MPhil scholars. She has attended 34 seminars, conferences, and webinars, and workshops altogether. She has published 17 papers in various reputed journals, and also attended three in-service training programs. She is also the member of Board of Studies, UT and CG, for Vellalar College for Women, Autonomous e -Road. She served as a question paper setter for Sri Ramakrishna College, Autonomous Coimbatore, and Parks College of Arts and Science, Tirupur. She served as a coordinator for department activities and currently serving as a member of organizing committee for the department. Ma'am, you can now proceed with the session. Thank you, Ms. Mirthala, for giving me, uh, uh, introducing me. So at this outset, uh, am I audible to you all? Yes, yes ma'am, you're audible. Okay. okay, good morning, all of you. It's my pr uh, proud privilege to chat this session. I welcome all the elite intellectual uh, to share their views uh, and ideas on this platform about the subaltern studies. And uh, first, I would like to uh, present uh, Ms. Kuma, Edith Melo. Edith Melody. Edith Melody, okay, Esco, second MA student from Don Bosco College, to share her views on Dalit. Feminism in the poem, Mother by Jyoti Langeva. Good afternoon, ma'am. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, I'm audible. Yeah, I can hear you. You can present your paper, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, my screen is visible for you? Yeah, it, yeah. it, it is visible. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So good afternoon, all, good afternoon to all one and again. And today I'm going to present on Dalit Feminism in the poem, Mother by Jyoti Lanjeshwar. We all know every human being has their own uniqueness. And uh, every human being's strength does not lie on their physique only. Uh, their strength also lies in their mind and their emotional intelligence and all. And when people are born, they were divided into different categories. 
that is what we known as class and class difference they started to experience the class difference by birth and when it comes to dalit they were known as untouchable in previous era they are uh, they are known as untouchable and they were called as low caste people in india they were subjugated to the hierarchy of society in society equality between men and women is always a question and we can find that more often in our indian culture and dalit especially suffer for their rights and they are stuck they are struggling to get all their belongings and what is meant for them dalit women every time su suffer by humiliation and sacrifice jyoti lanjeshwar is a marathi dalit feminist and this poem of mother she pictures sacrifice and selflessness of a mother she is a continuous follower of dr ambedkar we all know feminism is equality between men and women it stands for the equality between men and women in all location and in all stages of life when it comes to dalit feminism it focuses on caste gender and class difference in dalit community we all know that gender equality is a question in uh, no matter what time it is what era it is it is all it always been a question in our society so dalit female suffer more in the society and this dalit feminism focuses on caste gender and class difference this paper aims to call out the struggle humiliation sacrifice class difference which has been faced by a mother who has been a depiction of a dalit women in this poem family when it comes to family the the poet jyoti lanjeshwar clearly explained how women suffers in a family and how she sacrifices herself to the development of a family in the poem we could find that the poet narrated as that mother never wear a gold sari or a gold necklace we can find that all the high class people high class women were made to wear gold saris and necklace that is for them shows their class structure this dalit mother were worked out and she suffered hunger even though she suffered hunger she never fails to feed a family and kids in our society we can find that the duty of feeding the family and taking care of the kids is the primary duty of male but this mal this dalit mother were, was pushed to take care of the family and a kids as well in the history of india we can find that in previous days women were not allowed to go out and work but that case is very different when it comes to dalit females this dalit mother kept her tears which 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 were of struggles and discrimination she struggled to work hard and feed her family but men pushed her to the end of her life they they humiliated they humiliated her and they harassed her however she fought back and stand for herself and continues to fight for herself and, and her family when it comes to society the dalit mother doesn't alone care for the care for her family she also care for her society she protests against along with protestants for the name of untouchable she wants to change the name of untouchable so she fought along with the other protestants which high which high class women were ne were never going to do because for them against a society and for them against against a society and against a family is against of modesty when parents take care of their family when they lost their son they would feel that that is a sorrowful event of their life but this mother in the poem felt proud because her son died by the gunshot of police when he protest against government for the for changing the name of untouchable 
so she considered him as martyr who fought for a noble cause and in her deathbed she advised to the younger generation that they should follow ambedkar and live in unity here the poet insists that they should follow ambedkar who fought for the equality of all the class and who stands against the class difference our final words in in our death bed is jai bhim which shows a patriotism no matter how she struggle in a uh, how she struggle in a family and in a society she never leave a patriotism for the nation till the end of her life she fought against class difference caste and for equality so this paper aims to bring out the idea of idea that no matter who the person is everyone needs an opportunity to expose themselves to the world and i would like to conclude my paper with a quote of frida pinto pinto that gender equality is a human fight not a female fight so i would like to call all the people as a researcher that gender equality is not the fight of women alone everybody should fight for it and everybody should get the equal rights no matter which caste they belongs to which society they belongs to they should have the equal opportunity thank you ma'am okay a very good presentation by edith melody can you all hear me ma'am yes ma'am okay so through your presentation uh, the poet has beautifully portrayed the life of women especially of yes, those women who are coming from the backward that is from the teritoria how they are uh, offering their whole of their life to their uh, society and to their family and also this uh, poem i think uh, entirely represents women life is it not without leaving any aspects of the life so now there is a, it is a trend has not changed today also many dalit women are still living that cheaper life they are living a very cheaper life and trying to give the best for the development of the nation and uh, so is dalit people can be called as dalit women can be called as duly subordinated doubly oppressed sorry one can you come again is dalit women can be called as duly subordinated people i think yes ma'am because yes. they are not only suffering in their community they are suffering uh, in all the community among all the community they are suffering the most so they can call this that okay they are first of all they are uh, called as uh, dalit and then because they are the women so uh, they don't have any proper identity and the women she is a victim of patriarchal despotism and she is being exploited as dalit by the upper caste people am i right yes ma'am okay and a very good presentation thank you thank you ma'am edit and now yes, i call thank you ma'am okay and now i request rosario a student from don bosco college to present paper on the hardship of women as depicted in jane eyre by charlotte bronte and its interrelationship to the current world rosario are you here rosario ma'am can you able to hear me ma'am yeah yeah i can able to hear you you can present your views you can share your paper yes ma'am yes ma'am and hardship of women as depicted in jane eyre by charlotte charlotte bronte and its interrelation to the current work okay please Visible. You are not audible, Rosario. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, your presentation is also visible. Good afternoon to everyone who are present here. First, I have chosen the topic, I mean, the paper, The Hardship of Women as Displaced in a Terra Era by Charles Bernard and his interrelation to the current world. Just I will try to begin the novel. Yeah. There are many female characters. Excuse me, but sir. What the, yeah. Sir, your voice is not clear. Am I clear? Yeah, now we are clear. Yeah. Okay. The woman uh, in Victoria era were treated as a second class citizen. In the society, they had a very few rights and a little control over their own life. Women were expected to marry, have children, but look after the womb. That during the Victorian age, uh, they don't they don't treated as a well manner. They are treated as a second class people only. They did, uh, they didn't give respect. They didn't treat uh, as a equal. For a long time, women depend on men only. At present also, some some more place women were depending on men only. The novel acts as a reminder of this. Until a woman won the rights to what the things started to change from it. Hazel was a governess like uh, Jan, but she eventually married another actress in the novel. Jan is not conversely beautiful as she described as became plain looking. Uh, in the during which period, appeared, uh, women were not not portrayed because they don't see, they don't care, they don't bother about. From this novel, Jane from young age has a passion for knowledge and life. But in this novel, they don't, uh, I mean, encage them, encage her to develop in her life and to gain knowledge and uh, to give the respect in her society. Then wants to be loved and find love. She was uh, put into down. They didn't now uh, bring up her life, which she does when she goes to work as a governor at the throne field in the novel. She always clings to her moral compass as she is a self-righteous character. Even though Jane can be a passionate rebellion, at the end of this novel. Mrs. Rocher and Jane finally marry and Jane gets a fairy tale happy ever after. In the novel, she finds a character, I mean, Rocher, I mean, she attracts in her in him and gets and fall into love and marry him. The importance of a female protagonist in this novel, Jane is a strong, independent woman. Robert could not have chosen a male character to be main. Why did she choose as a cast female character? The protagonist was a male. For example, Rochelle was the main character. The novel would not have been as repeated as it would be being a completely different novel. We keep see in the novel, the rich sister Ella chooses to develop 
the uh, novel as she finds herself uh, with the jan she compares herself and uh, puts herself to down and then miss temple at her lower jana looks up to miss temple as a mother fears because she was a kind teacher in the novel she takes the of the jan and brings out his uh, fearless and uh, all the problems occurs in life just i would like to conclude uh, this paper this whole paper is uh, discussed with the feminism by jan era by charles brandy he is a english or uh, well novel writer she portrays in own experience in life in this novel during victorian period uh, women's writing was uh, not widely published but bronet wrote the novel under the pen name troll bell thank you thank you monanda okay rosario yes ma'am thank you for your presentation and i would have a only a small question whether the victorian women have freedom on their own rights in the society no i no ma'am no. at the time uh, there was no freedom they, they were in the have... okay 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 uh Uh, and i don't think so the victorian women are not expected to express their uh, own opinions outside the uh, limited areas yes limited area yes, subject yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma and uh, in particular with jane ayer uh, uh, so she is not been an identity figure in the novel yes ma'am after that only in the last uh, novel mm -hmm. she explains i mean she express uh, Uh, all the freedom it puts okay. into the Victorian age period. Okay, the whole book I think it contains of a social criticism with a strong sense of Christian morality and its core. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and it is considered to be the head of the individual characters of how Jane and how the novel approach approaches has been applied to the class topics, even to the. Uh, so, uh, sexuality religion and feminism during the victorian period yes ma'am yes ma'am everything okay. is included ma'am okay okay uh, thank you rosario and now we'll move on thank to you. the next person uh, now i call yes bishma joy a second ma student of from holy cross college to present her paper on agonizing traumas of the untouchables a critical study of vinodini's trust uh, good afternoon ma'am and good, good afternoon, afternoon everyone ma'am mm. um, shall i start my presentation yeah you can start your presentation yes just a second ma'am is my screen visible yeah your screen is visible okay ma'am So good afternoon, everyone. Myself is Besma Joy, and I'm currently pursuing my second year of PG in English Literature at Holy Cross College, Nagarkovil. And the title of my paper is "Agonizing Traumas of the Untouchables: A Critical Study of Vinodini's Thirst." So, what is life? So, it is full of surprises, and one doesn't know the astronomy of the future. so every day every one they battle with tenacious power why because of the sole purpose of attaining peace and love they hope for a miracle that would happen in their life and which would also enrich their life so at the end of the day some people they achieve their dreams while some other they are vacuumed by the black hole and the latter it is similar to the condition of the dalit community so they are not extra terrestrials but they are treated like one forgive forgiveness and tolerance uh, these are the expected qualities of a dalit but in written they receive the reward of agony and annihilation 
and the eyes of the society they are always uh, filled with contempt and disgust towards the uh, low caste people and especially the dalit and this makes the dalit people to hate themselves and uh, to be frank even the dalit people everyone they have the will of fire uh, even to burn their tormentors to death but they chose deliberately to love others and a life filled with bliss is unimaginable for a dalit and vinodini she is one of the optimistic dalit writers who portrayed the lucid pictures of injustice that was done to the dalit community by the high caste people and her play daham it captures the marginalization faced within the dalit community and this play it is a very famous play and it was translated from telugu to english under the title thirst by sunita rani and this paper it aims to unveil the oppression and suppression faced by the dalit community through this play thirst by vinodini so india india is a beautiful nation and it is known for its unity in diversity and in dalit community the people they are also called as harijans and untouchables and what many personalities they uh, sacrifice their lives for the upliftment of dalit community but uh, uh, some of the known personalities are uh, mahatma gandhi and uh, dr b r ambedkar uh, mahatma gandhi he wanted to eradicate untouchability from the indian caste system and so in an effort to do that he uh, started the harijan sevak san in 1932 and then the father of the indian constitution dr b r ambedkar he is also an eminent personality who fought against the abolition of untouchability but even though after suffering uh, after undergoing many changes and uh, many many personalities who have sacrificed their lives for the upliftment of dalit community still uh, the dalit people they are suffering from the clutches of society and especially due to the high caste people so the people belonging to the high caste uh, they enjoy various pleasures but the people belonging to the low caste they still suffer a lot so oppression it is a term which is equivalent to violence it can be done in the basis of physical emotional and psychological trauma so people uh, who are belonging to the high class they deliberately oppress the people belonging to the low caste they silence the low caste people by oppressing them and they even threaten to kill them when one uh, starts a revolution against their norms so in this play too the protagonist dasu uh, he belongs to the dalit community and his family also his family is also uh, treated with the authoritative attitude by the high caste people his mother saurama she is beaten and verbally abused by the high caste people uh, as she asked for a pitcher of water see water it's a basic necessity of life no one can say that uh, i own this water water belongs only to me see water is a basic necessity for survival but uh, the dalit people they don't even get the basic necessity and the high caste people they strongly believe that the low caste people can uh, can be controlled through suppression so the act of suppressing is also evident in the play see when uh, dasu he comes to know about the injustice that uh, which was done to his mother he gets furious and he wanted to voice out but his grandfather uh, tata he he doesn't allow dasu to do that because Uh, the high caste people they have suppressed uh, the low caste people they have silenced them the low caste people they also face many issues in their daily life uh, they struggle to earn their daily bread they are not treated equally and they don't even get justice they uh, but even in spite of all these uh, they tolerate and suppress their emotion uh, and learn to live with it so this injustice which was done to the low caste uh, uh, people is also evident in the play the thirst 
and uh, when Saurama, uh, she revolted against the high caste people to get water, uh, she was given the penalty to walk naked around the village by shaving her head, or she was asked to pay a fine of rupees 10,000. So uh, while the, the sinners were only the high caste people, they started the argument. But uh, the sinners, they are not punished. But only the victim, Saurama, she is punished. punished. And even too, it's an in, injustice done to the uh, Dalit people. And Dalit people, uh, they cannot even protest against this injustice. Uh, they have suppressed their emotion and they have also learned to uh, get used to this kind of injustice. So justice, it was only done uh, to the high caste people, but not to the low caste people. Uh, the Dalit people and the lower caste people on the whole, they were not permitted to enter the uh, temple. They were not allowed to wear shoes and they were not even treated as human beings. And uh, uh, liberation, talking about liberation, liberation is essential for every human being because it is the source of mental peace. And only through liberation, one could get a peace of mind and it also uh, makes a person physically calm. So people, they usually search for a freedom out uh, from the out frame of life, but it is not like that. Freedom exists within each and every person. So an individual can make a revolution only through new revelations and liberation. And in the play too, the liberation of the Dalit community commences from the roots of Dasu. Finally, in the play, Dasu, he voices out against the high caste people and gets his justice. So the present generation, uh, they usually follow the present generation of the high caste uh, uh, society. They follow their ancestors. They follow the customs which were uh, devised by their ancestors. So the high caste people, they deliberately use the name of their ancestors as an excuse to torment the low caste people. So the present generation, they only they have the ability to change this senseless rules which was devised by their ancestors and they have a chance they only have a chance to liberate the low caste people so they should not treat the low caste uh, people like their ancestors or their parents but instead they have to transform themselves and they have to respect the low caste people uh, they should first consider these low caste people as a mere human being and then they have to help them during their sufferings so like dasu the locus people when they are exposed to injustice they have to revolt and they have to fight for their needs but at the same time uh, this can be prevented if the low, uh, if the present generation of the high caste society if they devise or transform their rules uh, while they are transforming the rules and treating the low caste people with uh, respect and also by helping them, both the parties, that is the high caste people as well as the low caste people, they can lead a peaceful and happy life. So both of them will be having equality and happiness in their life. So uh, thank you everyone for listening patiently to my presentation. Uh, thank you. Vinodhani? Ma'am, Besma Joy. Oh, okay, sorry. Sir. <laughs> yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, is the author trying to say, Vinodhani, uh, writer Vinodhani, to explain to demonstrate the method and the perpetrator and then agenda that differs? That is, yes. you know, uh, the writer, I think the writer has depicted the internalization of the caste discrimination, class consciousness, right? Yes, by the yes. first generation people. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the whole session has been uh, uh, speaking only about the Dalit literature. <laughs> very good. Yes, okay. It is all class consciousness raising. So yes. that nowadays it has become, uh, re, uh, Dalit literature has become 
uh, emerged as a new field in the study. Yes, ma'am. In India. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, and okay. thank you, everyone. Okay. And the next one is uh, Nega Mandotra, a research scholar from USHS. Yes, yes. Guru Gobind Singh Indraprasad University, Dwaraka. And he is going to present the paper on the topic Humiliation, a recurrent issue in select plays by Indian women playwrights. Nega Mandotra. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the, the introduction. So uh, I'm here to present my topic, Humiliation, a recurrent issue in select plays by Indian women playwrights. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that unlike my fellow presenters, I would not be presenting a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation. Rather, I'll be reading the short write-up that I have prepared for the presentation. With this, I would like to introduce my topic. The first part of the paper is introduction itself. And it begins like, Women in Hindu mythology are always subjected to humiliation at the hands of men. It is through patriarchy that men assert their domination, dominance through power play and victimization of women. The Mahabharat and Ramayana present us with multiple narratives wherein women are represented as passive beings subjected to oppression and marginalization. Therefore, the paper aims to investigate humiliation, a recurrent issue addressed by Indian women playwrights such as C.S. Lakshmi, Mumbai, Arsu Mangai and Varsha Adalda in their respective plays like Crossing the Rhythm, Frozen Fire and Mandir Day. Drawing from Hindu mythology, Ambai, Mangai and Adalja have consciously selected the myth of women, the myth of Amba Shikhandi and the myth of Mandodri respectively to address their trauma, pain that they have experienced through humiliation at the hands of men. The conscious use of myth to retell and recreate these mythical women characters in contemporary times demands the investigation or to highlight the necessity of mythopoetic exploration of women in mythology. The second part of the paper introduces uh, uh, my choice of selection of Indian women playwrights. So why I have uh, selected Indian women playwrights? Women playwrights focus their attention on presenting women's issues on stage to generate awareness while creating a ripple effect of change and presenting resistance as a meaningful way of proclaiming women's rights. To become successful in their journey, they chose to use mythology with a focus on mythical women characters and presented their plight to the audience. The idea behind choosing mythical women characters may have been to serve the position of women in society. Women like Amba, Mandudri, and Sita are silent characters in Hindu mythological texts with little or no agency to express themselves. This is where women playwrights find the window of opportunity with mythical women characters with voice that echoes on the stage and lingers on the page until the last word. With such a notion, women playwrights aim to redefine the role of women by revisiting the mythology and recontextualizing it to create a space for women in Indian drama and society. This further ensures the place of women in Indian society as intelligent beings who are capable of voicing their opinions, expressing their pain, fears, love, and proclaiming their rights whenever necessary. The focus on women playwrights on mythical women characters from Hindu mythology brings in a range of questions and observations, inviting a new approach to studying myths and mythology. Ben Amos, in his article, Folk Tales states uh, that myths are associated with, uh, quote and unquote, supernatural beings exist beyond the boundaries of human time and are believed to be true. Nevertheless, despite their fictional nature, myths have a significant hold on human life, which is visible in Indian society as well as in Indian drama. Mangudri, Sita, and Amba are perceived as more than mythical characters. Their impact on human life resulted in a set of parameters that define women based on vices and virtues. For instance, Sita and Shruknakha became the embodiment of good and bad women, considering their choices and actions. Sita, on one hand, represents a loyal and chaste woman, whereas Shilpnakha signifies lust, making her rebellious. Similarly, Mandodri, Dropti, Amba, etc. are associated with certain adjectives, placing them in particular frame of reference. The bifurcation of women 
into binaries such as chaste and impure, obedient and rebellious, silent and loud, etc., demands an investigation of myth through revisitation, recontextualization, recont rewriting, and rereading. Thus, women playwrights revisiting Hindu mythology are raising questions concerning women and their agency with the hope to create a space for women outside the domestic sphere. Coming to the third and final part of the presentation, which is titled Humiliation as a Foundation of Mythopoetic Exploration. To begin with, it is essential to understand the concept of humiliation. Typically, humiliation is regarded as an unwelcome assault on human dignity. To be humiliated is to be deliberately and destructively made inferior or lacking in some way by others. As a result, it is a deeply upsetting experience. It is difficult to overcome, and those who must deal with it on a daily basis feel a constant threat to their sense of self-worth. There are many definitions addressing the various parameters of humiliation. However, Sanjay Palshikar's definition of humiliation is apt to establish a re relationship between humiliation and power play. In his article, Understanding Humiliation, Palshikar defines humiliation as, quote unquote, a critical point, a power relationship, the cut, cut region as it were, something that brings sharpness to the exercise of power and helps reproduce those powers of relations of power but it is also a potentially disruptive element of power that can have corrosive effects for the underlying normative order. If humiliation is a claim, it is made complete only by incorporating in it, uh, in the proposed response to the alleged humiliation, then those who are making that claim must face a situation of choice and attain the clarity required for making that choice. It is then that humiliation becomes more than a language used to make a sense of disagreeable situ situation. In this sense, Ambai Sita, Mangesh Ambachi Khandi, and Adalgas Mandudri find their voice in reliving their humiliation by raising questions that address their identity marginalization and resistance. These mythical women characters challenge their position as subalterns by remembering their humiliation. From misrecognition or non-recognition to recognition, their humiliation also raises the question of political, social, and cultural injustice as key elements contributing to, to their oppression and marginalization. <clears throat> as Sita in Crossing the River says, quote unquote, I am the Sita that authority creates. I am the Sita that faith creates. I am Sita the pawn. I am Sita the cheated. I am the oppressed Sita. Sita's creation in Ram's kingdom was a result of Ram's political ambition as a king, who is meant to fulfill the demands of the public crowd, uh, of public, a crowd consisting of men and did their desire to test Sita's purity during mythological times. Reduced to a marginalized being, Sita, once a queen, finds, finds recognition as a woman with a voice in Amba's place. Similarly, Amba, abducted and humiliated by Gish to satisfy his ego, now finds a space to address and recognize her hatred towards Gish in Mangal's frozen fire. She says, quote, until now a fire burns within me, until now, until this moment when Gish was laid low, my eyes carried in them an unblinking hatred. Like Ambai and Mangal, Adarja also addresses the humiliation of Mandodri, as Mandodri says, quote, unquote, here, woman is an object of pleasure, a mere plaything, to be used like a piece of linen that can be thrown away when it is soiled. All women have experienced pain and suffering, but only men are recognized for their sacrifice, pain, and suffering. However, Ambai Mangay and Adalja try to address the pain and suffering of these mythical women characters, as Mandodri says, quote unquote, to read a woman's heart, one has to be a woman, perhaps. Thus, the Indian women playwrights attempt to renegotiate the position of women in Indian society as expressive and assertive individuals rather than subalterns. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nega Mandotra. And I would like you like to ask you a question: Whether is humiliation the strong is the strongest emotion of all? Is it audible? Uh, yes, ma'am. Hmm. 
uh, ma'am in mm-hmm. opinion i think humiliation is a uh, strongest uh, you know um, emotion uh, felt can trigger you to make certain choices that you may not even think about okay it mean it may uh, it can lead you to take and it can lead you uh, in a position of power the only uh, i think the only uh, thing that is is that one has to accept that humiliation and then move forward okay so in that way the humiliation is a form of a trauma yes ma'am okay so very good presentation and another one question for me and uh, so why you are very uh, particular about hindu myth is there not any humiliation in the western myth man there there is i'm not trying humiliation in other mythology is the fact of the you know the uh, narrative the place that i've taken they are focused on hindu mythology so mm-hmm. that my focus is uh, revolving around hindu mythology had i taken humiliation at uh, you know uh, from multiple perspectives and in multiple mythology then i would have uh, in, uh, included other mythology okay also. okay not that but i am asking whether is there any humiliations in connection with the western mythology is there any connection for the humiliation in the western mythology uh yes i can refer is it not yes ma'am we can refer okay uh, it of mithya okay of, for example help helen of troy so yes, oh. we can make connection Oh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you for your wonderful presentation, Nega Malhotra, and the last uh, presenter of this technical session is Liza Pavitran. Liza Pavitran, Assistant Professor, Department of English from KSMBB College, Shastra Makota, Kollam, from Kerala. Yes, ma'am. This Am topic. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes. Dalit women consciousness in the select poems of Vijila Chirappa. We can proceed, uh, Liza Pavitran. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. topic for my presentation is a dalit women consciousness in the selected forms of vijila chirappal dalit women have struggled for centuries against caste based exploitation and such different forms of hierarchies and the neglected voices of malayali dalit writers have now received accolades from the literary spheres across india and also in academy of dalit literary studies we find only a handful of malayali dalit women writers and vijila chirappal is one among them her poems are manifestations of dalit consciousness which reveal discriminations and disparities meted out to the lower caste especially uh, women by the ideologies upheld by the dominant caste the revolutionary zeal of her poems drew the attention of a large number of readers and instilled in them a sense of guilt and justice This paper examines how the Dalit women consciousness is effectively manifested in her selected poems. Born in Calicut, Kerala, Chirappal's poems speak of the experience of living life as a Dalit woman. How intersectionality of gender and caste shapes the lives of these women in Kerala. She maintains that the struggle of every woman is not the same, where she distinguishes between the dominant caste women and Dalit women. Her poems reflect everyday difficulties that the Dalit women face in and out of their homes. Her poems have emerged successful in developing a specifically female framework, and they deal with female realities such as menstruation, marriage, cooking, relationship between daughter and mother, between sisters, etc. We find a sincere approach to the realities of everyday life. Uh, for my presentation, I have selected eight of her poems. and which effectively portrays the dalit women consciousness in the poem amma oru kalpanika kavitha alla to be translated as mother is not a poetic figment of our imagination here the mother figure depicts the harsh realities of dalit life she is blabbering about the mysteries of her life 
In her complaining voice, one can hear the problems the lower class suffers. Even if they have a piece of land and a roof over their heads, they might not be having electricity or water at home. The uneducated mother's voice becomes a criticism of the society. When she is ready to go out to earn her livelihood, she asks her daughter to switch off the radio because it's all in Sanskrit, which is a matter of concern only for the upper class. In another poem entitled uh, Urambuk, to be translated as Wasteland, uh, the Dalit woman named Chandriga tells about the houses where she can enter only through back doors. The poet expresses her bitterness when she bemoans the plight of this woman. She, a human being, and the fish from the market have the same entrance to a house. Ironically, Chandriga entered the house listening to the Indian pledge, all Indians are my brothers and sisters. In another poem, Mumbai Parangaval, uh, to be translated as She Who Flew a Four, the plight of servitude of a mother is picturized who works hard for her kids and family. They are different from the mothers portrayed on big screen who are presented in silk saris and ornaments. Vijila says that the mothers she knew are mothers who face the bitter realities of life. I quote, in our home, there is no TV, no fridge, neither mixer, no grinder, no LPG, not even an iron box. Yet my mother knew how to operate these much before I did, unquote, because she worked as maid in wealthy households. In one another poem, Oru Penpatiude Atmagada, an autobiography of a bitch, the poet draws the pathetic condition of the Dalit women who are presented as the shabby and hungry bitches sniffing and spited chewing gums in the heap of rubbish. People come running to catch hold of her male children and to drag away the female ones. They are neither powerful enough to bark at the strangers coming to their home, nor are they beautiful enough to decorate their houses. Above all, they have no milk, no flesh, not even a smooth skin to be bargained at their markets. The poem ends with a note of pain. I quote, O oh world, O oh world, our race is destined to hide in the backyards, to stare at the heap of waste, to curl and satisfy with the darkness, unquote. Vidila's native place, Perambra, influenced her a lot in her writing. Most of the characters in her poem emerge from this place. This intimacy with the people of her place can be seen in the poem, Arale Chulla Mandil, to be translated as the bus at 6.30. In the bus at 6.30, there are people like the mason, means uh, the carpenter, Kutapan, a woman with her vegetable basket for the market, a fisherwoman called Mariama, a sweeper named Vasandi, etc. The, there are passengers, these are passengers as black as crows and men in dirty shirts who set out to earn their daily bread. The poet presents the passengers as dirty working class people to highlight the condition of life even today. Another poem, Kaigala uh, Tunigal, The Household Rags, strongly describes the protest of the writer against the social as well as the gender discriminations. The dirty kitchen rags symbolizes the Dalit themselves. They have become hard like rocks because of the dirt. Nobody washed them once. The poem ends with a hopeful note. The woman is pushed into the rain. The rain here stands as a rejuvenating and cleansing agent, which will release them from all the bondages. Next poem, Duram, to be translated as the distance, portrays the distance between the developing society and the stagnant condition of the Dalit. The daughter who wants to follow some beauty tips to sustain her youth is stricken with the grief, seeing her old mother preparing a meal with the cheap rice and vegetables she got from her courtyard. The children are playing outside without the amusement and jollity of toys. The stark realities of Dalit life are unveiled here. The last poem, the vanity of upper class is in the last poem, the vanity of upper class is blatantly portrayed uh, in the poem Chotu Patram to be translated as the lunchbox. The virtues of caring and sharing are always associated with the people of the lower strata. Uh, that is what the poet says. Their life is simple and closely related to nature, whereas the upper class is characterized by artificiality and show off. 
The simple ones share their food with each other and praise their mother's skilled hands. But the upper class neither share their food nor, nor even wash their lunch boxes. They don't have the goodness to praise their mother's too. To conclude, Vigila Chirapat's poems uphold the fact that even a household rag can become the manifesto of the new world. Dalit women writers create a world of their own because they are dissatisfied with the present world. In Vidila's own words, her poems are not mere lamentations of the plight of Dalit, but it is to wake them up to their present situation. She finds peace and identity in her homeland, in its smell and in the water of its well. Vidila says that the Kerala society has witnessed a lot of revolutions against casteism for the upliftment of Dalit, especially Dalit women. But Vidila still believes that casteism has still its roots in our minds. One cannot cast it away from the subconscious realm of their minds. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lisa Pavitran. So, all is all the poems are of autobiography in nature? Pardon, ma'am? Is all the poem of uh, the writer is a autobiographical work? Yeah, mostly. Most, most probably, poems. yes. Most probably, all the poems are autobiographical. Yes, because she has firsthand experience of Dalit life because she herself belongs to the community. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Yes, because uh, most probably the whole session as we have been discussing only about the Dalit studies, which has become a new field of research in India and which uh, looks at the problems of marginalized group of uh, groups particularly Dalit peoples and tribal religious minority people. So probably from women from excluded groups or denotified tribes physically challenged and similar groups in economical status and also in social and also in political spheres. And uh, so there are so many, uh, I think, uh, so many uh, Dalit studies, uh, Dalit studies scholars are coming up. Uh, for the research work on the nature and the forms of discrimination and social exclusion, especially faced by the marginalized group. And uh, so Dalit, uh, the research on Dalit studies have become a more uh, regeneration for the field of research for the young uh, researchers. And uh, to the uh, at this in, uh, outset, so Dalit studies, as far as the subaltern studies, um, it concentrates probably on the Dalit studies. And there are so many uh, research has been taken place in order to taking place in order to develop an understanding of the consequence of the social exclusion and discriminations on economic growth and poverty, education, health political participation and on well-being of the marginalized social groups. So one thing that what we can do is to educate the people of the minority communities. So that's the only thing we can make the Dalit or the minority people or the, uh, the marginalized group to get aware of themselves and come forward for their well-being. And that's it. And I would like to conclude by uh, conclude the session by stating this. So all the uh, paper presenters have worked well for the Dalit studies, and they all all of us have come with a uh, one single idea and one single point that we have to educate the marginalized people in order to come up in their life, in order to separate the discriminations particularly the exclusion and discrimination induced deprivations and its consequence. And uh, the, even the, I think the government has uh, uh, supported to uh, the policy making bodies for the inclusive policies also. And there are a lot of funding agencies are also coming uh, forward to enable and to educate the marginalized people. Thank you. Thank you, Narmata, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. You have given shared the wonderful ideas uh, with the parties presenters. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for your uh, for spending your valuable time. And uh, thank you, Dr. Mahalakshmi, madam. And it's my I place my warm gratitude to Dr. Mahalakshmi, the head of uh, AVP College, 
and also the Cape Comorin Trust for giving this opportunity. And uh, in this forum, I would like to thank you, uh, thank everyone for pay, uh, patiently listening and attending this uh, technical session. Thank you, all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. May I take leave, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Uh, and yes, yes ma'am. Um, and one thing I wanted to share with you people, I, I just forgot it. That is, uh, in order to up, bring our the Dalit people, that everyone in the society should think of the sustainability of women and revolt against the society for their uh, discrimination. That is a point I just wanted to uh, share yes, in initial itself, but, but I have just forgotten just now. I remember. So we have. Yes, ma'am. Of uh, course, very good point. A wonderful point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma ma Hello, uh, this is Chitra from Bhutan. I have been invited to speak in this conference. Uh, may I contact the resource, the oh, concern? Yes, ma'am. Ma actually, no. Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Uh, one second, ma'am. One second. Oh, okay. Dear presenters, dear presenters, I think all the presenters are for the next session also here. Ma'am, next session chairperson, uh, Chitra ma'am, sorry, uh, Pavitra Saranya ma'am. Yes ma'am, I'm here ma'am. Ma'am, shall we start the session after ma'am's address? Yes ma'am, yes ma'am, no problem. I'll thank do. you ma'am, thank you so much ma'am. Actually ma'am is waiting for a long time I think so. No, oh, she couldn't be able to join uh, in the previous session. Uh, because I didn't receive the link. I got the link just now from Dr. Bharati Srinivasan, actually. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Very sorry, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Now you can uh, share your ideas and views about uh, the subordinate studies or uh, your uh, talk. Mm. Oh, is it okay? Not yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. And let us, before that, uh, let us have an intro about, I want to give a small intro about you, ma'am. Shall okay. I, ma'am? Uh, all right, all right. Please go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Few seconds, ma'am. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, special uh, speaker of plenary session three, Dr. Chitra Ma'am. Uh, Chitra Ma'am is uh, an assistant professor in English at uh, Shabas College, Royal University of Bhutan. Prior to it, she served, she served in the uh, extended campus of Shabas College, and her assignment was with master's program in English to supervise the research scholars and serve as a program leader for academics and research. She holds two decades of territory teaching experience. Her service record includes teaching expertise in English literature and language, along with curriculum design and course development. Her areas of exploitation include cultural studies, culture studies, contemporary literature, post-colonial liter studies, European literature, women's and gender studies, with avid interest to embrace the emer emerging areas in humanities. She has completed the following funded research projects. The first one titled A Study on English Language Proficiency Level of the Students of Subhast College and Resource Requirement for the Proposed Learning Center. Com uh, she has, yes, it was completed under Faculty and Student Research Enhancement Project funded by Government of India. Project tied assistance followed by a study of factors affecting faculty attrition and turnover intention at Sabast College by the research team. The collaborative project with St. Joseph's College, Darjeeling on collection, transliteration, analysis, and publication of folklore from Eastern Bhutan has been a another milestone work on her, work of her. The following are some of her meritorious academic achievements. She has conducted conducted storytelling sessions as an initiative to promote folk traditions among the adolescents and to preserve the folk tales 
has directed the Shakespearean tragedy Macbeth and her team won the first prize and cash award, including the Best Actor and Actress Awards in the annual drama competition event, the visual celebration held under Sabah Theatre Ensemble. Guided students for the competitions organized by Indian Embassy in 2016 and in 2017. Students' team secured third position in the debate on education among RUB students and the first and second positions in the book reviews. Served as one of the judges for Bhutan's intra Dosgong uh, school theater competition held at uh, Bemagastal from 10th, 11th June 2017. In terms of research, Chitramam has secured second position in the first rep project, REP project presentation was awarded with cash prize. The best dissertation certificate was awarded to her scholar for the master's dissertation title, juxt juxtaposition of sexual and ethnic crisis in Sidham Selvadurai's funny boy. She is also an uh, IELTS trainer and had completed the teaching knowledge test certified by the University of Cambridge. She has edited the following book, Researching New Heights Through Policy Research and Practice, along with a team from the Department of Research and External Relations Office of the Vice Chancellor, Royal University of Bhutan. And she's Co-editing a book on ecocentric literature, uh, writing for Green World to be released in December 20, released in 2022. She has published over 50 plus research articles in book chapters, journals, conference volumes, and presented papers in 60 plus international and national conferences. She had been the overseas examiner for doctoral thesis, member in board of studies for syllabus validation and the editorial board of international journals. Her active engagement in international conferences in the capacity of keynote speaker and also serves as a resource person for online academic workshop, workshops and webinars, what not. Uh, actually, really, we had a great person, eminent personality here. Uh, Dr. Chitra, ma'am, uh, a warm welcome on behalf of our AVB College Management, Cape Pomeran Trust, our department faculty members and all the Presenters, I welcome you once again. Uh, now the session is over to you, ma'am. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, sorry if I have disrupted the schedule because I didn't receive any communication uh, from the concern. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, our participants, presenters, and even chapters and ma'am is readily, uh, eagerly waiting for your waiting for your uh, speech, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, ma'am, uh, before I begin, I would like to know how much time do I have? Ma'am, you have given 30 minutes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, yes, you can please mind the time and I will try to cut short some of my presentation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma uh, so if it exceeds the time before five minutes, you can just remind me so I can do yes, the need accordingly. Uh, so yes, that I will be eating the chunk of time of the presenters during the technical session who are awaiting. No uh, problem. You can carry on, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Could you see the screen? I yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma okay. So now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It is visible. All right. Because I could not see the other screen. I could see only this. That's the difficulty no for me. Your voice is very clear and your uh, screen also visible, ma'am. No problem. Okay. Uh, so with this uh, warm introduction by madam, I would like to go ahead. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this international virtual conference. I'm really very glad that the AP College, AVP College of Arts and Science is conducting the virtual conference because nowadays people want to do hybrid. But still, you have given the opportunity for me to join this conference virtually. That's uh, something great, uh, which I would like to congratulate the team for coming up with this idea and organizing it, even in the new normal. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, and also to uh, Cape Comoran Trust. And I have been introduced to this intellectual gathering by Dr. Bharati Srinivasan, 
uh, she had been the uh, intermediary person, I should say, uh, who sent this brochure and who had been connecting me with the organizers. And there was little communication gap that happened due to this. But I owe my gratitude and thanks to Dr. Bharati Srinivasan at this juncture. Okay, after going through the brochure on subaltern studies, I thought, uh, okay, most of the presentations will be on short stories. I happened to listen to two of the presenters uh, who did in the last technical session. It will be mostly on uh, short stories or it would be on uh, fiction, fictional characters and Dalit literature, Dalit feminism. These might be the topics. I also considered about Dalit literature. Uh, then I ended up in this topic because I want to offer something new, a new insight as a takeaway from my session during this conference. So this made me come up with this topic, rehearsal of revolution, theatrical forms of the oppressed. I have been reading the book, Theater of the Oppressed by Augusto Boyel. And even many of the African playwrights have borrowed their ideas from Augusto Boyle, who is a Brazilian theater director. And this has influenced me too, when I read some of the community plays of Tiango, Yugiwa Tiango, a Kenyan playwright. He has been highly influenced by Augusto Boyle's interactive theater, who has experimented with different forms of theater. This made me choose this topic because it has educational value and these theatrical forms are part of the educational uh, psychology and it is part of the curriculum in some of the countries and it is staged in the socio-cultural centers as well as in the educational institutions as the arsenal part of theater. That made me choose this topic thinking it would be more appropriate for our audience. Theatrical forms of the oppressed. Here, how theater deals with the oppressed and how theater communicates to the oppressed by empowering them to make a new kind of revolution and to liberate themselves from the chains of suffering. It is not expecting anybody to uh, voice their concerns or anybody to play the role for them, whereas people, the mass, the oppressed, they themselves can become part of the action in transforming their own lives by taking charge of the means of production in theatre. This is the idea behind it in nutshell, which I would be elaborating during this presentation. To introduce the concept, First, let me begin with your question. We are all students of literature and having been studying poetry and drama, we have studied that the object of poetry and drama is to instruct and delight. So what is the purpose of art? Should art educate, inform, organize? Or should it influence, incite to action, or simply be an object of pleasure? As I said, poetry and drama as a medium only to delight and instruct. So what is the role of theater here? We have studied about theater that the essential ingredients of drama are there should be a setting for a place of action and characters. Here it is the presentation of fictional persons informed by, interpreted by performers and the use of dialogue. But conventionally, in conventional stage, the dialogue is always between the characters. Whereas the Brazilian theater director, Augusto Boyle, developed the theater of the oppressed. I would be using the abbreviation TO. During the 1950s and 60s, he developed this theater and called it as the theater of the, uh, theater of the oppressed with the mission to transform the monologue of traditional performances into a dialogue. Here, by monologue, he says, only the characters on stage are speaking among themselves. But then he wanted to transform the monologue into dialogue. And here, the dialogue should be between audience and stage. 
Keeping this in mind, Boyle experimented with many kinds of interactive theater, such as image theater, forum theater, invisible theater, newspaper theater, etc. He it goes on and on, believing that dialogue is the dynamic of human beings. And all human beings desire to have dialogue and we are capable of it. So why not we have dialogue in our communication? And his interpretation is that when a dialogue becomes a monologue, oppression begins there, oppression ensues. That's the reason he wanted to practice a theater that is not relying on monologue, but that very much depends on dialogue because he is trying to break the chain of oppression through this dialogue. And this made him consider theater itself as a language, as well as an efficient weapon of liberation in the hands of the people, that is the mass. It is not in the hands of a few actors or the theater companies. He is not depending on the theatrical groups, mainly organized by the aristocrats and the ruling classes. He wanted theater to be in the hands of the mass. Therefore, he strongly objected the efforts of the ruling class that has taken permanent hold on the theater and utilizing it as a tool for domination. To end this conventional practice, he felt the need to change the very concept of what theater is. This is his idea, this is his concept, quote unquote. While some people make theater, we all are theater. So this is his idea of theater. And with this concept, he gave rise to popular theater and it is also known as people's theater. Every theater is performed for the people, but he also considers that it should be performed by the people. That is to say, it should be produced by the people and no longer by the bourgeois, the class which has been historically in possession of the cultural institutions. And further, he wanted to make theater a weapon for liberation in the hands of the masses. And he also felt here, the need to create appropriate theatrical forms. And as a result, change in theater became imperative for him. And to talk about the story of coercive indoctrination, here I would like to take you through a brief history of theater in nutshell. Okay, history means not uh, uh, pages and pages. Briefly, I would just mention few points to uh, uh, inform the audience how coercive indoctrination began with theater in the uh, conventional forms. In the beginning, we know that theater was the dithyrambic song. When we study about Aristotle's poetics, it is the dithyrambic song. Dithyrambic song of, of Greek theater means free people singing in the open air in the form of carnival, in the form of feast. Later, the ruling classes took possession of the theater and they built their dividing walls by separating actors from spectators, people who act and people who watch. This was the first division and that, that's all, the show is over. The spectators just watch, enjoy, they are entertained and they come back. Then secondly, among the actors, a division has been created that is, the protagonist, mainly aristocrats, were separated from the rest of the actors or the chorus, symbolizing in one way or the other, the chorus symbolizes the mass. This is how the protagonist or the aristocratic actors were separated from the mass. Whereas in Boyle's, Augusto Boyle's theatrical view, and also from subaltern perspective, this is considered, this division, this creation of walls, is considered to be the beginning of coercive indoctrination. Here comes the question, how to break this chain of oppression? Not only breaking the chain, but the missing chain need to be completed. So how to complete the cycle? This led to a process. And Boyle describes this process as experiments with the people's theater, and he conducted this experiments in Peru in 1960s and 70s with the workers of the Peruvian nationality. 
And here he came up with the idea that all must act, need not be the actors, the professionally trained actors. He came up with the new concept that all must act and all must be protagonist. This is the poetics of Augusto Boyle. So first he wanted to destroy the barriers created by the ruling classes in the theater. That is the barrier between the actors and the spectators. Having destroyed that, he came up with his ideology. All must act and all must be protagonist in the sense we are all protagonist in the necessary transformations of society. And this is the process. This is the process he described as a method. And this became an experimental theater. For this, he wanted to conquest the means of theatrical production. And but this. Excuse me, excuse me ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, yes, are ma you sharing the slides, ma'am? Are you sharing the slides, ma'am? Yeah. Could you not see? Actually, you are in, no, yes, ma'am. You are in first slide, ma'am. Your slides are not shared. Okay, just a minute. Now? No, ma'am. Could you see now? Could you see the first slide, ma'am? Just a minute. Now I'm sharing the window. Could you see it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I will just move it. I'm oh, sorry. Second slide, could you see? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Shall I make it full screen or like this? Shall I make it full screen? Or better I leave it like this. Maybe full screen you are not seeing. Now I am with the uh, on the tree of the theater of the oppressed. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. OK. Uh, let me proceed then. Um, I left with the point on. Boyle's uh, Poetics of the Oppressed. Okay. So he was talking about the conquest of the means of theatrical production. That should also come to the control of the people. And this idea gave rise to the Poetics of the Oppressed, which is also the Poetics of the Spectators, because Boyle is highly critical about the viewer's position in the theater. That is the position of the spectator. And often he refers to the word spectator as an obscene word. In his dictionary, it's a bad word. OK, here he contradicts highly with Aristotle. And in his view, what is poetics in Boyle's view? He feels theater is change. It has to change the spectators. Theater is not a simple presentation of what already exists. It is a process of becoming. And becoming is an ongoing process, isn't it? So he, is, he disagrees with the idea of being. He wanted theater to be a process of becoming. It is an ongoing process for him in his experimental methods. And he tried to show this in practice by saying how theater can be placed at the service of the oppressed. It has to serve the oppressed. That's the role of the theater, not just to make a presentation. So that by using theater and by taking the means of production of the theater in their hands, the oppressed can express themselves and theater can become a new language that can help them to discover new concepts. For this, the walls that separates actors and spectators need to be toned down. And the main objective of the poetics of the oppressed is to change the people. So change is the key word here. He wanted to change the people. And I told you he is against the word spectators. 
because spectators are considered by him as passive beings in the theatrical phenomenon, he wanted to change this idea by changing the spectators or changing the people from object to subject. So far, where the spectators who go to the theater to watch the performance are objects. They are treated as objects. He wanted them to become subject and he wanted them to become actors and also transformers of the dramatic action to bring a change in the society ultimately. This is the role he gives to the spectator and he, bring, he, he also brings forward the idea of contradiction in the word spectator and uh, he divides the word by spect and actor. From spectator, he is making the word spect actor. And this spect actor is not just an active spectator. It does not mean the spectator need to be an active spectator. It is not just moving from passive to active. By spect actor, he means a non-actor becoming a protagonist, not only in the theater to practice his role in the theater in the fictional space, but also carry carry forward the practice into the society to bring a transformation in the society. This is the meaning he loads on the word spect actor, a non-actor becoming a protagonist. He uses it in the sense of the non-actor and not in the sense of active spectator. So passive active is highly um, contentious for him. He is dealing with active resistance. OK. In what way does this Boilean method differ from the pre-existing theatrical theories? Even before Boyle, there were many dramatists who came up with their theories, isn't it? And here I'm presenting only two cases in the interest of time. To begin with, uh, Aristotle proposed a poetics. And in Aristotle's poetics, the spectator actually delegates power to the dramatic character to act and think for the audience. This is the poetics of Aristotle. And this Aristotle's poetics gave rise to catharsis, purgation of emotions for the audience. But the audience gave away the power of acting and thinking to the actors on the stage. And if we take case two, a uh, German playwright Bertolt Brecht, who is a playwright as well as here, uh, theorist in theater, he proposes a poetics in which the spectator delegates power to the character who acts in the place of audience. The character is still an actor in place of the audience, but the spectator reserves the right to think for himself. Often this goes in opposition to the character. In um, Brett's case, there is an awakening of critical consciousness that happens in the audience. Whereas Boyle's Poetics of the Uplist focuses on the action itself, unlike the Poetics of Aristotle and Poetics of Brett, he focuses on the action. Here, the spectator delegates no power at all to the character actor, either to think or act in his place. On the contrary, the spectator himself assumes the protagonic role, changes the dramatic action, discusses plans for change with the participants, and then tries out the solution on the stage. So in the fictional space, it, he rehearses the solution and verifies whether the solution is feasible. Is it a workable solution? In short, the spect actor participant see the divisions. The spectator has already become spect actor and the spect actor is consulting with the other participants. So the spect actor participant trains himself. He is nothing but the common man. He trains himself for real action actually in the safety of the fictional space. In this case also, theater is not completely revolutionary in itself, in the sense it is not inciting revolution, but theatrical space is surely becoming a space to rehearse. It is a rehearsal space of the revolution. So thus those ideas are getting incited and they are practiced also. So it becomes feasible for the man to put that 
into reality. He can practice that act in reality in the society. Here, the liberated uh, spectator as a whole launches into action. And no matter the action is fictional, what matters here is action. Let me move to the next slide. Hope you can hear it. Yes, ma'am. Now, how this transformation happens? Uh, I will quickly take you through some stages, transforming the spectator into spect actor, having explained the word. This happens in Boyle's paper. Yeah? Ma'am, five more minutes, ma'am. OK, I'm well on time. Um, here, uh, it, uh, he takes us through four stages. Uh, first, it begins with body, knowing the body and making the body expressive. This is how he begins, and this results in image theater because the belief here is the first word of the theatrical vocab is the human body. Not only in Boyle's theater, in theater in general, the first word of the theatrical vocab is human body itself because body is the source of sound and movement. When we speak, we sit and speak, be it a physical conference or online conference, we are present as the body and we body is communicating it is the source body becomes the source of sound and movement isn't it therefore to control the means of theatrical production in that space man must first know his own body and control his own body in order to make it more expressive this is the idea behind it then uh, man can practice the theatrical forms and he can move from the condition of spectator to that of actor Thereby, he ceases to be an object, but becomes a subject, and he is also changing from being a witness to that of your protagonist. And in the image theater, a human body is used as a tool of representing feelings, ideas, and relationships. Along with that comes making the body expressive through theatrical games. Then comes the third part, and the third stage is theater itself is a language, because one begins to practice theater as a language that is living. It is full of life and it and also it belongs to the present moment. Therefore, theater is not a space to display the finished product. Rather, it is an ongoing process. Here, I would like, to, then theater is also a discourse because a lot of discussion is going on about the feasibility of the solutions. A situation is taken. I will close with one illustration. Uh, here, I have taken the example of exploitation in a fish export factory. And in this factory, the workers were exploited by making them to work for 12 consecutive hours. That was uh, to combat this inhuman exploitation. Each participant came up with a proposal and they invented some uh, solutions with a native ingenuity to work as operation turtle. That means in a slow manner or to work faster so that the machine itself breaks down. He, they want to fill the machine with excessive fish. But this solution was disagreed by the group member. So they gave up another solution, the SPECT actor participant. Uh, finally, they suggested uh, to go on with a strike or to throw a bomb at the machine and to start a union. All of these solutions were discussed. They discussed about strike and realized that it is impracticable because with so much unemployment around, the boss would always find a replacement for the strikers. And they also abandoned the idea of bomb solution. Finally, the solution of forming a small trade union to negotiate the workers' demands as well as to politicize because the theater is also a political space to politicize the workers as well as the unemployed. So this solution was judged to be the best by the participants. Here we can see in, this is an example from Forum Theater, where theater works as a language and as a discourse. And in Forum Theater, no idea. The people have the opportunity to discuss all their ideas and rehearse the possibilities, the pros and cons of the ideas. and. Finally, it is also verified in the safety of the fictional space that is in theater as a theatrical practice. We see here that forum theater not only empowers audiences, but also make them part of the action. This is how oppression 
can be put to an end by making the oppressors take the action and do it for themselves. And it also illustrates that alternatives and the choices are consulted, which can ultimately change the outcomes. I think uh, in the interest of time, I have touched upon uh, these points uh, to talk about the different kinds of theater that was experimented by him. So I have given a few examples. And from this, to conclude, uh, first, Boyle uses theta to make the oppressive situation and also the mechanism of domination visible. It is not hidden. He brings that to the light. Secondly, the performance itself is not enough because drama, according to Boyle, is aimed to let people try to change the representation of their situation by involving themselves, by acting on stage, and then by implementing that action in real life, whatever they have attempted to do in the fictional space. Thirdly, he conceives theater as a method. Here, method and praxis both go together so that people can perform by themselves using some of the techniques, even if they are not professional um, actors. The non-actors can also practice these techniques in group without needing the help of professional actors to act instead of them. People can act and think for themselves and they can bring about a change in their situation so that oppression can come to an end. At least the chain of oppression can be broken and then the cycle of life can be completed in a better manner with better working conditions and prosperity. So these are some of the elements which form the bedrock of the theater of the oppressed. These are the key ideas involved in it. I'm glad that I could communicate some of the key notions associated with the theater of the oppressed conceived by Augusto Boyle, which is ever expanding with different purposes. One such purpose is it is also becoming therapeutic as a psychodrama session. Uh, with this note, uh, let me come to an end. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so Thank much, ma'am. Really, you have added a flavor by explaining about experimental and traditional theater and captivated the participants with a new perspective. And you have proved yourself as the best teacher without missing the session and sharing the knowledge. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma thank you really, your information was very crystal clear, and we have gained more knowledge, ma'am. Okay. I was perturbed because uh, there was no link. I didn't receive the link. Uh, it is good that I received the link and I could share my ideas with the participants. I uh, hope it's well taken. Your words uh, prove that. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much ma for spending your valuable time with us. Yeah. May I take leave then? Or do I have yes, to wait? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma all right, ma'am. Thanks to yes. you. And Trust, Cape Comorin Trust. Wish you all the best for the success of this conference. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Ma yeah. Bye. Bye to all of you for your patient listening. Please carry on with your. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I think the presenters are ready. Mm. May I know? Welcome, Dr. V. M. Saranya, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am. Sorry for the delay. Uh, not thank you all, for not it's my pleasure, ma'am. No, excuse me, ma'am. It's time for first of all, ma'am, lecture, ma'am. Kusum, ma'am, is very complete. Kushbu, ma'am, is in line, ma'am. Yes, Kusum, ma'am, is waiting, ma'am. Uh, she is our second speaker. One second, one second. Ma'am, shall we have ma'am's session after this uh, session? Ma'am, shall we start our uh, technical session? 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kusum ma'am is waiting for uh, her lecture, ma'am. One thirty to two p.m. Uh, is time. Is her time? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll rec, ma'am. Kusum, ma'am. Uh, yes, 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 uh, Doctor L. Mahalakshmi. Uh, I'm, I'm able to hear you. Ma'am, uh, ma'am, shall we have the session after the technical session, or do you want to share uh, the knowledge now, ma'am? Uh, ma'am, can you kindly please tell me that how long it is going to take and when I have to present later? Ma'am, it will take one hour, ma'am. It will take one hour, forty-five minutes to one hour, ma'am. Okay. So, can you do it now? Yes, ma'am. You want to do it, ma'am? Ah uh, yes, I I can continue right now. I'm ready with this. Okay, dear presenters, ma and chairperson, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, shall we continue the technical session after ma'am's lecture, ma'am? Okay, ma'am. Okay. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry for the delay. No issues, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Dear presenters, we will have uh, one more half an hour more uh, to start the session. Now I request Dr. Kushum, Kushum Sajuma to share her knowledge, sharing ideas. Ma'am, Ma uh, we are very okay. much welcome for this wonderful international uh, knowledge forum on behalf of uh, our uh, AVP College Management and Department on Cape Comoran Trust and all the participants. I welcome you all. Uh, I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just take a minute just to share my slide. Just a minute. Uh, is it visible? Can Can you see my slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone present here. And uh, I'm really glad and grateful that I get this opportunity to share my views on this significant topic of this workshop that is Subaltern Studies. And under the title of Subaltern Studies, my subject today is Cross Cultural Discourse. So, before directly going to Cross Cultural Discourse, I am going to share a small synopsis of what do we understand by subaltern studies. So in post-colonial theory, subaltern is a term which very effectively explains the hierarchy of power relationships and legacy of cultures left by colonialism. The term is coined by Antonio Gramsci, which simply means of inferior rank. So as many of the eminent thinkers, they had been discussing that all those people who are pushed to margin for one reason or the other are subalterns. They are of the inferior rank or they are suffering from that inferiority due to certain reasons. The subaltern studies deal with the marginal societies that have suffered the pangs of colonialism the dilemma of constituting a cultural identity and reclaim it from the colonizer or from the hegemonic power groups. So here it is really interesting to know that we cannot look at the contemporary world without looking at colonialism. 
so here when i will be talking about cross cultural discourse i am taking the angle of colonial and post colonial because as it is it is already said that the uh, whole of the globe across the globe colonialism has shaped and reshaped history culture and identity of so many societies the theme of subaltern can be used to refer to someone who is disadvantaged underprivileged or has been denied the right to speak and it also alludes to the suppressed group of people from the lower socio economic strata particularly women who has been harassed for centuries for example i am taking uh, i am taking the example of rudali a short fiction written by mahashweta devi in context to women on the double margin how women are on the double margin because in patriarchal societies when they are dalit and women they are pushed to the double margin they are not addressed even the right to life marginal peripheral overlooked exploited disregarded and handled with unconcern and indifference are all terms that can be used to describe subaltern so all those groups all those individuals societies cultures who are related to these terms either marginal or peripheral or exploited so they may be called subaltern subaltern cultural studies so subaltern cultural studies analyze the interplay of binary relationship of dominance and subordination of us and other especially in colonial system so this was very much obvious under the rule of colonialism whole of the world was divided into two binary oppositions that was self and other everything which belonged to the self was superior and everything which belonged to the other was inferior and that is why when it comes to culture all those people who were the inhabitants of ex colonies or colonies at particular period of time they always remained marginal they never came to center it refers to the marginal groups excluded from the dominant power structures on the basis of social political economic and cultural differences cross cultural discourse in subaltern studies began with the process of reclaiming the cultural dignity and identity from the colonial mindset so the post colonial writing and post colonial narrative to much extent is the registration of resistance which people are showing towards the hegemonic superiority so before moving ahead let's define culture culture is a very complex phenomena every individual belongs to certain kind of rituals habits customs food habits clothing belief system and collectively we call it culture so how do we define culture i am quoting paul james here culture is defined as a social domain that emphasizes the practices discourses and material expressions which over time express the continuities and discontinuities of social meaning of life a life held in common so the people who share common culture uh, especially common rules of behavior and social organization can constitute a society and this is how one society segregates it from the other one particular group of people remain aloof from the another group of people only basis of these practices which these people are doing from time immemorial and they have defined it as culture so no doubt the historical forces shaped and reshaped the cultural formations but colonialism came 
as a sweeping force and washed away all the existing structures of the colonies. It divided the communities as superior and inferior on the basis of culture and civilization. The East has always been depicted as uncivilized and inferior by the West. As the Westerners had a poor understanding of the Eastern culture, so their understanding, or we may call misunderstanding, of the East ignited their ambition to rule over the region. So Stuart Hall, he remarks here, I'm quoting, cultural identities, far from being eternally fixed in some essentialized past, they are subject to the continuous play of history, culture, and power, unquote. So when we talk about cultural identities, it is really important to understand that it is a process which keeps on happening. And there are so many forces which work together to give it a contemporary shape. We take any culture, the contemporary scenario is the result of history or the continuity of past. The outer circumstances have a, a deeper impact on cultures as well as on individuals. So that is why uh, we need to look at colonialism as a shaping force of contemporary cultures and simultaneously individuals. So colonial and post-colonial -colonial narrative. The process of colonization has made an irreparable impact on world history. The social and cultural fabric of the present world is dominantly shaped by colonialism, as I have already talked about it. Over the period of time, colonial elite developed a narrative of power, power relationships. They portrayed the colonizer as superior ruler and the colonized as inferior or the root. And how it was filled in the psychology of the ruled that they are born to, to be ruled. As the European or the Western forces always portrayed the narrative that they are born to rule. Colonial narrative justifies colonization and imperialism as natural process. Civilizing the primitive. This was the major reason that they were moving to Asian and African continents because they considered them as primitive, savage, wild, uncivilized. And their concern was to civilize them. Colonial writing declares indigenous people and cultures savage and primitive. So this became the moral duty of the West to rule over the rest of the world. Post-colonial writing is a stereotyped effort to counter the narrative created by the colonizer. It majorly registers a strong resistance to the, to the colonization and its devastating consequences. Then you, you know, suddenly so what happened when people, when many of the countries, suppose if we take example of India, in last 75 years of independence, the post-colonial writing and writing writers, they are making every effort to register the resistance against the narrative which is being created by the ruler, the colonizer. Post-colonialism is mainly concerned about the study of cultures, formerly colonized societies struggling to detangle their identity and culture from the clutches of colonialism. So this is what the post-colonial writing is doing. They are trying to free themselves. And you know, the work is not only to free themselves, but it is also to redefine themselves. They have lost their definition somewhere. Post-colonial theory significantly draws attention towards cultural identity. This is a process of relocating and reclaiming the lost roots, the loss of traditional culture, beliefs, and values. 
culture and subalternity so how do we relate both of them world history has divided culture in a binary relationship of hegemonic culture and subaltern culture culture of the self and other those cultures who are superior and ruling on all other primitive and uncivilized cultures it is about power and authority and has it one has it and one doesn't so as uh, we have seen in subaltern studies whether it is it is dalit literature or patriarchal societies we are talking about or we are talking about women uh, or women plight every everything is everything is about power one has it and another they do they do not have so the history and culture of the subaltern is represented and projected by the ruler or the master so i am uh, quoting here gayatri spivak questions quote can the subaltern speak unquote the subaltern cultures in colonial and post colonial societies are rejected and neglected as inferior their voices are not heard and when the voices are not heard they are not appreciated post colonial societies and cultures post colonial societies and cultures are impossible to be understood except the relationship to the history of imperialism and colonial rule so if today we are trying to understand post colonial cultures as i said that we need to go back revisit history revisit the process of colonization reassertion of native cultural identity remained the significant concern of post colonial societies so it is not only to redefine it redefine my culture but it is a process of relocating it and to reclaim it so they negotiate the two or multiple identity narratives the nations that experienced colonialism need to rewrite its legacy rooted in its persisting cultures they need to free themselves from the colonial power relations so it is an effort to decolonize the mind of post colonial societies and develop a post colonial identity based on cultural interactions between different identities so in today's global world we need to uh, rewrite all those written narratives which were about superiority and inferiority and here it is the time of cultural interactions where two or more culture cultures or people from two or more cultures they are getting the chance to interact and to celebrate the glory of their culture so diasporic culture in post colonial writing so the people who are making the efforts to reclaim it so the yearning for lost motherland is the most overwhelming sentiment of the diasporic writing in the beginning when the migrations were forced and return was not possible the yearning was intense so here we are talking about the old generation diasporic writing and diasporas these migrants crossing the boundaries of time and space making all the efforts to adapt with the new surroundings but long to return to home one day consequently they remain on margin and lose their identity as a peripheral man so here we can take example of mg vasanji's novel the in between world of vikram lal where lal family vasanji has portrayed that how lal family they are trying to preserve their identity by celebrating their festivals by preparing indian cuisines and by cre recreating mini india in their small drawing rooms so the quest for identity nostalgia rerooting uprooting and multicultural milieu has become the foremost concerns of diaspora old generation diasporic writing 
transfers the migrant experiences from one generation to another. So here our concern is not old generation diaspora because that time is over. Now they carry a perception of history that links them to the past whilst also carrying an insight into the future. So what these old generation diasporas, they have to offer to the coming generations. They are carrying the history with themselves and handing it over to the coming generations. Physical dislocation of people from their motherland create a number of social and cultural issues, but at the same time, it offers the wider perspectives of diasporic experiences. So as I am taking this, the presentation to cross-cultural discourse, how the preservation of small identities, of local identities, has taken the shape of globality. Diasporic fictions at the core try to unravel the complicated layers of cross-cultural confrontations through the experiences of people caught between two cultures of the East and the West. The past and present shuffle in search of concrete identity. So how this transition happened? From old generation diaspora, from old generation post-colonial narrative, Two, the cosmopolitan narrative, how this transition is happening and has happened. From quest of identity to the creation of identity is the narrative of transition. Because earlier, people were trying to search for their identity. Now, they are in the effort to create new identities for themselves from displacement to replacement of is the new idea. Earlier, people had been struggling with displacement, uprooting, nostalgia, belongingness, longing. But now it is being replaced by replacement in the multicultural melting pots, where the previous generation struggled to maintain their identity, suppose their Indianness, the new generation is merging and trying to strike a harmonious balance between two or multiple identities. So this is how the transition has happened. Now the people who get migrated to different places for various reasons, no doubt that they get nostalgic at the loss of their home or homelands but their efforts to assimilate in the new culture is appreciable and as a result of that now the quest of identity has become a creation of identity the disruption of the binary opposition of local and global is the new strategy it is a new strategic way to formulate a new world culture which is beyond the problematic relation of hegemony and subalternity. So now it is the world, global world, where people who are migrating from one place to another, going to host countries, they do not feel, go with inferiority. They, they do not feel that sense of loss. They claim their identity and they try to assimilate with the host. Now, though people encounter cultural crisis, but soon they explore new ways of belonging and becoming in new land. So this is the new process which is leading us to globality and what that is belonging and becoming. Further, how modern day diaspora is looking at cross cultural discourse. Modern day diasporic writing offer representations of changed attitudes of family and social systems due to the immigration into the lands with different values and cultures. So there are 
people from different backgrounds, different value systems, and they experience two different nations and cultural identities, but at the same time realize the necessity of globalization in life. So at present, when the world has become a global village, when people are migrating from one place to another, they are in the process of, become, of becoming a global citizen. So here I'm quoting Yasmin Hussain, quote, being in diaspora means living in a cross-cultural context in which change, fusion, and expansion are inevitable. Unquote. So this is really beautiful to understand that now when people are, uh, they come and encounter a, with different cultures and different identities, they try to fuse it. They try to expand their identity. They do not want to make it more complex and preserve it as their own. And that is the process which is inevitable. So there are few terms which are really important in context to cross-cultural discourse. So the term hybridity has been most recently associated with the works of Homi K. Bhava, commonly refers to the creation of transcultural forms within the contact zone created by colonization. Bhava contends that all cultural statements and systems are constructed in a space that he calls the third space of enunciation. So he says when, the, when two people who belong to two different cultures, they come in contact with each other, this creates a third space. And this third space is the space of mutuality where two people interact with each other and they try to merge and recreate new identity. And this is the third space of enunciation. In post-colonial discourse, hybridity has simply been used to express cross-cultural exchange. It is also an attempt to stress the mutuality of cultures and the process of assimilation and integration that is termed as acculturation so when we've seen that when people migrate from suppose india or any other country to america so they try to eat their food to be like them to clothe themselves the way they clothe themselves to uh, just accustom themselves in their customs to practice what those people are practicing they are trying to adopt the mainstream and that is the effort which we call acculturation. So acculturation, when the immigrant population adopt the mainstream food, customs, traditions, clothing, and fashion, they try to become American. And this is the process that is called acculturation. So now, a step forward from acculturation is transculturation which is happening right now in the contemporary world. Transculturation is a term coined by Cuban anthropologist Fernando Ortiz in 1947 to describe the phenomena of merging and converging cultures. On the other hand, it also refers to the encounters between or among cultures, in which each one acquires and adapts elements of others and changes in one culture by the introductions of elements from another. So this is the process of transculturation and how it is different from acculturation. So in acculturation, maybe you leave behind your practices and you adopt the other one. But in transculturation, two cultures come in contact with each other and maybe they merge, they fuse, and they expand with some new identity. And that is transculturation. In today's global world of cultural interactions, the binaries of self and other, of center and margin, of superiority and inferiority are dismantling. 
the world seems to be growing in new possibilities. For example, people from different countries and from different cultural backgrounds tend to create altogether a new culture, which is neither of the majority nor of the marginal minorities. And that is the beauty of these processes. Because in today's world, when the people are doing businesses and communications are happening global and people are, have to interact even from one country to another, from one community to another. So these processes which are leading us to globalization become very significant. Cross-cultural discourse. When we define cross-cultural discourse or literature, we are talking about comparing uh, one or one culture's worldview to another culture's worldview. Writers who belong to more than one culture are able to explore the possibilities of multiple cultural identities. So I'm quoting here, according to Stuart Hall, there are at least two different ways of thinking about cultural identity. One is the terms of shared culture and second of what we are. We are means where we are already rooted. And later on, when we start sharing our cultures. So this insight explains the cross-cultural narratives that represent the struggle of balancing the home and the host and further transcending the disparities of culture. So this transcendent, the, this process of transcending, it is, it makes the uh, cross-cultural discourse happen. Further, this represents a new way of looking at history and culture, not focused on subordination or inferiority, but on shared, equal, and global identity. The term is used to describe discourses involving cultural interactivity. Here, when you belong to a certain country or place or community or culture, when you interact with the another culture, it is not with any binary. It is not with any opposition. It is interaction, inter that healthy interaction where you glorify your culture, you celebrate your culture equally. Writers portray their characters making efforts to amalgamate the food habits, clothing lifestyle, and much more, which symbolizes a diasporic assimilation of two or more cultures. As Amrathya Sen opines here, quote, modern Indians see themselves as global citizens. And they aspire to make use of the best of both worlds, while they retain a sense of affiliation and companionship with India and Indians. They find no contradictions in being loyal citizens of country they have emigrated. Unquote. So this is how to make best of both worlds. The place where your roots are and the place where you are moved to. So now I am concluding this. Cross-cultural discourse is an effort to create a parallel worldview of different cultures across the globe. There is also an effort to reclaim one's cultural dignity without being inferior or superior. So Balkan cultural voices loudly registers resistance to the elite voices of hegemony and negate subjugation. So the, the platform which has been provided by cross-cultural discourse has enabled the post-colonial narrative to raise their voice and to put forward their narrative as it is. The post-colonial writing creates a space for the subaltern to speak, to look at the word history and culture from their perspective. Because as, suppose if we had been the inhabitants of the ex-colonies, it does not mean that we are the subject to history. We have a voice. And we have the capacity to loud our voices and to express ourselves from my station, from our places. And the elite intellectuals do not and cannot represent their stance. So it is not possible. 
if the westerners are going to propagate and portray us in their narrative maybe that is the faulty one the elite intellectuals do not and cannot so without any imposed boundaries today's world is a global village and that is what cross cultural discourse is globalization is a continuous process of socio cultural change so this presentation makes a point that today's post colonial literature is a reflection of cultural changes and adaptations it is also a representation of ethics social political and economic advancements in the world cross cultural discourse helps us to transcend cultural barriers build cultural bridges and appreciate cultural differences we cannot deny the fact that history matters a great deal in constructing contemporary realities but today we live on an interrelated world and coexistence is the only way so that's all uh, with this presentation and uh, i would like to extend my thanks to this prestigious platform of cape comorin trust and my special thanks to dear dr shelja vasudeva ma'am to offer me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this eminent platform thank you so very much and to all the thank listeners thank you so well. thank you so much ma'am thank you so much uh, kusham shanchu ma'am really last but not least actually you are the last speaker of the plenary session and you have uh, proved your eminence through your uh, clear presentation on post colonial literature and uh, amalgamation, amalgamation of culture thank you so much ma'am thank you so much thank you thank you ma'am thank you and uh, dear presenters our technical session begins now i think our chairperson is waiting for a long time dr uh, vm saranya ma'am yes ma'am uh, thank yes. you so much for your patience ma'am and uh, spending your uh, valuable time with us ma'am thank you ma'am a uh, hearty welcome for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation forum ma'am uh, now i invite uh, Ms. Pavitra to introduce a chairperson. Good afternoon, that, everyone. Request, before that, I request the presenters to make your presentation uh, short, shorter one. Yes, Pavitra. Good afternoon, proceed. everyone. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our chairperson, Dr. V. M. Saranya, ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of English, PST College of Arts and Science. She have. she have 13 years of experience in teaching being a research supervisor she is guiding three phd scholars she is also a trainer for competitive exams like ielts and bec from 2011 and life member in the indian society for technical education from 2014 she is the member of board of studies for both ug and pg she have attended various workshop and conferences She also published anthologies and journals in Scopus and UGC CAT. She completed many certificate courses and also been the chairperson for various programs. Ma'am, now I request you to proceed the session. Thank you, Pavitra, ma'am, for your wonderful introduction. Thank Shall we start you. the session, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. You can carry on. A very warm afternoon to one and all gathered here in the virtual platform. It is it is indeed a great honor to share the session as a chairperson for the international virtual conference on subaltern studies. I deem it a great pleasure to thank the magnanimous management of A A V P College Principal, Ma'am, H O D, Dr. Mahalakshmi Ma'am, and the organizers from the Department of English and Cape Cameron Test for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I truly consider this platform as knowledge sharing. Let's begin the virtual session of five presenters today. The first presenter of this afternoon is Ms. K M Bandana, research scholar from Guru Kangri Deemed University, going to present the paper titled "Purifying the Narcissist Hero: A Feminist Study 
of Kavabata Asu Nari's Snow Country. Shall we start, Bandana? Good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are very much audible. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bandana. I am a research scholar from Gurukul Kangri deemed to be University Haridwar. And today I am presenting a paper uh, titled Purifying the Narcissist Hero, a feminist study of Kawabata Yasunari's Snow Country. I'll try to make this presentation short. Um, I'll start with sharing my screen first. Uh, is it visible to everyone? The screen? Yeah, Hello, it is. Yeah, it is. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so I'll start with the objective of my study. So I'm trying to attempt to investigate the role of women in Yasunari Kawabata's novel, Snow Country, in which I believe they are shown as being weak, subordinate and just serving as sex objects to the male protagonist and other male characters. Um, I'll start with the introduction of the writer. So Kawabata Yasunari was a Japanese modernist novelist and a short story writer who won the Nobel Prize of Literature in 1968, where, uh, becoming the first Japanese author to get this honor. Uh, he was writing before and after World War II, so, war, uh, so World War has a great influence on not only his life, but on his literary work also. Uh, there's a sense of loneliness, meaninglessness, alienation, and preoccupation with death in most of Kawabata's work. Uh, some of his best known works are Snow Country, The Old Capital, A Thousand Cranes, and these works were also cited by the Nobel Committee in 1968. Uh, moving to uh, feminism and feminist literary criticism, because my work is in a uh, feminist analysis. Uh, so first, I would like to draw a comparison between feminism as a movement and feminist literary criticism as a a uh, technique of uh, literary analysis because most of people get confused between two. Uh, so feminism is a range of socio-political movements and ideologies that aims to define and establish uh, the political, economic, uh, personal and social equality of gender. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft is seen by many as the founder of feminism uh, because of uh, 1792's work, uh, which is titled A Vindication of the Rights of Women, where she argues for the right of education of women. Uh, in the same work, she also uh, rejected the established view that women are naturally weaker or inferior to men. According to her, that women must be treated as equal as to men because they have to play a crucial role in society, namely bringing up uh, children. And in this process, education is very must and important. Now talking about feminist literary criticism, it's a technique of uh, literary analysis that involves feminist viewpoint. And this technique is used to analyze the representation of women in art, for example, in literature, in cinema, and in um, TV shows also. For example, if we take the portal of women in Indian movies and television, especially uh, first talking about the representation of women in uh, Indian movies, we see uh, they are always in subordinate position. Like they have uh, basically nothing to do in movies, uh, except some uh, some movies, they are always pleasing the male protagonist dancing around them. So they are treated as a sex object. While um, if we talk about Indian TVs, women are presented and they are confined to domestic and motherly role. And sometimes they are presented as dumb and dumb, uh, overly emotional and irrational characters. So it is the uh, it is a function of feminist literary criticism uh, to analyze this kind of representation. And further, it argues that this kind of representation of women as weak, docile, innocent, seductive or irrational influence the mindset of people and also society. And it, it may it it make up a negative image of women. 
uh, now I will uh, give a brief uh, summary of the novel. Uh, Snow Country is a novel uh, which is a uh, which talks about a failed love story between a wealthy Tokyo dilettante uh, whose name is Shimamura and a Gesa whose name is Komako. So uh, Komako is a Gesa. Uh, Gesa's uh, Gesa in Japanese culture are female artists who entertain. Um, um, uh, people by dancing and singing in a traditional Japanese way. So in this story, uh, Shimamura Shimamura is the basically is the customer of Kum, uh, Komako. Um, she entertain she entertain him, but in this process also falls in love with him. Uh, Shimamura, who is uh, already a married man, um, is still uh, uh, is still uh, make relationship with her, never uh, attempt to stop her by uh, her, and also uh, also never um, also have a feeling for another female character, Yoko. Um, next, I will give an analysis. Uh, a critic called Roy Starr in his work Sounding in the Time has made a statement that Kawabata's self-loathing heroes are usually purified by coming into contact with a beautiful and innocent young girl. And in majority of Kawabata's writing, the heroine serves precisely this purpose. They must serve the leading man. This is their sole identification. They are treated as sex object by the narrator. Um, uh, the uh, the hero in this novel, Shimamura, like the majority of the male protagonists in Kawabata's work, is a classist, uh, classic narcissist, and he is narcissist because this person is already married, and still he begins a connection with uh, this female Komako, who he he who he knows that loves him, despite knowing all these things. And despite knowing that he cannot reciprocate his feeling, he continued to visit her until he finally sleeps with her. And everything goes fine between them until Komako starts expressing her love for him, which freaks out Shimamura. And according to Freud, it is a uh, characteristic trait of a narcissist person that uh, they are uh, they are pleased until their demand are fulfilling. But um, when people uh, ask for uh, uh, return of favor or demand something from them they they get scared so it's a uh, uh, it's a characteristic trait, uh, trait of a narcissist person um second thing is uh, uh, here to notice that the male protagonists of this writer's novel uh, are always uh, obsessed with purity for them women are uh, pure um, until they don't make relationship with other people once they, once uh, they make relationship with uh, people they don't remain uh, pure uh, doesn't matter if they are kind they are loving they are caring they they are hard working Educated. So this way, uh, the, the writer has portrayed women just to serve men. Uh, I would um, I would conclude uh, by saying that um, in this novel, women are not portrayed as independent and powerful figure. Uh, the novel's female protagonist faces sexism despite their positive trait. For example, in this novel, the female protagonist, she is a strong and capable, and uh, she is caring for family. And even she take care of um, a person who is son of her teacher. And in this novel, she is presented uh, as a uh, accomplished musician also this girl is a pure innocent innocent and full of love she is dedicated to her work and despite all these uh, characteristic um, the writer has writer despite um, rather celebrating her qualities he portray her as a woman desperate for love and reduced to sobbing and overly sentimental seduction and it's not only the story of this women, women around the world, even in this modern era, they are chained to the chains of ignorance and are still vulnerable target of abuse and equality. And I would like to conclude my paper by making a statement that um, uh, why we need feminism and why we need a feminist study of uh, literature is because many people, uh, some people like some many, uh, especially many men, uh, when they hear of feminism um 
they think that men, uh, women when they are talking about feminism they and they uh, they mean that they want to demean belittle or uh, dis, uh, dis disregard men and want to be superior over men but uh, when when women are speaking of feminism they just want equality uh, they they want equal right they want equal opportunity and the the respect they deserve so feminism is to uplift men not to uh, demean or belittle men and it is needed and why representation representation is matter is because uh, the way uh, if women are uh, represented powerful uh, in a positive and a fair uh, fair way in literature like uh, movies uh, or cine uh, movies or tv also it will bring um, changes in people mind uh, the image of women in uh, people mind and society thank you hello yes thank you bandana for your clear presentation due to time constraint you are uh, pushed to rush up fast thank you for briefing the japanese culture uh, geisha i have a question for you yes ma'am yes uh, you told about uh, the images of clean and pure purity what is the yes, significance in relationship with the main characters portrayed uh, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Can you repeat your question? Yes, the images of clean and purity we're talking, right? What yes, is the significance of it with the major characters portrayed? No, I didn't answer, understand the question. Can you just? Uh... Okay. So the significance of uh, see, the, you spoke about the clean and purity are frequently mentioned in your presentation. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, connect with the significance in relation to nature. No, ma'am. Uh, the thing is, uh, my title, uh, my uh, my title, which uh, is uh, also uh, purifying the narcissist male. So purifying is uh, the uh, function of purifying is done by the female characters. So the writer has presented women just to first serve to men. Uh, like um, actually, uh, if uh, we straightly say, sexually serving. Yes, Second, uh, why is uh, they are concerned about purity is because once, uh, like for example, the he uh, the male protagonist in this novel, once he make a physical relationship with this woman in this novel, he start ignoring her, he start rejecting her, um, and uh, he he treats her like that she is nothing to him. So once they have a kind of uh, defiled the, the, these women because uh, because now he has made relationship with her, so she is no more pure to uh, pure to him. So after that, they start uh, searching for other women. So this is the meaning of purity uh, uh, of women in this. Like uh, they have a, uh, that kind of mindset, the Victorian mindset, where uh, when men was allowed to have extra relation, extra marital relationship or uh, um, more than one or two relationship but women are confined only to have relationship with their husband so this kind of mentality is there is presented in this novel okay thank you thank you bandana okay ma'am thank you yes shall we move to the second presenter i think mrithala is raising her hand do you have oh. any question oh uh, hello ma'am i'm chandra prabha mahavar i'm the second presenter Okay. Uh, am I Answer. clearly audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, you are audible. Your uh, title is on mapping the arc of Dalit women on cellulite from denial to reclaiming agency. Yes, mm -hmm. are you ready to present? Yeah, ma'am. Yes, go ahead. So, first, I'll share my screen. So my PPT is visible, ma'am? Yes, it's uh, visible. Yeah, OK. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Chandra Prabha Mahavar, a PhD scholar from Central University of Rajasthan. And I'm also uh, I'm also assistant professor under, uh, uh, under the college education department of Rajasthan. So here, my presentation start. The, um, the title of my presentation, the paper is Mapping the Arc of Dalit Women on Celluloid from Denial to Reclaiming Agency. 
then first of all i discuss cinema like what what is really cinema i know and how it furthers the the dalit activism in general so uh, popular culture is a very famous part of you know indian cinema uh, uh, indian cinema and like vice versa indian popular culture which is basically the mass culture or people's culture and uh, generally recognized as a set of practices beliefs standards and objects that are prevalent in a society at a given point of time uh, transmitted by the mass media including the social media of course nowadays this collection of ideas um sort of permits permits this uh, everyday lives of people especially our youth forces so by its very nature this common accessibility it has uh, it gives uh, dalits with a chance you know it provides them with a chance to change as well as challenge the prevailing sentiments and norms of behavior so it also the cinema in itself uh, the indian cinema works as the protest art here i'm taking into account the hindi movies the three hindi movies which i'm going to discuss in the in the further presentation uh, how does cinema actually work uh, you know as far as the activism thing is concerned so it pro produces new thoughts and ideas provoke new emotions and you know uh, stimulate our imaginations uh, it as we all know that literature is mirror to society the cinema in uh, in fact is also uh, uh, plays playing the same part with regard to uh, with regard to our discourse it or reflects as well as alters the politics culture cultural social um, uh, educational and economic life of society and also it gives an up close and personal look at you know foreign culture this this is not foreign like uh, uh, in terms of ju just geography but like you know dalit culture is a very different culture uh, in itself it's not just a sub part of hindu culture as has been uh described at length in uh, in a book called uh, why i'm not a hindu by kanchalaya so you know it gives a peek into you know how dalit culture uh, actually is you know what is what is the authenticity of of a different culture with regard to my presentation then uh then i discuss the on screen representation of dalits you know because uh, they have been really uh, nearly uh, neglig negligated Uh, from the screen for a very long time but even if when or when they have been uh, represented uh, they have been represented through a very uh, caste prejudiced and biased uh, lens you know so here i discuss the presence or you know first of all they have been absent absent and uh, even if there has been a presence that is very 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 uh, you know tilted and biased so the 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 dalit representation in cinema that works as a metaphor for the you know this super complex institution the the different kind of films um they are identifiers of caste based, based social exclusion you know because we tend to say that you know the casteism doesn't exist anymore so how it has been you no know, existing um, uh, in the previous era like pre independence era how in the post independence era and how it functions today in the contemporary era so like what are the identifiers of caste based social social exclusion we can see in the in the three movies that i have taken that that we're going to discuss of course uh there are linkages bit linkages between social exclusion and dalits so why are dalits being you know discriminated against because you know uh, there is a long history of you know how it has been religiously uh, approved the the caste system the rudimentary normative narrative you know because the current cinema uh, and the uh, the earlier cinema are two different um, are two different sort of you know uh channels uh, all together first uh, uh, it is the current cinema is actually as an extension uh, of the previous cinema the rudimentary normative narrative we can see in the previous movies that deals with dalit issues you know like sujata or achut kanya which i'm going to read and, um, and 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 bandit queen you know and the the current movies like neeraj ghevan uh, the writer i'm taking for study and uh, you know they are marathi cinema in nagraj manjule and paranjit is a very famous director so like how does the journey happens you know from a ritual system to a dynamic aspect of current filmmaking so that we can discuss here uh then 
uh, cinematic evolution of Dalit women characters. Since I am um, emphasizing on Dalit women characters, you know how they are represented and uh, portrayed on the on the on the celluloid. So first, so for that, in order to read that, I have taken three Hindi movie, Hindi language movie, uh, uh, Hindi language movies. The first one is Achut Kanya. Uh, then there is Ankur, and the third movie is a section of the anthology Gili Pucci. Uh, so these these movies actually show that you know uh, the women character, the Dalit women characters, are socially, especially, and educationally and culturally they are like uh, they are on the margins. They are like every uh, on the margins with every respect. So they hardly have a say in in, in anything written they the, the dalit women characters have always been written with the stereotypical patterns and you know structures either the dalit woman is um, subservient subservient to her upper caste master or like you know uh, or being caricaturized caricaturized uh, portrayal so that patterns the uh, the most of the movies tend to follow which hopefully uh, is going to change uh, so uh, to a to a greater degree though it is being it is being uh, changed uh, currently also then uh, then we i study here discriminatory mechanism you know how the um, how the movies show that you know the the the, 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 the women characters suffer you know and uh, how the non dalit women characters uh, enjoy some privileges and um, how the dalit characters who are male enjoy some privileges that the dalit women characters uh, do not have an access to at all in fact the the existence of dalit cinema in itself is a is a uh, is a is a is an emblem that you know uh, that uh, they have uh, they have the assertion uh, assertion uh, point in their mechanism in their uh, in their activism and that for so long they have been retaliating to the you know discrimination uh, all the while then uh, the current dalit women you know because there has been a there has been a trajectory of coming from uh, somewhere they where has where they have been completely oppressed and uh, now when they have uh, they have a voice of their own and which of course the all the all the cinema all the all the cinema be it dalit or non dalit they uh, the the cinema reflects the socio political cultural menu you know what what the society actually is and uh, what it what it represents and that is just uh, uh, just a microcosm uh, on the screen then uh, the first movie that i've taken for study is achut kanya that was uh, that was uh, um, released in 1936 it is by it uh, it has been directed by friends austin so first of all like it is a story of um, uh, kasturi a dalit a dalit girl and um, and a quote unquote upper caste guy uh, named pratap and you know how they uh, they just can they are in love with each other but they just cannot get married because of you know social discrimination so there's a, we can see that the kind of casteism there is this is very apparent social discrimination you know uh, it is not very um, uh, not very implicit it is very very open uh, one just cannot uh, one just can you know uh, visibly sense it and, and the movie is um, is is problematic because you know 19 it was uh, uh, it got released in 1936 which was very famously a year when um, uh, when the puna pact took place you know and still the it has like it very conveniently ignores the ambedkar's vision of you know educate agitate and organize uh, though ambedkar was a very great leader and very established a leader at that time but you know the movie kind of you know in its in its ideology seems to favor gandhi's idea of uh, region you know where the dalit has to be uh, um, actually do something beyond uh, beyond normally good in order to be you know acceptable which is the case with uh, uh, you know with with kasturi the dalit girl as uh, she dies uh, as as an act of selflessness you know you know because just because uh, she was a dalit woman and she had to be um, she had to do something very 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 uh, very very noble and very very great uh, and um, uh, in order to become a savior and thus she gets um, uh, she gets to sacrifice her life so 
uh, Dalit women in this film, the Dalit in this film and the no kind of society it represents. Dalit women are the are always the victims, and the male Brahmins are always their you know saviors. They are never uh, they are never showcased uh, having their own agencies. No, and uh, since uh, this was the time when uh, the, the India was also fighting its own destiny, uh, it sort of you know somehow collapses the very uh, uh, very idea of India, the romanticized idea of India. You know, but that we were to get um, uh, get freedom in in the most truest sense because we were failing at the at the very internal um, uh, at the very internal uh, form. You know, in very internally we were not uh, all together. Then the second film I have taken for study is Ankur in 1974 by Shyam Benegal. So I have taken this very consciously because there they were other films also, but you know, just in, just to like show the trajectory that how the uh, discourse is being uh, taken into account, you know, and how the discourse is shaping itself. So after 30, uh, 1936, the, the second film that I've taken is Ankur, that is post independence era. era. So it shows the development and journey of the Dalit existence. How, um, anyway, uh, the, uh, when while the Kasturi, the character Kasturi did not have uh, so much of uh, agency, it seems to uh, give the Lakshmi, the the Dalit, the Dalit, uh, the Dalit female protagonist in this movie, some of the agency. But you know, uh, it tries to uh, disentangle the intricacies of caste, but eventually, you no know, ends up following the tropes uh because you know lakshmi uh, it is basically a story of lakshmi and uh who is a, who is a house help in in home of uh, at the home of um uh, at the home of Surya, who is an who is her quote unquote upper caste master, you know, who falls in love with her and you know you use uh, apparently love in love with her and uses her for sexual uh, sexual interests and uh, uh, and even gets her pregnant also and uh, then also uh, then he just you know. Um, denies to take uh, responsibility of the child and even suggests that lakshmi should abort the child and then lakshmi you know take takes the stand that you know uh, she will raise the child all by herself and just she very blatantly says that you no know, uh, she doesn't need uh, need him for taking care of her own child so here we see that you know lakshmi has uh, some voice of her own but like uh, this is very this is uh, very far away from you know being being an assertive character an assertive dalit woman you know even the uh, the kind of you know love narrative uh, uh, which the hindi in the film industry is obsessed with we see the uh, the the cast angle you know the the cast angle working all the time so that is uh, that is very very um, problematic uh, a comparative assertive dalit woman you know though the, uh, she lakshmi is a comparatively assertive dalit woman but again uh, she is hardly uh, hardly the ideal dalit woman or like you know if if you can say just ideal dalit woman because you know they, they, that is also a very complex uh, thing to state that uh, a Dalit woman who can, you know, speak for, uh, uh, who has been wronged and speak uh, that out and call that out. Lakshmi is definitely not that woman, uh, but definitely she is. Uh, she is in the process of recognition of, you know, herself, uh, which is, uh, which is, you know, kind of, uh, uh, kind of symbolizes the post-independence era also, and you know how the Dalit situation was, was that time and how the Indian situation was that time because India in itself was, um, uh, was also you know following its journey and you know uh, recognizing uh, itself and framing and shaping itself after the independence uh, uh, and here we see the various forms and dimensions of discrimination you know because Laks lakshmi is a house helper so she is being you know treated uh, and objectified by the by the male character surya so many times uh, in on in terms of you know her caste and her gender so we can just um, visibly see that here in this movie then in the next movie uh, that i have uh, taken for study is gili puchi which is a section like uh, a part in the anthology uh, which is a part uh, um, by Neeraj Ghevan uh, from the anthology Ajib Dastans, which is a very recent, just came uh, came out in 
2021 you know so dalit since dalit activism is all about you know how dalit consciousness is is, is there or like you know um, if the dalit character if the dalit person has dalit consciousness in him or her you know and uh, uh, with with which uh, he or she you know even operates or not or like you know they hide their identity or you know they come out as dalit so how we see you know the movie uh, the movie uh, deals with this dalit consciousness you know on how this reflects dalit consciousness since this is a movie which is very recent which is very current and contemporary and uh, by a uh, dalit director neeraj ghevan uh, a dalit director himself you know so we see the movie is a story of you know bharti uh, bharti mondal and uh, who is the dalit character and priya sharma who is a who is a brahmin who is a brahmin character you know so how the two you know the the two characters interact with each other you know uh, dalits uh, the, the both of them are the you know praise of caste structure uh, in a very different way uh, for both of them how bharti model uh, she as a dalit transgresses the societal structures you know uh, and uh, we we just see the transformation in the uh, narrative viewpoint also how we see for the first time you know that dalits are uh, the bharti as a dalit uh, becomes assertive you know and um, uh, she has got her agency which is uh, which is a thing uh, missing in the previous movies beat uh, beat achut kanya or like you know ankur which were by which were by sham uh, uh, which were by friends austin and uh, friends austin and sham benegal respectively um then it, the movie breaks the narrative of victimization since dalits are always seen from the from the lens of you know uh, being suppressed and oppressed and it the, the the thing that you know what they do how how they retaliate and you know what what is their strategy and uh, uh, and the mechanism is never discussed so the 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 movie the uh, the story gili puchi sort of you know looks into that how they break the how the uh, story breaks the narrative of victimization then it's you know an authentic it represents and uh, an authentic account of uh, dalit women's aspirations resolutions struggles and you know uh, them reclaiming agencies because uh, the the character bharti mandal is a, is a very firm and you know um independent characters you know and uh, she she is at times frustrated she is at times very very um very aware you know of how the caste system and uh, and the the her sexuality is working for uh, for her in the society since she is shown as you know um as a, as a queer dalit woman in the uh, in the story so the film is a powerful uh, powerful representation of dalit consciousness and um, uh, the existence of film you know the the, the kind of uh, the kind of story that is the existence of the kind of story itself is a very um is a very clear representation here that you know the, the the different kind of stories are being you know seen and being heard so that's a that's a very powerful thing in its in itself then uh, it shows the dalit identity which is simultaneously weakened and revived by the economic forces of today you know because the current um, the current uh, uh, the current film industry and the current like you know on screen presence is being uh, is being currently uh, altered and uh, uh, due to the uh, uh, partly due to the uh, introduction of ott platforms also so like you know how the uh, how the new uh new forces are reviving you know first weekend because you know they are being um they are being operated by the same uh by the same you know dominant and privileged people but you know by the very uh, interest of economic forces you know because what is in demand and market goes by that so the the dalit identity is being revived by the same economic forces then uh, in order to conclude my paper i study the essence of on screen uh, dalit existence um, so uh, caste identities and network persist though differently in the three movies which i have seen uh, we have seen that you know caste uh, casteism and you know caste system and caste identities how they play all uh, how they play in society all the time but you know they play differently in uh, in different different era in uh, achut kanya it is very different in uh, ankur it plays differently and in gili puchi it is uh, it is very different but uh, it does um, uh, it does uh, uh, make its, its presence at work all the time
then it also shows the functioning of the site you know but that how exactly as a society uh, we function you know as an indian society how democratic uh, we are on the scale of um, you know on the scale of justice uh, or uh, like how exactly um, we are uh, edu like you know as um, dr ambedkar has said educate organize and uh, agitate so how are we uh, uh to what extent are we going by that motto then uh we can see that you know uh, this is hardly there is hardly any uh, dalit female content creators uh in the in the you know in this industry so uh, and we can just feel this dearth in the in the um in the online uh, in the online on screen presence um uh, of these movies you know that they are uh, the the representation is is somewhat missing you know had had some female dalit content creators made these movies uh it they they would have been very different but unfortunately this is the case for now uh but hopefully we'll have more and more female uh inclusion in the content creation industry though it challenges the cinematic discourse because you know uh, the cinema cinematic discourse hardly talks about uh, the 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 dalit issue you know or the caste discourse they just um, they just you know uh, uh, dodge that uh, dodge that issue as if it doesn't like even uh, matter at all a very famous example i can give is like you know uh, there was a movie called sairad by nagraj manjule and um, it was remade in bollywood with the name um, uh, it was adapted into bollywood as an hindi movie with the name dhadak and uh, how conveniently the dhadak was uh, the dhadak dodged the question of caste and it was movie only about the you know the upper the upper class girl the rich girl and poor boy and which was the like you know soul of the movie like the cast the cast issue was the main uh, theme of the of the movie sarat so how uh, how the cinematic discourse is being challenged through the dalit discourse the dalit discourse is actually you know pushing the boundaries of cinema and making the cinema more inclusive and um, and more you know engaging and interesting though uh, though dalit cinema is going to change it's going to face the trials and tribulations and not just dalit cinema but the cinema in itself is a very beautiful medium and you know it it's all it's all uh, accessible to 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 the uh, to the to the masses and uh and that's why it, it you know it is very uh, vulnerable and will face trials and tribulation but still the same qualities make it you know uh, full of possibilities and optimism and um, uh and uh, the the chosen film uh, all the three films they just you know uh skillfully dissect how the caste system um uh, how the caste system and the female subjugation interplays in society all the time by celebrating the storytelling uh storytelling which is you know the the power of lies to reveal the truth and uh, here i end my presentation thank you thank you chandra prabha it is truly a stimulating presentation i sincerely appreciate for your efforts with the ideas on rudimentary normative narration social discrimination dalit women as victims well presented thank you for the presentation Moving on to the third presenter. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Third presenter is Deepika, assistant professor yes, in English Government uh, Degree College, uh, Dharampuri, from Himachal Pradesh. Her paper is titled yes, "Narratives from the Margins." Yes, Deepika. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the introduction, ma'am. Uh, I am Deepika. Uh, my research paper is based on the experimental forms of autobiography employed in the life narratives from the margin uh, in which i have included changya rook against the night by balbir madhapuri the outcast akamashi by sharan kumar limbale third one is mother forest the unfinished story of ck janu and uh, last one is Mir viramma life of an untouchable by viramma josan and jean look resi the uh, my presentation is actually based on my, this is a write up uh, and i have cut short the same just because lack of time uh, i will focus on the formal and stylistic innovations in marginal life narratives sorry to interrupt yes, do you have the presentation with you 
no 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 ma'am i have a write up i have okay, a write up ma'am go ahead with your write up yes yes uh i have to do um, i have to focus on the formal and stylistic innovations in these selected marginal life narratives which are uh, which signify a promising departure from traditional literary representations of others and provides a critique of existing canonical narratives in the indian context therefore it draws the attention towards the lively reevaluation reintrospection and redefinition of autobiography as genre in 21st century so my focus is on autobiography as genre which has been employed uh, as a tool as a platform by these by the life narratives from the margins so to start with the very fam uh, famous notion of autobiographical fact formulated by philip lejeune which has defined classical autobiography as retrospective chronological narration of a coherent subject at the end of life where its coherence marked by the very variable self identical relationship of author narrator and protagonist the traditional form of portraying i in autobiography is based on the chronological story of a mature self aware person's life from birth or early childhood to becoming a successful personality through array of unique accomplishments and perspectives in life but Smith brings to light the limited discourse of this traditional way of writing autobiographies, which is unable to define life from the margin. Lives from the margin. She asserts that, to quote, the splitting of eyes into narrator, narrati, and the ideological eye guarantees the obfuscation of distinctions between factual and fictional lives. So that therefore, textualization of the signature ultimately erases life outside the text. Since there remains no self, no authority, no truth outside discourse, traditional autobiography loses any special status. Contesting these traditionally imagined genetic expectations of writing an autobiography, present paper is an attempt to locate politically, socially, culturally marginalized narratives of people from the margin. It highlights the significance of autobiography as yana, which provides a space the locale to voice the unvoiced, unheard forms of self-life narratives writing within Indian context. Uh, life narratives like Changya Rook, the uh, Changya Rook Akamashi, uh, Mother Forest, and Viramma, Life of an Untouchable, actually portrays and question the canonical status of the autobiographer as metaphysical, Cartesian. rational entity who is from elite class of mainstream culture it also questions the definition given by roy pascal of autobiographer according to him he believes the best autobiographies are written by uh, men and women of outstanding achievement in life similarly gustav also he affirms that the tradition of autobiography appeared relatively late in the field of literature and even then it was peculiar to western men such claims of auto auto authoritative unitary atomic core which has well defined boundaries of inner and outer self and the authoritative elite status of classical autobiographer are the focal point of the present paper because mitman also emphasizes the re lively reevaluation of the yonner the classical norms as per autobiographical pact of autobiography actually no more existing they even mitman she declares that they have been replaced by fragmentary exploration of interstices edges incoherences and overarching concern with critical processes of yonric revision recognizing the paradigm shift in the understanding of autobiography as yonra in 21st century the selected life narratives are replete with social and cultural uh, flavor peculiar to india all are translated versions of their life narratives like changya rook first punjabi dalit autobiography viramma from aperia uh, tamil autobiography akamashi from marathi language and mother forest from malayalam a few examples of regional texts which highlight the problem of caste class culture tribal and ethnicity in the indian context it highlights autobiography as yana being a widely divergent subject in its focus forms and thus reveals shifting limits segments in its boundaries smith to quote here draws attention to various phenomena marking subjectivity is related to the relation of centers and margins she cautions against mining the conventional style of portraying self in autobiographical writing a totalizing practice to romanticize marginality she emphasizes that to quote um, to quote my margin of visibility is not necessarily your margin even if we are both women or black or lesbian each of us in our manifold positions in discursive fields inhabits margins and centers simultaneously 
these competing marginalities and centrings even change position on us as we move through different experiences a marginality in one locale becomes a centering in another let us then not insist on stable centers and stable margins but recognize constant instabilities constant rumbling at the edges boundaries borders horizons to multiply metaphors the life narrative of balbil madhupuri changya ruk against the night guided by the principles of dalit literature sets one of the finest examples to highlight the dalit pride in collectivity it is marga's first punjabi dalit autobiography in punjabi literature it is a lively chronicle of a sensitive boy planting a mango sampling in his mud hut in order to have a tree in his courtyard so the sparrows doves and ferrets may come to perch and bigger on the branches to quote here he got a rough jolt by his father bhaiya snatched the hoe from my hand and said mama you are trying to ape the jats jats here are the upper caste people for dalit writers like madhupuri it is their social responsibility to express their consciousness and commitment of an activity act, activist therefore dalit writers do not follow the guidelines of the dominant grammar as well as aesthetics of mainstream writing according to kaushalya to quote that is language goes against the established codes of standard language pure classical divine and cultures the academic languages the so called decency is the most suffocating term for the dalits and it does stifle the dalit voice they should deliberately overstep what they are permitted to write by the rules of the dominant grammar originally written in doabi punjabi dialect the form of changya ruk as a life narrative portrays a saga testimony of a punjabi dalit man with the overview of the local colors of punjabi life he prefers to use the typical unusual rural words rustic words that represent the culture and traditions of his doabi regional dialect in uh, in a way this typical rural punjabi dialect makes the narration fresh enriched with cultural aroma of punjabi flavor in indian context the use of although the use of ordinary language in literature is opposed to the aesthetic rules of the mainstream literature because the mainstream literature's artistic norms are elite in nature and controlled by elites the local regional form of autobiography autobiography adds new dimensions to regional literature of india by making the lowest of low vocal in it similarly the second autobiography akama shi the outcast by uh, sharan kumar limbale also symbolizes the most significant part of limbale's life that is search for identity in his own motherland maharwada limbale felt humiliated embarrassed and rejected as he was considered bastard they call me akama shi to court do limbale ought to be an upper caste identity but his father hanmanta does not acknowledge him emotionally socially and economically this highlights how caste system propagates marginalization and deprivation led to a state of impossibility and how a section of the society feels alienated socially economically culturally and emotionally since present study explores the forms of autobiography as yana limbale's life narrative highlights the significance of autobiographical forms to locate the lives from the margin the events incidents and experience of limbale's life of 27 years portrayed as an expression of his mother's agony and an autobiography of a community this autobiography has been written at the age of only 27 an unconventional endeavor which challenges the traditional canonical norms of writing an autobiography because according to roy pascal autobiographies written by a young man to quote are not very satisfactory similarly philip dodd in his essay also uh, endorses the idea that the writers who choose this mode of writing should be of middle age could it mean that the form of autobiography is most apt at ripe age of its writer or to be of a particular age but there is no other literary form from which has criteria of an age limit for its writer to achieve recognition or even to indulge in creativity this implies that only an aging person is eligible to retrace the life moments which one has relived to the autobiography as a literary yarn but western canonical conventional style of an individualistic and assertive personality seems out of place in indian context especially in life narratives from the margins like akamashi in indian context the term dalit literature includes only the writings of the untouchables and does not include the writings of non dalits about the dalit issue the main focus of dalit literature is to highlight the process of identity claims of those who were kept outside the fourfold of hindu social order but ironically in this whole process dalit women and issues related to their identity which is oppressed in the name of caste class and gender are pushed to the margins therefore it is very important to locate dalit women writings in indian context the life narratives from the margins especially of women aiming at establishing their identity 
by questioning the assumptions of the dominant caste groups as well as to disclose patriarchy rampant in Dalit communities. Dalit women face marginalization in society, but even in literature, they are pushed to the periphery. This is how Viramma's life narrative, Viramma, life of an untouchable, and C.K. Janu's life narrative, Mother Forest, the unfinished story, become exceptional voices, a proclamation to protest, to resist, and to condemn marginalization in the name of sex, caste, and economic dependence. Their life narratives become political, legal, and socio-cultural critique, where women attain meaningful proportions in phallocentric society. These life narratives question not only the hegemonic, heterosexual, patriarchal, normative regimes, but also put forth an alternative form, a confident sense of the self with their unique identity, worldview, and perspective into existence. Vrama narrates the story of her life over a period of 10 years to, uh, to Josiane Resign. This text is a result of an oral conversation or over conversation, thus a new form of life narration, that is oral life narrative. Virama's life narrative is more than an autobiography, a living testimony of the painful journey presented with exclusive uniqueness. As a collective experience, this narrative shares the situation and struggle for identity of Dalit women, their alienated social status, their gendered victimization, inability to express their raw narrative. Issues like education for Dalit women taking side of her uh, daughter to get married to a boy of her choice, young girls of her community who have started taking care of themselves to look beautiful, every single aspect of women emancipation is a welcoming sign for Viramma. The primary objective of including this text in this, in this present paper is to understand the very act of ghost writing. Oral narration stands in direct opposition to canonical conventional texts in many aspects like purpose, focus, motivation, ideology, aesthetics, and their experiences. Depiction of Brahma's tone, slang, language, and abuses with pictorial description of social taboos through sexually charged words mocks patriarchal expectations of femininity. Thus, language plays a powerful medium with all the ingredients to make any voice unique in flavor. Its narration, language, and experimental form are altogether different from academic versions of conventional autobiographies. This adds to the exclusiveness of the genre of autobiography. Similarly, discovering new ways of self-portrayal and exploring marginal location, Mother Forest, the unfin unfinished story of C.K. Janu, involves in the thinking about the world of tribals, the others in Indian context. Mother Forest is based on Adya tribal community in Kerala. Adya tribes culture, customs, rituals, tradition, and taboos made their identities different from the mainstream society. In the name of development, government exploited the limit, limitless resources of their mother forest. Janu has narrated the commodification of their lives, their mother forest. Since present study is focused on the form of autobiography, it is significant to explore methodology employed in the present text, which is orally narrated. Oral narr narratives of the people from the margins like Janu, women are important to be given space in literature. To reject entirely the discourse of oral life narratives propagates marginalization of subaltern, illiterate strata of society who are politically and culturally excluded from the mainstream society. Mother Forest, as an oral narrative, offers a way to open up to critical scrutiny the process of transformation of the narrated life to inscribe text. According to Janu, they never reject or disclaim their identity, but bravely, loudly proclaim it. It is the difference from the mainstream society is the root of their identity and self, and they celebrate it. To quote, celebrating the self, articulation, narration becomes the only tool to survive. That is why the autobiographical attempts of the subaltern women become survival literature. They fight against all odds to celebrate their self. This celebration is, however, part of their strategy to survival. Survival not only of themselves, but also of their communities. The communal self is narrativized and rejuvenated rather than the individual self. This text creates a new definition, new form of colonization, that is internal colonialism, is the name of the development in the name of the development. There is a significant role of collaborative text as intermedial exchanges to highlight the gap between politically, socially, and culturally marginalized subjects with mainstream narrative forms of autobiography. Thus, this text is unique in its form. The way its translators represented Adivasi people from the margins and the combination of both form and content to create a contemporary, politically important picture of Adivasi. In the end, to conclude this paper, I would quote uh, George Mish, 
uh, as he notes about the uniqueness of autobiography as a literary form for him autobiography is unlike any other form of literary composition its boundaries are more fluid and less definable in relation to form therefore life narratives from the margins like changiya rok against the night the outcast akamashi mother forest the unfinished story of ck janu and virama life of an untouchable challenge the homogenizing genetic expectations regarding the form and content of autobiography mere adherence to conventional western practices like autobiographical pact in elite man style is inadequate and the challenge in these live narratives emphasis have been given uh, emphasis have been shifted to evolving subjectivities new strategies new forms of conventional confessional genre are being employed by live narrative narrators from the margins as per traditional norms they are not full fledged autobiographies but their experimental strategies claim a different platform a potentially diverse horizon by being non linear ruptured fragmented oral collaborated mediated and collectively disappropriated narratives of the self life narratives from the margins represent a promising departure from traditional literary representations representations of marginalized people it locates these marginalized people to express and translate the community struggles at the grassroots level with their distinct voices a heterogeneous practice to portray self in 21st century thank you very much thank you over to you ma'am yes thank you deepika please with your valuable contribution on life narratives from the margins you are well portrayed on uh, marginalized narratives traditional classical autobiographies thank you for that and moving to the next uh, presenter m sahana thank you ma'am yes thank you M Sahana, Assistant Professor from Jain Engineering College, uh, MNM Jain Engineering College, Chennai. Her uh, title is "The Voice of Voiceless Through the Ages." Do we have Sahana here? The organizers uh, kindly check and let me know whether Sahana is available. Dear presenter, Sahana. Ma'am, you can start with the next presenter, ma'am. Move yes. to the next presenter. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes, the final presenter for the day is uh, Thardraj Boy, a uh, senior assistant professor, Department of History, Faculty of Social Science, University of Jammu. Uh, he, his uh, paper is titled on reconstructing the origin and identity of Gujarat tribe in Jammu and Kashmir, past and present discourse. Please, sir, over to you. Huh? Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, sir. You are audible. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, respected uh, chairperson, ma'am, all my friends and coordinator. So my topic is somehow different from the the literature background. So since I am from, I am teaching, I am teaching uh, history. So uh, I I will be talking on uh, the uh, that origin of a. Uh, most uh, what we can say the subaltern group of jammu and kashmir and uh, that is uh, they are called as the the gujjar tribe so in this in this uh, in this uh, study this is a part of my project uh, sponsored by icss and new delhi so if you see in, uh, in present day there is a debate going on uh, between the uh, intellectual that uh, about the origin of uh, aryan uh, aryan so like that we have in the jammu and kashmir the debate the recent debate is going on about the origin of gujjar tribe so who are the gujjar uh, gujjar people and who are the, uh, they are uh, belong to the subaltern group then you see the historiography if you see the historiography there are large number of uh, even in the ancient literature and medieval and modern literature and colonial and post colonial literature there is a reference about the origin of uh, this uh, the tribal group but uh, we do not have the uh, literature connected with the direct uh, direct sources or direct uh, nomenclature about the gujjar but uh, if you see the ancient literature there are most important literature in the ancient period we have the rastarangini that rastarangini also talked about the origin of gujjar tribe not particularly the gujjar tribe there are a group of tribal uh, tribal people those uh, the origin is from the ancient period 
or modern day the Gujar or uh, those who the Gujar people, those who are staying in this Jammu and Kashmir, they are the they are the successor of that ancient tribal group. Then, uh, then uh, if you see, then the medieval period, there are many uh, like the Abu Fazal we have in the Mughal period uh, in that uh, Akbar Nama. There is a reference about the uh, the nomenclature Gujar. So then, if you come to the colonial period, there are many British officers, those who have visited Jammu and Kashmir, and they have given their uh, uh, reference and their their narratives towards the origin of this Gujar tribe. But uh, anyhow, uh, the, uh, for this study, what is my methodology? I have followed in this study. The my my most important methodology is the ethnography or the participant uh, the part participant observation and the field work study. Apart from this, I have analyzed some uh, literature, the medieval, modern, and the colonial and post-colonial literature. So if you see the, according to there is a author called Kennedy, the Kennedy talked about the Gujar people, those who are staying in, in nowadays in the Jammu and Kashmir, they are the sun worshiper. And the origin of the sun worshiper, if you see in the early medieval or medieval period, that people are belong to uh, somewhere in the Russia. So, according to Kennedy, he said that these uh, Gujar people, they migrated from the ancient diaspora. We have the, there is a study by the Kennedy, the ancient diaspora. So, the, uh, that uh, sun worshipper people, they migrated from Russia and they enter into the Indian subcontinent in the, somewhere in the uh, early medieval period. There is another uh, theories on this about in the, in the Turkey, in the modern day Turk, and in Turk, there is a branch of uh, ancient tribal group called the Scythians. So the, the modern day people, they are the successor of the Scythian group because the Scythian people, they enter into Jammu and Kashmir via uh, the ancient, uh, we have the Gandharas or the, uh, the capital was Taksila. So enter uh, through this. So in that case, then and after uh, entering into the uh, Kashmir, they went towards the Gujarat and they uh, and they they established their Gujaristan. So this type of uh, narration we have in this uh, in this uh, in the text. Then then we have another most important British officer in that period, Grierson. Grierson uh, he talked about the Gujar people, the tribal people. They migrated from Swat Valley. The Swat Valley is nowadays in the uh, somewhere in the that modern day Baluchistan and Afghanistan region. They migrated from there and they settled in the Himalayan region. The Himalayan region, somewhere you have the Punjab, Himachal Pradesh and Jammu and Kashmir. And they talked about uh, or they speak about or they spoke the uh, one most important language that is called the Gujri language. But in modern period, the Gujri language was identified as a Rajasthani language. Then we have another most important, uh, what we can see the theories about this. If you see in the 7th and 8th century AD, if you come to the ancient period, there is a most important, uh, that uh, what we can say the Kavya called uh, Harsha Charita, Harsha Charita of uh, that Banabhatta. In that Harsha Charita, there is a reference of a group of people uh, settled in Himachal Pradesh, Punjab and Jammu and Kashmir area where Harsabardhana attack this area. And that people, if you see the, the cultural, uh, the culture of that people are uh, mostly the tribal in nature. And that people consider as the Gujar tribe in modern day. And, uh, and uh, in the name of Gujar, we have the another most important uh, city called Gujarnwala, Gujaralala in the Pakistan modern day. And the Gujarnwala was located in the bank of the river Jhelum. And Jhelum river is uh, the flow from the Jammu and Kashmir towards the uh, Pakistan region nowadays. Then apart from this, we have the one most important, the colonial uh, writer, or we can say the colonial or the British officer that is called the Walter R. Lawrence. The Walter R. Lawrence, he talked about the origin of uh, the Kashmiri language or the uh, origin of the Kashmiri uh, dialect by the Gujar tribe or the, the nomadic Gujar tribe. 
so that was another then uh, then if you see apart from this uh, there is alternative sources like the archaeological sources if you see the archaeological sources in uh, 7th century ad in rajasthan there was a uh, there was a spell of dryness in rajasthan so due to the spell of dryness the people of rajasthan they migrated towards himachal pradesh punjab and jammu and kashmir and they settled in this area and they themselves identified that they are the gujjar people because they belong to or they are from the rajasthan and gujarat area they themselves consider as a gujjar and they settled in the uh, hilly area of this area or this hilly area mostly the shivalik range so this type of uh, that uh, uh, narr narratives we have then if you come to the medieval period in medieval period there is a literature or there is a text called vakiyat e jahangir during the pe period of jahangir so if you see the jahangir in the jahangir when attack jammu uh, he uh, invaded jammu and kashmir he built large number of fort in the uh, build large number of fort and uh, jahangir ordered the tribal people to reside at in that fort and the fort are even if you today if you go to the uh, the the park occupied kashmir area or what we can say the jammu and kashmir the rajouri and punch district we have large number of uh, number of archaeological uh, that what we can say the buildings uh, established by jahangir so uh, these people those who resided in uh, in that uh, fort they are called as the uh, gujjar gujjar people then ag again if you see the in, in concern to the uh, origin there are many are uh, that arab geographer they talked about the language that uh, language and the geographical area where this uh, gujjar people are settled there is a uh, area called jurj g j u r j jurj so that jurj is identified when they uh, that uh, jurj is uh, enter the world enter into the indian subcontinent that uh, jurj is called gurj g u r g so this type of uh, narratives we have then if you see another most important uh, theories by g h ojha g h ojha was a linguistic and uh, he was also a uh, historian he talked about uh, that uh, that um, the gujjar people they are the mostly the original people of jodhpur area of rajasthan and they migrated towards uh, jammu and kashmir and they settled in this jammu and kashmir so then uh, then mostly then uh, i'm talking about the present condition if you see the present condition or the cultural uh, affiliation of this gujjar people with the other part of the uh, world there is a similar kind of cultural affiliation we have with the afghanistan we have in the turk region we have in the pakistan if you see the cultural uh, habit or cultural practices uh, by the people of uh, this jammu and kashmir they have similar kind of cultural practices followed in afghanistan pakistan and the the baluchistan it means there is a interlinked or there is a connection uh, between the or among the people of this tribal group the gujjar tribes with the other part of the uh, the, uh, the punjab and uh, the, the pakistan and that people also they call themselves as the gujjar gujjar type so we can uh, we can uh, assume that the uh, the modern days these people uh, the gujjar people Uh, uh they are their successor are from the uh, the pakistan or from the the afghanistan and baluchistan area then then come to the uh, in concern to the languages the languages the uh, the spoke the gujri language there is a many similarity with the language spoke by the uh, today they spoke by the the turk people or the some uh, the baluchistani people so we have the similar kind of language and and that same language also there is a similarity with the rajasthani language and and gujarati language so we can uh, one can assume that there is a interlinked or connection between the uh, this people at least in the linguistic point of view so then uh, uh, another most important uh, the historian that abul fazl in the uh, in medieval period he talked about the uh, the there is a capital or there is a trade center in uh, somewhere nowadays in the in the jammu region that that is called the sialkot now in pakistan in sialkot there is a uh, the town was totally dominated by the gujjar people 
because Gujar people, they are physically very strong and they carried out the trade and commerce uh, with the other part of the world. So these type of theories we have since, and if you see the, uh, and there is another theories on this about the, uh, the this Gujar people or the, the tribal group connection with the Greek, the ancient Greek people or the medieval period, there is a migration or the many diasporic people, those who settle in this uh, Jammu and Kashmir area. So if you see the in the during the in the in ancient period, there is a the Greek the, the Greek invasion took place towards the Jammu and Kashmir. So we have the Alexander the Great and uh, all these people. So after the living uh, after the Diet of Alexander, there are many Greek people they settle in this area, Jammu Kashmir in this area, even in the Punjab and POK Park occupied uh, Kashmir. So those who settle in this area. So they, they themselves consider as a, a, you know, the, the word the Yavanas, okay. And the, that Yavanas, in the latter period, the Yavanas are, uh, the nomenclature of Yavanas, they, they themselves consider as the, uh, the tribal group. And uh, in the medieval and modern period, they consider the, they are the successor of Yavanas or the Greek people, and they are the Gujar, Gujar people. And if you see the uh, physical or uh, biological uh, uh, relation, uh, affiliation, if you see the, uh, the, the Gujar people, those who are uh, settled in this area, and nowadays the Greek people, if you see the color affiliation, if you see the uh, physical affiliation, like the height and all these people, there are similar kind. And that is a, uh, and there was a study also uh, carried out by Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, that uh, about the DNA, similarity of DNA, there are many similarity. We have the, the Gujar uh, tribal group with the Greek people. So uh, this type of or, uh, the theory of origin we have. But what is the uh, present condition? If you see the, uh, the study of subalternity or the subaltern study, in Indian historiography, there is a, a no, I mean, there are many, not many, there are not more than two, five people, they talked about the Gujar type of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. It was totally neglected by the, uh, the historian, even the, all the intellectual. So in conclusion, I can say that to understand the origin and the culture of Gujar people, we must depend on or we must, we must follow the uh, other alternative sources, like the linguistic sources and like the other archaeological sources. And even we have the uh, other type of the, like the sources, like the epic tradition, the epic uh, literature, like Mahabharata and Ramayana. Even in there, there is a reference of different type of tribal groups. And these people are the successor of that uh, tribal group mentioned in the epic tradition in Mahabharata and Ramayana. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You have clearly researched the existence of Gujar tribe, uh, the medieval, modern, and the post in the post-colonial literature. We are pleased to know about the culture of the Gujar people, the tradition and their culture. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Now to the organizers, the insights I've gained from the conference is far exceed, very systematic, well-organized, inspirational, and thought-provoking. The presenters' ideas are really invigorating the subaltern studies. The young researchers have to be appreciated for bringing the subaltern studies to the next level. Thank you for the opportunity. I thank uh, the Cap Cameron Trust and Dr. Mahalakshmi ma'am for the opportunity render. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us and uh, patient listening for so long time. My thank pleasure. you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Next to dear presenters, we'll move on to the next to the technical session time and. Uh, I think uh, our uh, chairperson for the technical session time, uh, you, Dr. Uvenia Mam is waiting in the um, meet room. I welcome Dr. V Uvenia Mam. Thank you, ma'am. Ma welcome you, you ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. And I thank the organizers for having invited me to be the chairperson for this wonderful international conference. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so yes, much. And I much. request Indo to. Uh, Give a small intro about our chairperson. Yes, ma'am. I deem it a great privilege to introduce the chairperson for the session, Dr. G. Uvenia, Associate Professor, Head. 
Arts and Science College, Coimbatore. She is a chairperson for Board of Studies, convener for national and international level seminars, workshop. She is also a member of DC Committee for PhD candidates. Currently, she is guiding three research scholars. She is a life member of Indian Society for Technical Education. She published paper in Scopus, UGC Careless journals. She cleared Swayam course. She served as a research pers person for various department associations. And she has been a chief guest for various colleges and addressed the students. She attended many FDP programs. Ma'am, now you can take over the session, please. Thank you for the brief introduction. So, uh, I welcome uh, Ms. Babita B. Assistant Professor of English Sri Narayanan College, Natika, on uh, presenting a paper on the voice of marginalized and analysis on S. Joseph's poetry. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, ma'am. Please continue your presentation. Uh, yes. Who, uh, you can see the screen. Yes, ma. Your screen is possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Babita, and the title of my topic is "The Voice of the Marginalized: An Analysis of S. Joseph's Poetry." Uh, first of all, uh, I will talk about the origin and the historical background of the Malayalam Dalit poetry. Uh, then the rise of the Malayalam Dalit poetry in Kerala in the late 19th century and its subsequent entry into the canon in the 20th first century is also discussed. Uh, then uh, I'll discuss about the poems of S. Joseph. Uh, in Kerala, uh, we, unlike the Chadurvarna system in Kerala, we had a different mode of caste hierarchy operated in the exertion of power over the lower caste or the untouchables. Uh, Brahmins, the priestly class, they were the uh, feudal lords also. They held a higher position in the pre three princely states, Travancore, Cochin and Malabar or, of Kerala. Uh, it was uh, ruled by, which was ruled by the royal kingdoms. Uh, they, Brahmins, they controlled, they were the feudal landlords and they controlled all the other castes in Kerala. Uh, Nayars or the warrior class uh, who were allied to the Nambudri Brahmins come next under the hierarchy. Brahmins were here called as Nambudris. And uh, there is a kind of matrilineal system of Nayars along with the Sambandham uh, which helped the Nair community to gain land ownership. Uh, Sambandham is a kind of system uh, here uh, in Kerala. Uh, these uh, Nair women, they were able to choose their husbands from the uh, Nambudri Brahmins. Uh, actually, it was a kind of a custom in which the uh, younger ones of the uh, Brahmin family, they were not allowed to marry Brahmin women. In, sp in spite of that, uh, they can take a Nair woman, not as a wife, uh, but uh, they can have a conjugal relationship with the Nair woman. And the, uh, through that, these Nayas, they accumulated a lot of land ownership. These upper caste uh, Nayas, as well as the Nambudiris, they enjoyed world, wealth and the luxuries of the uh, land, and they exploited the other lower caste. Then comes the Iravas and Na Na Nadas. They were considered as the polluted, untouchable cla class. And then comes uh, the Dalits. Uh, the, here, the, the Dalit communities include Parayas, Kulayas, Kuravas, and Adivasis, etc. Uh, they all belong to the lowest of the caste hi hi hierarchy. And they were treated as the wretched, mar marginalized community. And in Kerala, uh, earlier, uh, there exists an untouchability and these high, uh, lower castes, they were not allowed to uh, come under the, come near the higher caste. And these Iravas, uh, these Iravas, they were also the untouchables. They have to keep a distance of uh, 36 uh, feet away from the Nambudis and 12 feet away from the Nayas. Uh, these Parayas, uh, Pulayas, Kuravas, they were the Dalits. Uh, they had to keep a distance of 96 feet away from the Nambudiris and Nayas and 36 feet away from the Iravas. 
uh, see both these uh, Dalits as well as the Irawas were considered as untouchables. Uh, then these Dalits, they were treated inhumanly by all the other upper castes and they were forced to work in the fields of the uh, Tamburans or feudal landlords. Feudal landlords or the Brahmins, they were called as Tamburans uh, by these Dalits. And these Dalits, they were not allowed to drink from the public wells. They were not even allowed to walk on the public roads. And the extreme from brutal form of exploitation was the existence of slave trade. And it was allegedly omitted from the historiography of Kerala. Uh, these slaves were exchanged and sold in Kerala. Sometimes families were separated in such exchanges. Husbands and wives were sold to different landlords, leaving the kids as orphans. Uh, we can see the evidences for this tra slave trade in the works of, in the travel records of Francis Buchanan uh, in, 90, sorry, in 1800 AD. And uh, the records of slave trade can be uh, can be seen in the uh, so Dalit songs from Travancore also, but uh, it was uh, allegedly omitted from the uh, history of Kerala. Uh, only recently, the studies of uh, Sanan Mohan and Vinil Pol uh, unearthed uh, these existen the existence of slave trade in Kerala. And in 1843, uh, British East India Company abolished slavery. Uh, and in Travancore, uh, in 1855, slavery was abolished. But even after the abolition of slavery, uh, still the exploitation of the Dalits continued. And it was in the early 19th century, under the leadership of Sri Narayana Guru. Uh, Sri Narayana Guru is from the Irava community. And his followers, uh, the Renaissance, the changes happened in Kerala. And these Dalits, they started to question against the inequalities uh, persisted against them for over ages. Uh, Ayyengali and Puigay Lapachan, they were Dalit leaders. Uh, they uh, took uh, this uh, initiative uh, from the uh, movements of Sri Narayana Guru and sta they started movement, Dalit movements like uh, Sadhu Jana, Paripalana, Sangam, then uh, Pratiksha Rek uh, Reksha, Deva Sabha and all. For the uh, There were uh, other movements like CDN for the improvement for the Dalit community. And Malayalam, coming to the Dalit writing, Malayalam Dalit writing is a literary reaction against the social injustice and inequality faced by Dalits in Kerala. Uh, at first, this uh, liter uh, it uh, appeared, uh, Dalit writings appeared in the novels in the end of the 19th century. And these novels, they discuss the issues of caste and caste discrimination. Uh, some of the major novels are Mrs. Collins' Kadal Vadam, uh, translated uh, as The Slayer's Plain and published in 1877. Then Potedi Kunyambu Saraswati Vijayam, Joseph Muneel's Sugumari. These were all the uh, famous novels which discussed about the issues of casteism. Then uh, it was later in the uh, only in the early in the 20th century, Dalit issues began to appear in Malayalam uh, poetry. Uh, Pandit Karupan's Excuse, Jami, me, Babi, you, excuse me, your slides are not changed. Not changed? Yes, you are in first slide. Now is it not changed? Okay, let me see. Um, yeah. Is it changing right now? Yes, yes, yes okay ah yes uh, so pandit karupans jadi kumi then kumar nashan kumar nashan is a follower of sri narayana guru and his chandala bukshugi and duravasta uh, it appeared in 1922 it dis discussed about the issues of casteism in kerala then later came Changambura uh, Krishna Bilas Varakula, then Edasheri Govinda Nair's Pani Mudakam. Uh, all these poems, it also discussed about the issues of caste in uh, Kerala. Uh, but uh, all these writings were the uh, uh, writings, all these novels and poems are written by the non-Dalits about the issues of casteism in Kerala. 
uh, and uh, in uh, a, in a work called dalit sahityathin oru mugavara k k babu raj he recorded that dalit writing literature is that which is written by the uh, dalits as sharan kumar limbale also said Uh, this origin of uh, in Kerala, the origin of Dalit poetry can be traced back to the folk oral songs and the labor songs of Kerala uh, of the Dalits. Even though uh, as a literature it didn't appear, we can trace the origin from the old folk songs from uh, Dalits. Uh, Dalit poets uh, they introduced a, a native and subjective style and diction, unlike the Sanskritized Malayalam poems written by the elite. the first generation of dalit poets are poigai lapachen uh, the and govindan ashan kavyur murali uh, they were all revolutionary about the injustice and inequalities happened to them uh, then came uh, the generation of poets uh, shivadas purameri g shashi maduraveli raghavan ekoli etc then contemporary malayalam dalit poetry uh, was initiated by s joseph and later carried on by m r renu kumar and m b manoj now there are a lot of dalit poets like uh, binu m pallipada vijila s kalesh but all these poets like uh, uh, the s joseph in uh, m r renu kumar vijila they were able to uh, they uh, they entered into the uh, canon now now they are not uh known as just dalit writers but they are uh, renowned as malayalam poets so they were able to uh, enter into the canon of malayalam poetry and coming to uh, the poems of s joseph s joseph this is s joseph he was born on uh, 1985 and k sachidanand then uh, uh, the, the, now the president of sahitya academy uh, and the kerala sahitya academy and a great renowned poet k sachidanand then he uh, called him as the he pioneer of contemporary dalit poetry in uh, malayalam then uh, s joseph he was born on a 1985 at a rural village in kottayam district named pattithanam in kerala and he was uh, from a uh, dalit convert, christian converted family and his father was a stone mason and mother was an illiterate lady uh, who he filled him with the memories of, and folk songs and now he is a retired associate professor from a government college in kerala uh, known as the maharaja's college and he received the kerala sahitya academy award in uh, 2012 and uh, prestigious odakural award in 2015 for poetry uh, his poems has been translated into several indian and foreign languages uh the his major themes associated with the poems of s joseph are caste color identity crisis crisis nature love memories uh, most of his poems we can see that uh, it is uh, written from his own memories and uh, uh, he challenged the traditional norms in writing poems in his famous poem a letter to malayalam poetry and in that poem poem uh, s joseph he wanted to free malayalam poetry and malayalam poetry is personified as a young lady captivated in the uh, 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 under the chains of meters and rhythm earlier following the sanskritized uh, traditional way of writing in malayalam uh, we have to follow a kind of meters and rhythm in poetry but s joseph he introduced uh, a kind of prosaic uh, poem full of life memories and all in simple diction uh, some of his other poems include group photo identity card uh, basket uh, here i will just like to give an example to his poem poem uh, his poetry my sister's bible Ma these are what my sister's bible has a ration book come loose a loan application form a card from the cutthroat money lender the notices of fees in church and temple a photograph of her brother's child a paper that says how to knit a baby's cap a 100 rupee note and sslc book these are what my sister's bible have preface the old testament and the new maps the red cover
Uh, my sister's Bible uh, is a short and simple poem. It addresses the day-to-day -day life facades of Dalit converted Christian women. Uh, my sister's Bible is an objectification of the invisible yet real problems faced by women in society. Sister's Bible is here symbolic of the unresolved poems, sorry, problems of the converted Dalit Christians. The religion, as it promises, doesn't provide any solace to the people. Poverty and injustice still lurks in the lives of the individuals, and both Old and New Testaments fail to give proper answer to the day-to-day -day life problems. Uh, the presence of something within the poem takes notice of the absence of another thing. Real and unreal is here mingled with the presence and absence of something in the sister's Bible. The presence of a ration book come loose, a loan application form, a card from the cutthroat money lenders, notices and 100 rupee note reminds the poet about the absence of the preface, the Old and the New Testaments. Poverty is well marked with the images of a ration book come loose, a loan application form and card from the cutthroat money lenders. We can see the kind of use of symbolism and the kind of uh, uh, the autobiography. The poet has uh, written a kind. Of, we can see the elements of autobiographical elements in this poems. Uh, more uh, okay. Uh, by that, I am concluding my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Babita. I have a question for you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Since you have traced. Uh, the origin and the hierarchy of the caste system like there is one cruel system that has been followed in kerala which is the breast tax was it imposed only on the dalit women or was it for all women uh, it was uh, for the dalit women uh, dalit women uh, for the iravas as well as for the parayas pulayas and all and uh, they have to give breast tax and there was a famous uh, movement of nangeli uh, it happened in chertala uh, it was in alapura district and once when these feudal lords they came to take this uh, breast tax uh, she uh, cut her own breast and gave it to the uh, feudal lords and that was a kind of revolutionary act and uh, so many protests were there after that and uh, these authorities they were forced to stop this uh, breast tax yes yes thank you and uh, since after this revolution also still we are in a pathetic situation of speaking about the subaltern women there in kerala yes so hope the situation changes as per our expectation so uh, thank you babita for giving us such a vivid uh, idea and the hierarchy of the keralaite caste systems thank you uh, for thank giving you. us the history the uh, for also tracing the lost history of slave trade uh, that is totally rad i mean law uh, hidden in keralaite history thank you for uh, unearthing it again for you for us so it was a wonderful presentation. Moving on to the second presenter, uh, I welcome Dr. Shruti Mitta Mehta, Associate Professor, Center for Languages Learning, the North Cap University, Guru Gram Haryana, and her scholar, Ms. Richa Sharma, PhD scholar, same uh, in the Center of Language Learning, Haryana on the topic horrors of migration and exploratory study of marginalization and subjugation in rama by abstinence the swinging bridge over to you please the second presenter dr shruti mitta mehta Organizers, please check whether the presenter is there or shall I move down to the next presenter? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We can move on to the next presenter. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. So, the third presenter, I would request Akshita Shangam, the research scholar from Dr. Ram Manohar Loiha National Law University, Lucknow. Uh, good evening, ma'am. One second, I'll introduce your topic. Yes. Uh, and uh, here we have Akshita presenting her paper on symbolism and understanding identity. Over to you.
मैं साक्षी का यस मैम यस मैम गुड इवनिंग मैम गुड इवनिंग मैम माय नेम इज अक्षता एंड आई विल बी आई आई एम जस्ट ट्राइंग टू शेयर माय स्क्रीन आई डोंट थिंक सो आई एम एबल टू डू दैट सो माय टॉप माय नेम इज अक्षता Uh, my topic is symbolism in understanding identity uh, i am a research scholar with the history of department in uh, dr ram manohar lohia national university uh, so basically my topic uh, talks about symbols which help in giving an identity to the people and uh, we have certain uh, symbols such as the national flag uh, the charkha which give uh, which give an identity to the masses but i would also like to talk, uh, talk about certain symbols which give an identity to the marginalized category per se so uh, i will start a symbol can speak many things in a way that does largely depends on the reader's ability to interpret and decode them symbols allow people to go beyond what is known or seen by creating linkages between very different and otherwise concepts and experiences for example the national flag impart in us a feeling of belonging together uh, another important symbol of our freedom struggle such as the khadi which is very important as mahatma gandhi also wrote immensely on the importance of khadi and urged the masses to take up its usage on greater use so these are such uh, some popular symbols which help in giving an identity to the masses uh, such uh, so we can say that the collective consciousness is always attached to some or the other representative representative form which have evolved with time now i would also like to talk about some of the marginal symbols such as the story of the ram nami samaj which is a religious movement founded by the scheduled caste ram devotees in the late 19th century in the northern chhattisgarh they were denied entry to temples and forced to use separate wells these low caste hindus first tattooed their bodies and faces more than 100 years ago as an act of defiance and devotion ram namis wrote ram's name all over their bodies as a message to high caste indians that god was everywhere regardless of the person's caste or social standing <clears throat> the symbols and symbolism apart from imparting a feeling of belonging together also help in imparting an identity especially to the marginal classes hence my paper explores some of the influential symbols used in used in history which impacted our past to a large extent and helped ignite a feeling of collectiveness not only to the masses but also to the marginalized Uh, the marginalized sections of the society are the people who are devoid of cultural capital for a thousand of years whose struggles were never recognized whose stories and rightful contribution did not make it to the history books and whose stories need to be counted in the process of nation building india has a history of constructing memorials and statues as ways of recognizing and preserving political memories while statues while, while statues are erected to create public memory there are some structures that transform that transform into spaces of empowerment particularly when it comes to the underprivileged these memorials and statues are nothing but the recreation of lost history and attempt at resurrection and struggle of the marginalized for example the ambedkar icon the ambedkar icon which has become the symbol of dalit identity provides an interesting case study of the understanding and strategies towards the state by the underprivileged in india it helps in forming our understanding of the grassroots perception of indian democracy in the midst of poverty and illiteracy such symbolic means have have political implications promoting ideals of citizenship and nationhood among the politically destitute uh yes i can uh, share my screen now so uh, can you see ma'am my screen yes 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 ma'am yeah. Yeah, yeah you can continue yeah so this is the ambedkar icon which has become the symbol of the dalit identity it has been forming an understanding of the grassroots perception of democracy it emphasizes the instrumental importance of the ambedkar's icon and its contribution to politicization of indian history the ambedkar statue stands as a major feature of the dalit movement movement his bitter struggle against gandhi on the question of recognition of the untouchables as a separate minority left its mark on their collective destiny destiny at several levels these struggles were remembered in ambedkarite circles as a large landmark episode because of which a distinct dalit political identity could be kept alive nurtured after independence his statues perhaps inevitably became a tool for political mobilization after he died 
The little blue statues of Ambedkar wearing a three-piece suit and holding the Indian constitution have indeed become a common sight in contemporary slums and villages in many parts of the country. The constitution recalls Dr. Ambedkar's innumerable co contribution. His raised arm recalls his relentless struggle and the stature and the pen in his pocket signifies his academic excellence in higher education and statesmanship, thus connoting a symbolic significance to each aspect of the statue. Therefore, <clears throat> despite attempts at studying uh, Dalit politics, that there has also been a lack of scholarly attention to the deeper social changes involved in the Dalit relationship with the state. These statues seem to uh, seem to be the focal point for renewed aspirations towards democracy, while the ceremonies organized around them have provided the deprived Dalits the opportunities to build some support within the state. Hence, the history of these statues and symbols in many parts of the country needs special attention because uh, Benedict Anderson also writes that political symbols play a major part in, in a way a nation is depicted and fed into the imagination of its citizens. Um, next, I would also like to talk about the story of the Ramnami uh, Samaj. Uh, it is a story of a popular symbol such as tattoos stat as means of Sanskritization. The Ramnami community of Chhattisgarh is a low caste religious movement whose followers tattoo their bodies with Lord Ram. This movement started as peaceful resistance against the practice of untouchability in India. Not allowed to enter temples, the Ramnamis covered their bodies with the name of Ram. Throughout this, they wanted to demonstrate that God is accessible to everyone. According to a popular legend, it was started by Parshuram, the son of a low caste share proper. Born in Chapara village in the mid 19th century, he was greatly inspired by the stories of Ramayana. He started working with his father as a farm laborer at an early age and was married by the age of 12. Parshuram taught himself to read and write <clears throat> so as to understand the stories in Ramayana. Later on in his life, he contracted leprosy and due to the social stigma attached to the disease, he decided to live the life of a renunciant. During this time, he met a sage who blessed him and asked him to continue reading Ramayana. The next morning, Parshuram discovered that all the signs of his illness had disappeared from his body and instead the word Ram Ram appeared in the form of a tattoo on his chest. This was seen as a miracle and the villagers began to see him as a blessed man. He started preaching Ramayana and the importance of uttering Ram Nam, that is Ram's name, and people started considering his house a sacred site and paid regular visits. The status or Godna, as it's seen as it is called in local language, has transformed into this into spaces of empowerment for the Ram Namis or the marginal category. Other symbolic as aspect which I would like to uh, shed light to is the uh, is the symbolism of Indian elections. While discussing about symbols in Indian context, one also needs to understand the importance of elections in the world's largest democracy. It is interesting to note that the symbols which Mrs. Gandhi in before 1980 elections, that is the elephant and bicycles, which she rejected, were later chosen by some of the marginal parties which have a strong foothold in Uttar Pradesh, such as the Bahujan, Bahujan Samaj Party chose elephant as, as, its, uh, as its political symbol. The fact that the elephant was linked to the low caste communities well before the Bahujan Samaj Party was formed in 1984 may have had something to do with it. In the 51-52 elections, a group called All India Scheduled Caste Federation selected the elephant for its symbol. The scheduled caste refers to a list in India's constitution of communities for whom affirmative action programs have been mandated to counteract the effects of centuries of discrimination under Hinduism's caste system. This, this party symbolizes an entirely different ideology of empowering the lower strata of society. It challenges the hegemony of the Varna system, the Purushukta hymn, and the whole concept of twice born, that is the Dvija. Popularly known as BSP, it is a significant national party in India, which was founded by 1984 by Kanshi Ram, who is also a member of the Dalit, Dalit community. The word Bahu, Bahujan literally means the majority of the people and the Samaj means society. The BSP is symbolic to the majority of people representing mainly oppressed sections of the society, such as the scheduled caste, the, the scheduled tribes, other backward classes, as well as the religious minorities. Hmm. Uh, uh, the symbol of... Uh, elephant also has other important connotations such as it is a giant animal that is and it is also usually very peaceful this inherent meaning is applied to mean the huge population of the bahujan samaj or the downtrodden sections of the society it is not only a very large section of society but the lower caste and the minority sections have greater physical and mental strength and can fight all battles social historian badri narayan whose book on the development of the dalit movement the making of the dalit public in north india opines that elephant also has other resonances such as the elephant links with the Buddhist culture. Choosing an elephant is also significant because it is also portrayed on the lion capital of Ashoka at Sarnath. 
to conclude my topic i would like to say that identity is but an imaginary concept till the time laws are attached to it the importance of understanding symbols so history is quite essential in constructing history and giving a meaning to it from different viewpoints and the history without symbols and symbolism would be a dull narrative of what happened in the past without any show of form the symbols play a crucial role in signifying our history they leave an impact in our memories and help us to att attach meanings and emotions to certain visuals they even help us in representing our ideology our thoughts our faith our beliefs and our collective consciousness they represent a whole corpus of history and travels through different periods connecting us to the contemporary world at last so if we see these symbols we already have an image of what they they mean to us such as the national flag the charkha they give us a uh, they give us a feeling of nationalism the uh, the swastika which is a important symbol of the of hinduism it depicts the four cardinal uh, directions but also if we interpret it in the concept of world wars it is also the navi symbol so it we we are very much aware of the symbols of the masses which give us an identity but do we also need to talk about certain marginal symbols which give an identity to a certain class of marginal category people such as the dalit and which also help them to feel very politi politically active and socially present in the society thank you thank you akshita that was seriously a thought provoking and you've thrown light um on the indian symbols and symbolisms that we've been yes. speaking right from the genesis of our independence and thank you for the idea that you've uh, traced on the tattoos that's been used even today tattooing as a modern art it's considered to be modern art but uh, we you have presented the history of tattoos that which uh, identifies the most suppressed community and in how they have been uh, suppressed by not entering to the uh, worshiping places and um, yes of course now the ambedkar's uh, identity which uh, we associate with the dalit and also various other political symbols that you have signified like the elephant so hope um, with all these discussions for all these ages we hope we march towards a world of equality and hope your expectation comes true thank you akshita thank you for such a wonderful presentation thank you ma'am yes uh, next presenter i would like to uh, call upon vishwajit trivedi rr monap mon para arts college sardar patel educational institute okay. gujarat thank you ma'am yes and he is going to present on veluta the subaltern yes may i start ma'am yes please yeah so uh, my name is vishri trivedi and as you introduce me i am from rr monpra Mon arts college and the sardar patel educational institute from bhavnagar gujarat and my topic is explaining about the subaltern character called veluta of the god of the small thing which is very famous novel of by arundhati roy so first i would like to introduce the what is what is called the subaltern study so the first colonial movement happened in 1980 very first time the subaltern study start to used by ranjit guha the meaning of this word predominantly in south asia whether this is expressed in a term of class caste age gender and office or any other way subaltern study analyzes the binary relations of the subaltern and the ruling classes and this study is interplay of dominance and sub subordination in colonial system particularly in india all through movements methods have since been applied to other nations spaces and histories an untouchable worker in pickle factory and a close friend of richel and nista called veluta accused of murdering sofi mol and rapping amu in fact he has nothing to do with sofi mol's death and has a brief and voluntary relationship with amu until inspector thomas matthews a police officer is nearly killed veluta so this is the introduction of the subaltern study and also the veluta character which i'm going to explain so first i would like to say the subaltern study so subaltern study means as a wall aims to uncover the historian of groups that within the colonial and nationalist achieves when largely shut to the margins or undocumented altogether 
turning towards a popular account of public history and memory in order to combat what Guha terms in Istalism to subaltern studies groups primary focus was and is to recover examine and privilege the agency of the underclass within the network of capitalism colonialism and nationalism so for an example when British people came in our nation exactly before two or three hundred years during the time when 17 18th century were continue so British people were having trouble to establish something in our nation and the people who they were leaving we can call them lower caste people so they were thinking the British people came for us for example in the 1857 when they established the train in our nation for manipulating the weapons here to there Gujarat to Calcutta or somewhere like north to south. So people were thinking they are making convenience and facilities for us, but actually they were using people. They were trying to make people fool. In short, we can say the British people came in our nation and tried to give an authorization to lower caste people to use them, to give them an authority, to make them soldiers, to use in the army, to making a ruling genre. So that's how it worked in our nation. So this is called Sabaton. Whenever the Sabaton people People try to ask for the authorization. So always the society try to make a domination on them. And that's why some lower caste people who they belong to actually try to speak something specific, but not, uh, not giving an authority by the society. That's why they're losing the opportunity to say something. This is the same thing here is happening in the God of the Small Things, which I'm going to describe. So Arundhati Roy explained about Veluta character in the God of the Small Things. When Veluta a Parvan untouchable who grew up with Ammu and is a very skilled and with his hands. He is an excellent carpenter and fix all the machines in the pickle factory, but is still treated as a second class. He grows into handsome young man and beloved by the twins. Veluta was working into the pickle factory. He was also a close friend of Rayal and Ista. Veluta accused for killing Sophie Mole and Rep Amu, and he arrested by police officer. And actually, he is an innocent. He didn't kill Sophie Mole. And the police officer, Thomas, and other police inspector, they torture Veluta so much until when he died in the jail without any opportunity to speak at the prove himself an innocent. So this is the thing which we can find out in the God of the Small Thing novel. Baby Kochamma, she is a negative character of the novel called God of the Small Thing. She tried to accuse Veluta without any reason. Every tale having negative character. Veluta was actually innocent. He was giving his love to Rahel and Hista, as I said, as I read, Velita loved Ammu, and he was dedicated for her, but still he couldn't marry to her. And because of the baby Kochima, she tried to make a trap for him to deliberately did those things to kill him, to torture him. And Veluta arrested by the police officer of the Kerala Police Department, and Veluta tortured by the police officer to taking him into the police custody without any reason, and without giving to him any authority, any opportunity to speak out to prove himself i am innocent i did not kill sophie mole and there is any relation with sophie mole that veluta didn't speak so this is called society whenever we try to see several of examples some people try to speak out but because of they are not actually from big caste big kind they are not belonging to big family that's why they always try to kill by the society and the society rules. So this is called the colonialism and also the socialism, which is proving dominating on the lower caste Sabatian people like Veluta. In conclusion, I would like to say the Sabatian character Veluta in this novel of the God of the Small Thing, the innocent character who died without any support, and he was an innocent. And he originally didn't kill Sophie Mall, and he loves so much to Amu. Even he wants to marry to her, but unfortunately it didn't happen. And because of the baby coach and mass trap, Veluta arrested by police officer and torture him so much in the jail. And he also didn't got any opportunity to speak out to prove himself, I didn't do anything. I did not kill Sophie Mall, or I did not rape Amu. In this society, this type of people are dying very brutally. And that's why the humanity is very much significant. And be humanitarian to give justice to this type of peoples. Let them speak and prove them innocent and establish the humanity in the society. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Vishwajit. And that was a very crisp presentation of Veluta from God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. Yes, here I would like to highlight Arundhati Roy's use of uh, characterization. So he, uh, she actually uses the generalized word called Mamachi Papachi, signifying not just the character in the book, but characterizing, characterizing every human being of the world who discriminates uh, Dalit people as Dalit. So 
thank you thank you for highlighting that humans are one of Not the reason much. yes the human beings are the ones who uh, discriminate the other human beings so that was the one point that i uh, that you've highlighted hope this changes thank you for your wonderful presentation vishwaji yes my pleasure and, yes the last um, uh, presenter of this session i would like to call upon niharika shri uh, hoi mphil scholar department of english university of delhi india and she will be presenting a paper on construction of caste in serious men by manju joseph over to you niharika yes hello can you hear me yes ma all right hi uh, good afternoon everyone i'd like to begin by presenting my screen just give me a second i hope my screen is now visible to everyone yes ma yes it is visible all right uh, so uh, the title of my presentation today is construction of caste in serious men by manu joseph a study of representation of dalits in the writings of non dalit authors uh just second yeah so indian literature for a long time largely stayed away from the issue of inequality caused by the caste system despite the fact that indian culture has been one of the most hierarchical among all known civilizations with a distinct gradation in the exercise of power and privilege one of the plausible explanations is that people who wielded power have typically held the pen while those outside the system of authority and agency have been rendered invisible in the canonized literature works of india it is only towards the end of 19th century that a few unusual novels take up the theme of social oppression as their primary concern in the 20th century there is gradually growing awareness in in the literature of those who have so far remained outside the threshold of mainstream indian society the outcasts the landless the dispossessed and the indigenous people it is against this backdrop that my presentation aims to investigate the representation of dalit lives and conception of caste in manu joseph's novel serious men now we move on to the second slide author position effect of manu joseph's social position as an upper caste man on his understanding of caste the social position of the author is vital in understanding their writing manu joseph's position as a non dalit writer becomes significant in understanding his perspective and construction of caste in indian society his book serious men published in the year 2010 interprets caste very superficially and it and compounds it with class very often the deceptive qualities of appearing to be sensitive to caste in contemporary indian society are revealed to us in the ways the novel constructs dalit characters and presents them as an antithesis to the brahmin or upper caste characters this novel received worldwide acclamation and was lauded for its satiric portrayal of quote unquote serious men the garb of satire licensed the erroneous description of dalit lives through an individualized portrayal of the dalit character of ayan mani who doesn't assert his dalit identity in, in tandem with the collective dalit consciousness he in fact abhors being associated with his caste identity Ayan Mani is presented as a conniving, scheming, sexist, and devious man. It is an attempt at distancing him from the reader by attributing the negative qualities of this person to his caste, and consequently estranging the readers from associating with Dalits as an extension of this. The, mor the morally deviated Dalit man, whose aggression, frustration, and anger always find a central place in the novel, on a superficial reading appears to be representative of Dalit angst. A closer reading discloses that this wrath and hunger for revenge is Joseph's way of communicating jealousy for people belonging to the upper caste instead of vexation and fury against the unjust treatment of Dalits. Mani's constant insistence on distancing from other members of his community and the BD. the chol and his aspiration to climb the social ladder by moving up in the class hierarchy is a reiteration of the image of a flawed dalit who conflates class with caste 
This demonstrates the fallacious belief that upward mobility of class can be a solution to the Dalit question. The novel denies the roots of caste-based oppression. The Savarna gaze of the non-Dalit writer fails to consider the immutable nature of caste in India. Caste and class cannot be synonymous in a society where caste is deeply entrenched. <clears throat> the next slide, uh, meritocracy trap, propagating the myth of merit and worth. Uh, Manu Joseph presents Ayan Mani as a manipulator and a liar who propagates the fabricated lie of his son Adi Mani being a genius who could recite the first thousand prime numbers. The novel necessitates the use of a manufactured sham to earn merit for this Dalit boy. This representation falls prey to the discourse of meritocracy being the realm of the upper caste and how Dalits need to cheat and concoct lies to survive in the intellectual spaces that belong to upper class men with merit. This constructs lower class, uh, this constructs lower caste identity as meritless and falsity of upper caste intellectual superiority is disseminated. The novel thus partakes in legitimizing merit as an upper caste virtue. Arvind Acharya, the director at the Indian Institute of Theory and Research, and his scientific endeavors are attributed to his merit and hard work, whereas on the other hand, Mani, his assistant, has to contrive spiteful lies to survive. This book clearly puts forth Manu's, Manu Joseph's own politics and sympathies with upper caste people. Now moving on to the Next slide, Manu Joseph's imagined Dalitness, revelation of his own prejudices. Ayan Mani's character has been ascribed negative qualities like rage and spiteful machinations that make him unlikable on occasion. Manu Joseph's process of creating this character exhibits his affinity towards the upper castes as he discloses in an interview and I quote, when money first formed in my head, he was just the same, but he was not a Dalit. He had this anger and a comical interpretation of the modern world and modern, modern women and science and everything around him, but he was not a Dalit. Then I asked myself, why is he so angry? Can I give him a justification? And the idea of a Dalit male who is trying to create from thin air the first Dalit boy genius just fascinated me. End of quote. This act of transposing the stereotypical depiction of Dalit people by associating them with detrimental qualities of dishonesty, lack of talent or merit and cunningness to a Dalit character reveals Joseph's own biases. He thus participates in creating and propagating myths about Dalit lives. The novel constructs a very sanitized and fraudulent idea of caste, which is directed towards a novelist's English-speaking audience. A surface reading of the novel can be deceptive. It can appear to be a progressive enge engagement with caste that is divorced from Joseph's non-Dalit literary predecessors. A closer reading highlights the author's own prejudice. At this point, it becomes pertinent to mention Manu Joseph's 2016 article after Rohit Vemula's death, in which he obnoxiously chalks up his death to clinical depression and denies him any respect in his death. He underplays the caste-based discrimination and exclusion faced by him. He writes, and I quote, Rohit Vemula, from all the evidence in plain sight, is a depression story, not a Dalit story, end of quote. In another 2007 article, he remarks, and I quote, what if he was dejected not only by the upper caste cartel, but as he hints in his suicide note, also by the very people he belonged to? What if the perpetual negativity of activism worsened his depression? End of quote. The horrifying reduction of his struggles is the Brahminical way of explaining a Dalit death to absolve themselves of the guilt. Joseph thus denies Vemula the identity of being a Dalit. This reveals his prejudices, which are also reflected in this fictional piece of work. Clash of the quote-unquote theoretical Brahmins and quote-unquote empirical Shudras and the conflict between the good and bad Brahmins. Uh, Gopal Guru's idea of a pernicious divide between theoretical Brahmins and empirical Shudras is reflected in this novel where Ayan is the empirical Shudra who engages in the non-essential work and Arvind Acharya is the theoretical Brahmin who does the thinking work. The novel displays the unquestioned predominance of the Brahminical stranglehold over knowledge production. The preservation of the bastion of knowledge controlled by the upper caste remains in the hands of the Brahmins even after the change of control from Acharya to Nambudri. Ayan Mani on only becomes a prop in this transfer of power between Brahmins. The novel foregrounds the two kinds of Brahmins, the 
quote unquote quote uh, casteless arvind acharya is displayed as money's savior as he helps him uh, keep his lie alive by providing him with the questions for the entrance test he's juxtaposed with jana nambodri the vengeful brahmin brahmins are thus allowed to be good and bad res- represented by arvind acharya and jana nambodri rep- uh, respectively but dalits are expected to perform the function of dishonest and corrupt individuals they are not allowed this space acharya is also placed in a binary with ayan who is described as a lecherous who is described as lecherous and offered no redemption acharya on the other hand is forgiven by his wife lavanya for his affair with oparna he is completely vindicated towards the end of the narrative the purposeful male gaze and ill treatment of women by ayan mani is a trope used to vilify the dalit man joseph decision to make his character a vile sexist who describes every woman in terms of their physical exper- um, experience and holds a disdain for upper caste women is a deliberate attempt at denigrating the dalit character he is represented as an uncultured and sexually perverse person who ridicules and objectifies upper caste women throughout the text uh now we move on to the next uh slide echoing stereotypes of dalit patriarchy and deriding the ambedkarite uh, movement the text is replete with instances of dalit patriarchy oja ayan mani's wife is represented as a victim of dalit patriarchy she has no voice of her own outside the house she is denied agency and has to resort to acts of self harm to protect herself from the dalit patriarchy the mask of humor is used to create the stereotypical uh, stereotypical construct of the naive ignorant woman who is in stark contrast with the self of assertive dalit women in other texts by dalit writers it only ends up perpetuating casteism and misogyny he reproduces and reaffirms caste's gender prejudices the docility of oja is also highlighted in her acceptance of the hindu gods Joseph portrays two opposing sides of religion in the space of the home. Ayan is presented as an Ambedkarite Buddhist who exclaims uh, that, and I quote, "Buddha is our god. The other gods are gods the Brahmins created." In this deviant, in their deviant stories, those gods fought against demons, which were us. Those black demons were our forefathers. End of quote. In associating money with Ambedkarite uh, Buddhism, he questions Navayana as he. presented as he is presented as essentially dishonest and therefore a blot in the on the uh, buddhist ideals uh now uh, i'd like to um, conclude my presentation by saying that uh, the novel negates any possibility of a dalit movement as a solution the novel trivializes the uprising of the dalit community against the dominant discourse of uh the nation as manu joseph writes uh, and i quote the untouchables in modern times had won the useless right of being touched by the high caste but they remained the poorest in the city end of quote this negation of the social liberation movements of dalits and the polit- uh, and the politicized identity of the dalit community is not accepted by the dalit protagonist who ridicules the politicized masses by saying and i quote they go in rage and return with adidas end of quote the dalit political leader vaman is also presented as a violent opportunistic thug the uh, the corrupt and unscrupulous characteristics tied with him humiliate the dalit leaders the novel completely rejects the potency of identity politics manu joseph's own position as a savarna writer is reflected in his construction of dalit lives the transgressive acts in the novel are completely devoid of the potential to bring about any change dalit characters have to be shown their place they have to become nobodies for the equilibrium to exist and for the status quo to prevail the novel uh, the novel's acts of subversion up, does appear to be hollow as it becomes a mouthpiece in service of the upper caste that's the end of my presentation thank you thank you niharika for introducing us to uh, um, upper caste writer manu joseph and i have a question to you Yes ma'am. Um do you think Niharika that knowledge quotes humans to be inhuman against the same fellow being? I'm sorry I I didn't get your question. Okay. So according uh, to your presentation you told that um knowledge it is based on knowledge that high caste people discriminate the low caste people. Right. right. 
so in high caste people have that knowledge knowledge the powerful weapon of knowledge and they use that knowledge to discriminate the people how far you substantiate that knowledge is the reason for this discrimination no it's not the uh, it's not the reason for discrimination i believe it is uh, one of the uh, aspects that they used to propagate uh, their supremacy uh, it is uh, used as a tool to propagate supremacy but not uh, the reason for it okay yeah that is the irony of uh, knowledge because the more knowledge a person is the more humble he has to be the more responsible he has to be but unfortunately it doesn't happen to be so yes and, yeah, yeah, and they use this knowledge to show their supremacy, where right. the real uh, reason of knowledge goes answered. That's that, yeah, that's, that's my observation. Yes, yes. So thank you. That was wonderful presentation from your side, Niharika. Thank you so much. And I, yes, I thank the partners, uh, presenters. Okay. Uh, ma'am, when you, ma'am, I think yes. one hundred is there, ma'am. Uh, uh, Sharmila, ma'am. Sharmila. Actually, yesterday you were asking to me that you want to present. Sharmila Jain or Sharmila? She's not presenting, it seems. Okay, ma'am, we can uh, find up this session. Yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, on the whole, I would like to record my observation. Uh, this session was uh, seriously wonderful, and I thank the presenters. Hello, am I audible? Hello, hello. Yes, yes, yes Sharmila. Hello. Would you like to present your paper, Sharmila? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Yes, yes, you can present. You can present. Yes. One minute. Please give me some time. Just to open the document. Make it fast, ma'am, please. Yes, yes. Ma'am, I am also ready to present my paper, ma'am. I am Devendra Kumar Yadav. Organizers. Devendra yes, Kumar Yadav. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Just a second. Sorry, I will be presenting then. Uh, now, the, if she presents now, this session will be over, sir. After after this, ma'am, after this session? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Good evening, ma'am. This is Karthikini. I'm also ready to print my paper. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh... Ma'am, you, yours will be in the next session, ma'am. Next session. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. I'm ready, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Sharmila? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Presenting. Yeah, please, ma'am. Ma please don't delay. Without delay, you can start your presentation, ma'am. Yes, yes. One minute. Huh? Excuse me, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I'm in the last session, but time is not mentioned. When I can present, ma'am? Ma'am, last session you will be presenting uh, 6.30 to 7.30, ma'am, or else it will take up to 8, ma'am. OK, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Please be in the link, and uh, you'll be called. OK, OK, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm starting my presentation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, please, soon. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. The title of my paper is Representation of Diaspora in Anita Desai's Novels. Diaspora represents persons leaving their country of origin and staying in various parts of the world due to their job commitments, education, etc., temporarily or shifted permanently due to other regions. Such a diasporic population contributes a lot not only to literature and culture of their homeland and the migrant country, but also to the global culture and literature. The diasporic writers have earned praise for themselves and brought laurels for India too. Therefore, the proposed research work is directed to examine the political, social, cultural and economic aspect of 
Diaspora studies with reference to Anita Desai's Bye Bye Blackbird, Bomb Gartner's Bombay, Fasting, Feasting. It aims at analyzing the select novels by applying descriptive analysis and reader response approaches to examine the journey of the diaspora population that had been homesick at times and tries to explore the impact of environmental factors in their search for space, identity, and self discovery. Bye Bye Blackbird is story of Dev, Adit, and Sarah facing existential crisis in England. In the backdrop of relations between individual and society, this novel is the most intimately related to Anita Desai's own experience. Dev has come to England to study in London, School of Economics, and feels put out in the early stages of its stay in London because of the insult hurled at the black by the careless and arrogant Englishman, but gradually turns anglophiliac and finds the life of an alien enthrallingly rich and highly enterprising. Adit's situation is just opposite to that of Dev. He has married an English girl, Sarah, and settled in England with no desire to come back to his native country, India. He is often ridiculed by his friend Dev as book licking today, toddy and spineless imperialist lover. Owing to his unreserved love for England, but he gradually feels disenchanted with London. He begins to consider himself a stranger, a known belonger, as the growing nostalgia torments him. He, described, he decides to leave for India to lead a real life devoid of all pretenses. Sarah, Adit's wife, is the head secretary in one of the schools in England, though she stays in her own country after marriage, yet suffers from identity confusion. She questions to herself whether she is an English girl, Mrs. Sen, a wife who married to an Indian, or Mrs. Sen, the secretary. Adit is thinking of her English. Desai remarks, he had sat back, sat silent, shocked by that anguish, an anguish it seemed to him of loneliness, and then it became absurd to call her by his own name, to call her by any name. She had become nameless, she had shed her name as she had shed her ancestry and identity. She is unable to balance these two identities. She feels cheated on performing the two roles in the morning at school and one in the evening at home. She is unable to tell how sincere is she in playing these roles. When she is not playing these roles, she is nobody. Her face was only a mask, her body only a costume. Where was Sarah? If Sarah had any existence at all, and then she wondered with great sadness if she would ever be allowed to step off the stage, leave the theater and enter the real world, whether English or Indian. She didn't care. She wanted only its sincerity, its truth. However, she decides to accompany Adit to India, even after being pregnant and getting a good opportunity at job. As she knows, it was her English self to which she must say goodbye. That was what hurt, not saying goodbye to England. In Anita Desai's fasting feasting, the son Arun is sent to USA for higher studies and he also finds it difficult to adjust there in USA because the Indian culture and the American cultures are quite different. Actually, when he when he goes to USA to higher study, he gets a house at Mrs. Patton's place. Mrs. Patton likes to eat vegetarian food, but she can't eat vegetarian food because her husband and her children like to eat non-vegetarian food, while Arun likes to eat vegetarian food. So he faces not only problem in adjusting there as far as food is concerned, he sees that in India, the parents are trying to dominate the children, while in America, parents don't do. Melanie and Rod, Mr. and Mrs. Pitton's children are free to do whatever they want to do. While Arun's life at America is also dictated by his father from India. He also notices that Mrs. Pitton hardly cooks at all. Uh, so this way he faces problem because 
he finds it difficult he uh, whenever mrs patton cooks vegetarian food for arun he find it not tasty but he can't say that he is not finding the food tasty and he has to anyway adjust similarly in bomb gardeners bombay bomb gardeners bombay is the story of uh, people who have come to mumbai and calcutta germans who have come to mumbai and calcutta this i deals with the problem of diaspora in the backdrop of struggle for survival hugo baumgartner lotti and kurt the three germans are foreigners in india hugo escapes to india due to a war in germany during nazi regime he stays at various places berlin venice calcutta bombay in his journey of life but is discriminated due to his comp complexion in germany he has been dark his darkness has marked him the jew in india he was fair and that marked him the firangi in both lands he is unacceptable he leaves calcutta for bombay on his indian friend habibullah's advice where all is declared there he comes with habibullah's letter to chiman lal and gets accommodation due to his help and recommendation in hira nivas he and chiman lal start a business in partnership on trust and understanding without signing any papers but when chiman lal dies his son doesn't listen to bomb gartner and demands for documentary evidence thus he disconnected from his business bomb gartner is very kind to human beings and animals though yet in bombay he is treated as nobody an old man with an empty bag he becomes famous as the madman of the cats the billi wala pagal as he shelters and nurses the stray cats he is indebted to the restaurant owners who used to fill his bag with remains of food to feed his cats at home he becomes their regular customer in return lotti is the only person with whom he can share something in india not because she also claims to be a german because but because she belong to the india of his own experience hers was different in many ways but still they shared enough to be comfortable with each other she has been a singer and dancer before being known as mem sahib in india she considers her life in india um, as mosquito life they know they cannot go either to germany or europe lotti says there is no home for us so where can we go they have stayed here in india like fools amongst thieves the cholera and mosquitoes while others have made money during war and vanished hugo tells her that he would like to go to venice and be at home if he could while lotti tells that she can get indian nationality by marriage if need arises as many indians are after her lotti shares dogs like that in the street this is how we go hugo in the end alone hugo is arrested and warrant declared in india and is taken to detention camp even though he clarified that he has come to india to pursue his business interest he remains in captivity for 6 years for he being a stranger had nobody to make an appeal for his release but to save lotti from arrest a marwari businessman kanti shethia whom she also loves marries her illeg- illegally she becomes governess of his children from his first marriage too but she is not even recognized by the shethia children when kanti dies and thrown out on the road she becomes a drunkard and loses control over herself yes, after that bomb gardener shabna yes. please make it simple bomb please make it simple yes 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 bomb gartner faces the pangs of exile and warranty of wage in india even after staying for 30 years in bombay thus the three novels tell how the diaspora population has to struggle for their existence survival identity and they are homesick they suffer from feeling of nostalgia thank you one and all thank you sharmila ma'am so uh you finally state that all the danita desai's diaspora characters long to come back to the their own country is it so yes yes okay okay thank you thank you dear presenters yes uh so i would like to give my review on the session it was a wonderful yes. session i thank the presenters for being so concerned about the diverse discrimination of which caste consumes 
the maximum. So this session was indeed an intellectual orientation on the need of more humanistic encounters to march towards a world of equality. So I record my sincere thanks to the management of the college and the organizers and special thanks to Dr. Mahalakshmi ma'am, the head of uh, English department, AVP College, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for spending a valuable time and giving your opinions. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, presenters, now we'll move on to the next session. Um, next session, uh, session 11, I think uh, Dr. Yasmin Ma'am is the chairperson. I think she is in the, in the meeting room. Yasmin Ma'am, good evening, Ma'am. Good evening, Ma'am. Thank you for yes, having the uh, session. Yes, Ma'am. Ma hearty welcome to you, Ma'am. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you so much. And could you please tell me, let me know who are all the presenters in this session? Yeah, yes, Ma'am. I'll, I'll check the presenters. Now uh, we'll have a small intro about uh, the chairperson. Pavitra? Yes, ma'am. Good yes, evening, everyone. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the session, Dr. Yes Yasmin, ma'am, assistant professor and head, Department of English, Konga Arts and Science College, Erode. She has nearly 10 years of experience in teaching field. She has attended various workshops, conference, and FTP, and presented and published various papers. She also acted as a resource person and guest lecturer for many colleges. Ma'am, now I request you to move the session along. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction. Ma'am, ma first you. person to raise Anjali Kumar Verma. Good evening. Yes, May I yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma yes, ma my dear presenters, my dear presenters, please stick on to the time and make it simple as such what you are coming to say. Please come to the point. Thank you so much. And the session is yours now, Anjali. Thank you, ma'am. A very good good evening to Chairman, ma'am and uh, my co-presenters here along with the team. The title of my paper is English Language as the Voice of the Voiceless. Someone who can't speak either literally or figuratively is voiceless. A sore throat may leave one voiceless for a couple of days and the youngest child in a family might feel voiceless when it comes to making two big family decisions. A voice gives our opinions a platform and empowers us with the opportunity to have a perspective and understanding on things that matter. Each voice has something different to say. And a world that needs to represent freedom and democracy, a voice is a powerful symbol of this. Popularly, a theatre student Gloria Billingsley said, for me, voice for the voiceless means using the talents and skills you have to empower someone to speak for themselves. The voiceless are around us in our society. Those who are poor, weak, and vulnerable. Those who have been let down by the system. Being voice of the voiceless, therefore, mainly signals that the historically disadvantaged, vulnerable, underrepresented, get opportunities to represent themselves by harnessing the strengths of information, media, and communication technologies. An impressive array of tools and platforms including literature, the internet, the social media, community radios, and free and open software have all been pretty instrumental. And this paper tries to celebrate the most common link to all of these, the English language, and the possible reasons that make the language the voice of the voiceless. To represent the voiceless, we need the most popular voices. In other words, a global link would serve the purpose best. A global language is one that is spoken and understood at an international level by a wide range and variety of people. About languages, one can make a co cogent argument that a powerful link exists between cultural prevalence and dominance. Furthermore, the main factor that languages become popular is due to a robust power base, whether economic, social, political, or military. The English language owes, owes its derivation to languages like Latin, 
French, German, and other European languages. This can be a reason why many Europeans don't find English a difficult language to learn. Moreover, linguistic linguists argue that the English language with its Latin script appears less complicated for people to recognize and learn. The pronunciation too is not as complex as other languages like Korean or Turkish, for example. Generally, the difficulty level of a language varies from person to person, and it also depends on the culture to which one may belong. For example, a Korean person would find it less difficult to master the Japanese language in comparison to a German person. This is because of the close proximity of the Korean and Japanese cultures. English is a very effective language, and this is evident due to the presence of various native and non-native speakers on a global scale. Furthermore, according to statistics, one fourth of the world is either fluent in English language or content with it. While it is true that the number of native Mandarin speakers in, is the greatest in the world, but, the, but Mandarin is not the global language due to its complex spellings, grammar, and letter system. Due to the massive colonial conquests, the British, no culture is com in complete oblivion of the English language or words. As such, English is a language that should not appear as too alien or strange to any community. Consequently, learning English is not such a big, of, uh, big deal for most people as they can find a certain level of familiarity with the language. Furthermore, the English language has a lot of words and synonyms to express something. As such, any word or its meaning can be expressed with a high level of accuracy. We find literature voicing the prejudices, discrimination, exploitation through centuries in all its possible genres, such as poetry, drama, essays, novels, and the like. Technology and science, the world over operate in English, giving meaning to lots of needs and enhancement, enhancements to the quality of life in general. The global village concept, be it for trade, commerce, culture, sports, it is all happily dependent on English for its thriving evolution over the decades. The Indian diaspora across the world is a good example of the same. The internet with the omnipresent social media has been constantly instrumental in providing potent platforms to the voiceless across the world. The community radios have been really active in representing the minority groups across the globe. The Australian radio has been a good example starting in somewhere in 1972 up to now. They have more than 300 uh, <coughs> open uh, radio platforms for the underrepresented. Similarly, the Chinese, Chinese community radio also is a good example of the same. Although English is not the most spoken language in the world, it is the official language in 67 countries and 27 non-sovereign entities around the world. It is spoken as first language by approx 350 million people worldwide. That's not all. It's also the most common second language in the world. English is the language of science, aviation, computers, diplomacy, and tourism. And therefore, it reaches beyond belief. There was also contribution of technology, research, commerce, art, and formal education, which led to English becoming a truly global language of the world. As such, this study tried to list the apparent features of the English language, making it truly conducive to voicing the voiceless as the global link language. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Anjali. You have uh, concisely completed the uh, presentation. And as of now, we have no questions and we'll come to it later. OK. And the next presenter, please. Thank you. Maharashtra, ma'am. Yes, Ms. R. Gurulata. Yes, ma'am. Please Good proceed. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Please Good proceed, evening, everyone. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, today, uh, my paper intends to explore how male and man made societal norms are uprooted in the society and the subjugation of women in the novel, The Pure That Broke Itself, written by Afghan American writer Nadia Hasmi. Uh, her novels are The Pure That Broke Itself, When the Moon Is Low. A house without windows, spotlight stars. My uh, paper intends to explore the 
topic, the pure that broke itself. Here, uh, particularly Nadia Hasmi depicts the ground reality of Af Afghanistan and uh, she uh, presents the Afghan culture through a family of two girls to show how women are viewed in the society. And the author talked about the practice of bachapos, uh, which is practiced with the purpose of liberating uh, the uh, liberating the girls from the codes of restriction and subjugation attached to the female body, further compli complicating the subject person of the person who disguise themselves as bachapos due to patriarchal dominance in Afghan society. Women break down physically and mentally. Women are used and women are deceived and controlled. The novelist particularly capture the essence of gender norms and the horses of young girls in a particular novel. And uh, uh, and then uh, the pearl boat uh, broke itself, contained uh, many themes, like uh, various themes. Uh, the problems of, uh, in the novel, particularly in this novel, so that a uh, woman subordinate occurs in some spheres such as uh, in education, society and family and also in professional life. Uh, here the author also gives different time settings in the novel which are 20th century and also 21st century. Nevertheless, the accidents uh, that happen to the characters remain the same. The woman's character in both uh, time settings still experience subordination from their society. The most interesting part is both the main characters in the novel become bachapos in facing the subordination, like a uh, subjugation. Uh, the purpose of being bachapos is to make women easy to get the education access and job and also to make them safe when they get go outside their houses. Even though uh, through bachapos, women can have the same rights with men, but actually it's, it is a very ironic status to women. The particular novel shows that women's subordination or subjugation is still strong in Afghan society. Also, by being bachapos, it's actually not product women at all because society will only accept women when they present themselves as men. Here, the particularly my problem, the paper's problem uh, of the study focus on the women's subordination that happens in the Afghan society depicted in the particular novel. Here, there are two plots with the different main characters which are uh, Sekiba and Rahima. Both of the stories have different time settings. The experience of Sekiba and to a bacha post occurred in the 20th century, while the experience of Rahima occurred in 2007. Uh, here, Sekiba was a daughter from a family, lived in a small village and far from the central city. And uh, she was the third child of four, consisted of two brothers and one sister. In 1903, there was a war that turned the village chaotic and causing virus epidemic everywhere. The virus made of the all her siblings died. Uh, that particular period, Sekiba had, uh, had to replace her brother's position to work and organize her father's land. Two years later, her father died because of an illness. And then she had to uh, live with, uh, with her grandmother, Sekiba grandmother always treated her like a servant. Besides, Sekiba was not allowed to get the portion of her father's land because of her bachapos. Here, particularly, author talks about two main characters. Uh, one is Rahima and then Sekiba. Here, Rahima was the third children of five daughters. Rahima lived in a village far from Kabul. Since all her siblings, uh, siblings were women, she had to survive when they went outside the house because they were be a boy who was waiting to bully them. Then Rahima's mother decided to choose one of her daughters to cha change uh, into son and Rahima was selected. When Rahima became a bacha post, she had a lot of opportunities, freedom to protect her siblings from bullying. Chance to go to school and ability to bargain at the market. Then Rahima had to get married when she was 13 years old uh, with an old man. In, it happened because of her father needed a lot of money. After marriage, she underwent a lot of problems, become, become, um, become a bacha post again. And uh, here, particularly, the struggle of one characters, struggle of struggle for freedom, struggle to uncircle the chains of patriarchal norms. It also it uh, does depict the women as active members of society who are aware of their subalternity and try to break their cells. And then here, uh, bacha post. Here, bacha post is addressed up as a boy. It's a practice in Afghanistan and also in uh, parts of Pakistan, which is some families without sons will pick a daughter to leave, behave as a boy. Here, the particular author uh, used these 
practice for his now for her novel depicts women's subordination which still exists until now in in a case to get the equal right with men a woman needed to pretend to be a man to get recognition from the society here particularly uh, the these two characters the stories so that this tradition takes us an uh, important role to people in afghanistan women's position as subordination in society depicted in the novel only occurs in the family who do not have a son society will see different in the family who only have daughters and uh, it uh, depicts the reality of parents that so not keep their daughter of for long time in the house here people um it means the family is weak people that believe that family only have daughters it means the family is weak the reason why bachcha pose exists the discrimination towards women in afghanistan so faith that uh, uh, could not be denied when a girl asks pretends to be a boy he can protect their family and other siblings in a family even if a family only has one son he can change everything in that family the women subordination in society also can be faced in some ways such as the political way demonstration and even though uh, through the tradition there's a tradition in some ways afghanistan and pakistan to confront women subordination called bachcha pose here it happens when a family one only has daughters the chosen daughter will transform to look in, even behave like a boy here the rahima uh, become a bachcha pose her appearance had already changed her hair was short she attired like a boy and her name was changed into hagin after her mother tried to make rahima look like a boy she taught rahima to behave like a boy uh, she taught her how to talk with other people how to walk in the street how to play with the, her friends and the important thing was she also asked all of the family members to call her rahim according to particular writer uh, kritik sultana men are superior to women and women are part of men's property so women should be controlled by men and this produces women subordination and the women subordination always related to the patriarchal system patriarchal is the thing which puts men position higher than women here particularly author tries to explore the thing is so uh, women are uh, subjugated by the male members in a society here uh, i am concluding that with a concluding words Uh, the particular uh, through the novel the writer projects the struggle of the protagonist and brings out the way to escape from the hardships for the novel protagonist rahima who always longed for a better life the title is art for the novel here the cell here compare the pure compare with the rahima and then uh, from the very young age she faced a tremendous struggle also she was uh, not interested in a lead miserable life like other afghan women she had a quest to enjoy her freedom as an afghan man therefore she decided to break the cell and try to escape from the problems in life and move in, move into her dreamed life later in the novel she also realizes that she is as precious as the pure and cannot be taken for granted rahima was the victim of bachcha pose yet she loves to continue her life as a boy so ironic one that's my concluding words thank you ma'am thank you ma'am gurudutta ma'am it's good it's wonderful uh, presentation and shall we move on to the next presentation i think it is dr De- deepak kapoor sir yes ma'am i'm here yes uh, sir proceed with my dear fellow participants good evening to all i am going to present the paper and i will present just the gist because of the time constraint uh, i am trying to now i will try to connect uh, this uh, share my screen do please tell me uh is it visible uh, hello is it visible yes, is, sir, is it it's visible it's visible so the title is the interplay of subjugation and frustration in hertha muller's novel traveling on one leg before i will give the introduction hertha muller was born on august 17 1953 in a village in romania and uh, she is a very reputable writer she won the nobel prize in 2009 
and her works depict cruelty violence terror subjugation and dehumanization of masses especially the minorities in the repressive regime led by nikolai ceausescu that is the romanian uh, dictator her novels depict the modern history of germans in the banat and the transylvania these are the geographical regions and uh, these regions were under soviet occupation and uh, the germans they were uh, the german minorities in these regions in romania etc they were punished brutally because of what hitler did to other persons so it was not their fault they were living in romania uh, since uh, a long time but they were punished for what hitler did to jews and other people so now this novel th this novel was written in uh, in german language in 19 i think 89 and in 1998 it was translated into english so this is all about the physical as well as the psychological difficulties that one faces while trying to find a grip in alien surroundings the main characters in the novel like irene fran thomas and stephen experience excessive levels of frustration over simple incidents they often feel the need to cry they experience envy and develop the habit of attention seeking this novel tells the story of a young german speaking woman in her mid 30s who has come to berlin after emigrating from romania her own country her native country because she was persecuted in that country because she was she belonged to the german uh, minority she remains a stranger in west germany like she was a stranger in romania in romania she was not able to find meaning in her life and in germany she cannot banish the thoughts of her native country from her psyche she is in constant search for human relationships through love fashion and newspaper collages but all her attempts bear no fruit as her neurosis remains unresolved means the frustration it led to neurosis and further it led to psychotic tendencies in uh, this character irene Irene's psychotic state of mind makes her hallucinate and imagine things even in ordinary day-to-day -day matters. She does not find comfort in anything. This is because her mind projects its grief onto everything else around it. The totalitarian regime has made her incapable of reposing faith in a single individual. Totalitarian regime means the regime of Romania of Nicolae Ceausescu. it was socialist uh, republic some national socialism something like that irene is not happy even of even after immigrating to the other country she is unhappy for no reason neurotic tendencies have starting uh, building up in irene she starts making collage from newspaper cuttings it is a defense mechanism that her that her mind has invented she wants to counter her loneliness through collage making she always finds an unknown person the other irene in her photographs she is beginning to lose touch with reality and and is developing psychotic tendencies irene feels afraid when she sees the other countries weeds in the city other countries means romania's weeds so the same plants growing in germany also irene touches those weeds to a certain that she is not imagining things Irene is not able to make a stable relationship with Franz, uh, and he is another important character in the novel. Uh, instead, she ends up in in a relationship with Thomas. Their love becomes uh, mechanical, which lacks the tenderness and warmth of human emotions. Both Irene and Thomas find their life in a crisis. They don't want to enter any serious relationship. The occasional love between them springs from brute physical needs and is devoid of any emotion or sensitivity irene feels old on the outside and powerless on the inside hatha muller writes for a moment irene let france disappear but then again the edge of a thought she had to think of france again the characters in traveling on one leg become argumentative and whining this is the result of the subjugating totalitarian regime which these uh, characters were subject to irene france thomas and stephen struggle to get with others in their daily lives as well as at work they also need to be dependent on others and develop obsessive thinking over things which may not be that important so i'm just going to conclude Thus, in traveling on one leg, Herta Muller has successfully depicted the effects of a totalitarian regime on the psyche of characters like Irene, Franz, Stephen, Thomas, and others. Also, the characters have lost interest in living life as they face bouts of severe frustration in a subjugating dispensation. They try to cling to objects like their past, 
and the habit of drinking in order to make sense of their life so here i i want to make a point that whenever the government whenever the administration it is it is subjugates you because you belong to certain kind of minority whether it be religious uh, linguistic or racial or whatever then the first step is frustration after frustration melancholia results in after melancholia there there are neurotic tendencies and after that there is psychosis in psychosis it, it is kind of serious mental disorder when you lose the, the reality and you uh, start to hallucinate so in this novel she has tried to detect the effect of a uh, totalitarian regime or subjugating regime on the on those people who are sensitive enough to feel what is happening to them so this was my conclusion thank you very much thank you sir and the next participant next presenter nazia zaman i think <coughs> Hello. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You just uh, present. Okay. Please Thank please. you, ma'am. Okay. The uh, title of my paper is "Subjugation of Women in the Select Short Stories of Bessie Head." The African women are regarded as the principal victims of colonization as well as of patriarchy, and they are the they are at the bottom uh, and at the center of chaos in the so-called dark continent. even the women writers were not able to escape this process of marginalization therefore it is needful for her to force her voice against the western colonial and native patriarchal discourses and the voice of bessie head can be regarded as one of the strongest among many others being a mixed race single woman deprived of any place to be called as her home she accepted botswana as her newly adopted home but even her experiences in botswana were not very welcoming as she was regarded as an outsider being not black enough being deprived of family race and nationality besi had vented out her human feelings through many oppressed characters like the protagonists in her short stories like the collector of treasures and heaven is not closed ma'am in this paper i'm going to discuss these two short stories of besi head the title of the stories are the collector of treasures and heaven is not closed the story the collector of treasure was published in the year 1977 in her short story collection the collector of treasures and other botswana village tales as the story opens we see the protagonist the name of the protagonist is dikeldi and uh, she is being taken to the prison and when she was admitted into the prison she was asked about her crime and she informed the prisoner that she has killed her husband and the prisoner and the prisoner tells her that it has become the fashion of um, those days that many people are committing this kind of crime actually um, uh when the kendi told her that she killed her husband by cutting off his private parts by a knife uh, her uh, co-prisoner ebony told that she also committed the same crime by a razor this type of act committed by these women suggest their acute anger and frustration which leads them to take such ultimate steps head in this story elaborately describes the attitude of men towards women during the three phases of african life now i'd like to quote from the story uh, he could be analyzed in three time spans in the old days before the colonial invasions of africa he was a man who lived by the traditions and taboos outlined for all the people by the forefathers of the tribe he had little individual freedom to assess whether these traditions were compassionate or not the ancestors made so many errors and one of the most bitter making things was that they relegated to men as superior position in the tribe while women were regarded in a congenial sense as being an inferior to men these lines are the direct attack on the traditional way of life of africa where the status of women was not better before colonization during the colonial era the situation deteriorated more peterson and rutherford also argues i would like to quote madam uh, uh, that uh, in colonial discourses in which 
collude with the patriarchal values hence a phrase double colonization has been used for the women of uh, africa during the colonial regime the ancestral values lost control over the society and it was dominated by the imported lifestyle of the colonizers the colonial era and the period of migratory mining labor of south africa was further affliction visited on these men then <clears throat> even after the independence the predic uh, pre uh, predicament of the african women uh, uh, was um, uh, not less now they became the lord of themselves the men became the lord of themselves and they wanted whatever uh, they wanted to do whatever they wished so um, now coming to uh, another story heaven is not closed in this story the uh protagonist is uh, again uh, because uh, basi head was a feminist author all her protagonists were uh, female and in this heaven is not closed where um, uh, this uh, galathe beach is the protagonist and she is the symbol of faith a devout christian and a firm believer in the norms laid down by the church on the other hand reloke with some with whom she falls in love was a pagan following the native tribal customs of setswana there is a clash between these two lovers as galathe beach wanted to marry in the church and reloke according to the traditional customs head rights i would like to quote from the story galathe beach was all at the same time startled pleased and hesitant she was hesitant because it was well known that reloke was an unbeliever he had not once set foot in church so she looked at him begging an apology and mentioned the matter which was foremost in her mind in this story uh, galathe beach is presented as a woman who is always afraid of being the object of god's wrath and at the same time she did not want to please uh, displease her lover who said or who uh, who said that he will never set his foot in the church because he believes in the traditional customs of setswana here he presents an account of africa's transition to a modern world order and the complicated nature of this transition christianity the chief tool of the european colonization is shown to have been embraced by many natives simply because it was a fashion of the time as well as a mark of civilization though christianity propounded by the church put forward a, a very progressive image of itself but the reality was quite opposite to it now um, um, i would like to discuss that dikeldi and galathe beach the two protagonists of these two stories though afflicted with various pains emerge as new women with some special characteristic traits actually dikeldi is the collector of treasures who treasures the happy things in her heart and they give her the strength to survive even in the most adverse situations in her life she remained calm and uh, while she killed her husband and never felt any remorse for her for her action because she believed that whatever she did was right while staying in the prison she was always hard working and able to earn as she was before her imprisonment she supported her children was able to save money for their education when she left for the prison poor of god she understood she understood the real spirit of god and maybe that is why she was able to get the doors of heaven not closed for her with her devotion vast knowledge of christianity and perseverance she had the supreme authority while talking about god among the villagers head rights i would like to quote from head perhaps her simple and good heart had been terrified that the doors of heaven were indeed closed on reloke and she had been trying to open them i would like to conclude um it can be said that basi head in her works presents the patriarchal and colonial discourses and presents the women of africa as an agents of their own destinies thank you madam thank you ma'am thank you for your nice and clear presentation and next i would like to call uh, tanya shri yes ma'am am i audible ma'am yes you are audible can continue please start your presentation Good evening, respected chairperson, uh, organizers, and other co-presenters. So, I would like to give my presentation on the title "Contextualizing Organic Womanism: Shifting Paradigms of Ecofeminism" in Mahashweta Devi's novel, *The Book of the Hunter*. Now, ecofeminism as a social movement and an ideology substantiates that both women and nature are the victims of the exploitation 
unleashed by the same kind of true system, which is patriarchy. So, however, mainstream ecofeminism proves inadequate as it does not take into account class, uh, caste, class, and gender of third world women, the challenges and issues of third world women also, and in turn essentializes their experiences. So, uh, Bina Garwal, an Indian development economist, in her research paper, the gender and environment debate lessons from India echoes the same when she says, and I quote, the processes of environmental degradation and appropriation of natural resources a few uh, have specific class gender as well as locational implications. Women therefore cannot be posited as a unitary category even within a country, let alone across the third world or globally. I unquote. Now, tribal women are subjected to double marginalization by virtue of their gender and caste or class. And nevertheless, Indian exponents of ecofeminism uh, kindly kind of fail to enumerate the extremities of Dalit or Adivasi women. So, therefore, a lens through which the plight of these women, these Adivasi, these Dalit women, can be discerned is need of the art. And taking the cue from Alice Walker's term womanism, Reverend Dr. George Matthew Melanuckle formulated another term, organic womanism, in his research paper, towards an organic womanism, new contours of ecofeminism in India, to bring, the, to bring to forth the unique relationship of Dalit or tribal women with nature. He explicates organic womanism as, and I quote, one of the academic challenges for feminism in India, it appears, is that of expounding an organic womanist perspective as against a Western middle class and at times elitist brand of ecofeminism, a perspective which would address the issues of women and nature, particularly from a Dalit or tribal perspective, not merely from a perspective of women in, a, in an unqualified sense. Uh, organic womanism, on the other hand, particularizes women. It is a Dalit and Adivasi women interacting with land that constitute the core of organic womanism, my uncle. Uh, thus, Dalit or tribal women's association with ecology is the core of organic womanism. And the capitalists, basically, con uh, their concern is only with the hijacking of Dalit or tribal women's body and not the other women, not the uh, like mainstream women in general. The Dalit tribal movement led by C.K. Janu, a tribal woman in Kerala, can be credited the seed of satanic feminism in India. Uh, C.K. Janu was a political activist who fought for the land of the landless tribals. Now, understandably, the term womanism has been first used by a black American poet and novelist Alice Walker in her seminal work In Search of Mother's Gardens, Womanist Prose, which implies women's commitment to survival and wholeness of the community love, strength, and appreciation for the entire section of society. And organic womanism in a similar manner addresses the extremities of Dalit or tribal women and the impact of ecological degradation on them. Now, writings of contemporary Indian women writers like Mashrata Devi and Sara Joseph uh, and other writers also aids in the development of organic womanism as their writings specifically depict the tortures and injuries inflicted on Dalit tribal women's bodies and the exploitation of Dalit or Adivasi's land. So thus the aim of the present paper is to investigate the interconnections of tribal women and nature in Mahatma Devi's uh, novel, The Book of the Hunter, uh, through the critical framework, framework of organic womanism. Uh, this particular novel encapsulates Bengal of 16th century and it reveals the fictionalized account of the poet, Brahman, farmer, and landowner Mukandram Chakrabarti, who is constrained to leave his village, Gamaniya, but eventually found his way to the land of Araha. Devi has written this novel based on the epic section called Bayad Khanda of his poem Abhaya Mangal. The novel primarily deals with the intrusion into the Tandiborn forest of the Shabbas by the town of Araha. Devi wrote in her preface to the novel, the novel that, and I quote, what I have written here is utterly a work of fiction, a novel. Mukandaram's poem was my source, but by writing about the life of Shabbos, I have combined what I know from this book, my own modest familiarity with the subject, and my life's quest. I unquote. Uh, now, the capitalists, the, uh, the capitalists uh, uh, of town hijack the tribal land, leaving them landless, leaving, them, uh, leaving tribal landless, which troubles the women specifically because uh, they depend on nature for their sustenance and livelihood. 
and this particular impacts the life of the tribal women, life of the Shabbar women, because of the close affinity with nature. And the Jota in the novel, who is the leader of the Shabbar community, told her father, Danko, and I quote, but the town keeps advancing, new neighborhoods everywhere. The city is influencing that community and it frightens the Baba. I unquote. And the global exponents of ecofeminism, Maria Mies and Vandana Shiva, provides evidence of the fact that tribal land has been snatched by the town dwellers on the name of wealth men in their work ecofeminism when they posit the capitalist patriarchal world system has led to the destructive tendencies that threaten life on the earth. The system emerged, is built upon, and maintains itself through the colonization of women, of foreign people, and the lands, and of nature, which is gradually destroyed. The Shabbas worship a female goddess of the forest, Abhaya Chandi, and considered her their mother goddess, who provides them with what all they need. Uh, and I quote from the novel, The goddess Abhaya Chandi has given you puja for work, hooks, a greenery, and a cow shed, while she gave us the jungle. We are the Shabbas, you hear children of the jungle, my unquote. Uh, Vandana Shiva also quote um, in her book, Staying the Life, Women, Ecology and Survival in India, when she says, um, women in India are an intimate part of nature, both in imagination and in practice. At one level, nature is symbolized as the embodiment of the feminine principle, and at another, she is nurtured by the feminine to, to produce life and pro provide sustenance, and I unquote. Uh, like as a mother nurturers, Cares and provides sustenance to her family, forest is the fountain of the livelihood of the Shabba community. The Jota says to Mukanda, and I quote, the forest itself is our mother. She gives us fruits, flowers, tubes, leaves, wood, honey, raisin, etc. She gives us everything, keeps us alive. Doesn't that make her our mother? I unquote. The tribal women owing to their locus among the forests, make them consider nature as a source of beauty and embrace forest products to enhance their appearance. Uh, fully in the novel, who, who's the Shabbar woman, uh, who, who wear ornaments made from the forest. I quote, in her earlobes hung earrings made of tender young palm fronds, and there were thick wooden bangles on her arms, I unquote. Jota was a wise old woman and leader of the Shabbas who also prefers to embellish herself with forest products. And I quote from the novel, she wore wooden bangles on her wrist, a necklace of gum, acacia seeds, and earrings made of young palm leaves. I unquote. The tribal women uh, experience, more, uh, experience more affinity with the nature by virtue of their material reality. They sustain through their entire dependence upon the forest for their daily bread. So, uh, organic organism entails, also entails well being and wholeness of the entire community and not preaches separatist practices. Devi has precisely portrayed this aspect in her novel. Shabbos also stick to the sustainable living and not harming their surroundings for the greed. Therefore, even when they hunt and kill animals, they are not authorized to kill deer during their mating time, as the Bhayachandis wished. And I quote, this they say is the time for the deer to mate. Any Shabbat who kills a deer during this period with Abhaya's curse upon him. I unquote. Understandably, Shabbos are concerned about the survival and well-being of the entire community and their environment. So thus, the, book, the, the novel, Book of the Hunter, depicts the tribal women are emotionally and materially dependent on nature. Development activities like the construction of dams and enforcement of tribal land render them homeless and landless, which eventually disrupt their life. And moreover, they are most marginalized who are exploited by the upper caste and by their own tribal patriarchy, as in the case of Fumi. So these women, when removed from the natural environment, has nowhere to rely on and live a life of uh, suffering and hardships. The novel project tribal women as storehouse of indigenous knowledge by virtue of, of their locus and affinity with nature, such as the Jota. And consequently, to, uh, and I conclude that organic womanism as a critical framework traces the relationship between the, with the tribal women and nature and, uh, and nature and maps the predicaments as well as the exploitation of tribal land in the novels. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Tanya. And I would like to wind up the session, the technical session 11. And 
we've started with English language as the voice of voice of voiceless and uh, uh, we have seen about the subjugation of women in uh, novels Af Afghan Af American novel and uh, uh, Bessie Hitt's short stories and also some of the the lastly we have concluded with uh, uh, Mahashweta Devi's novel and it it, it, it is wonderful session because it, it has a wide range of uh, discussions we have how women are subjugated and how women are treated in the society and how the even the language has been become the voice of the voiceless thank you so much all the presenters you have done a very good job and i'll i i would like to thank the organizer and uh, dr mahalakshmi ma'am for her for her support and thank you very much thank you one and all ma'am mahalakshmi ma'am i just hand over the session to you mahalakshmi ma'am Ma'am, Indu, Indu, are you there, ma'am? Mahalakshmi, ma'am. Mahalakshmi, ma'am, is here, ma'am, but she's mute. She's in mute. Yeah, it seems. OK, uh, I think it's time to proceed with the next session, I think. OK, ma'am, OK. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, I welcome next session's chairman, uh, Dr. J. Shripatma Devi, ma'am. Ma'am, I think you are here in the meeting. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So it's my pleasure to introduce the chairperson for the session, Dr. J. Shri Padma Devi, Assistant Professor, Department of English, PSG College of Arts and Science. She's a certified trainer in business at Kid Course offered by Cambridge University London. Under her guidance, one candidate received P. M. Phil Jihiri. Currently, she is guiding three research scholars. Uh, she published 13 UGC approved research articles and five research papers in conference proceedings. And she also published her book chapters, articles, poem, and short story. She actively participated in many national and international level conference, seminars, and workshops. She is also a member of various academic bodies, committees, college journal, editorial board. Ma'am, you can now proceed with the session. Thank you, Endo. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible, ma'am. Yes, thank you. And uh, before moving on to the session, thank you so much for your warm welcome, Indu. And uh, I'm extremely delighted to be a part of this international conference. Before moving on to the session, I wish to register my heartfelt thankfulness to the management, to the Department of English, and special thanks to Mahalakshmi, ma'am. With this note of uh, gratitude, let us move on to the session. Uh, before moving on to the session, a uh, gentle reminder to the presenter, uh, the maximum time limit could be eight minutes. So try your best to finish within that uh, time limit and followed by two minutes of discussion. So shall we move on to the first presenter? Uh, Indu ma'am, could you please help me uh, to find out the name list ma'am? Because Mahalishmi ma'am said ma'am will be calling out the names. Okay ma'am, okay ma'am. Wait a yes, second ma'am. Ma yes ma'am. Thank you so much ma'am. First presenters, Neha J, second MA English, Don Bosco College, Elegri Hills, Tripatur. Whether anyone is like that? Good evening, everyone. Yes, good evening. Mm. 
And thank you for giving me an opportunity to present in the International Conference, ma'am. The title of my paper is going to be Racism in Origin Laws for Power. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are audible. You are audible. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm presenting my title as Racism in Origin Laws for Power. Um, as we all know, she is a black woman born on 18th February 1934. She is an Afro-American writer in New York. Uh, I, to a Caribbean migrate so that she was more focusing on the pain of the black and, and on the oppressed people. And in all of her works, most of her works, she concentrates on the themes of racism, domination of the white, injustice given to the black, and equality between black and white. Um, the most important thing that I like in us because, um, is that she used to memorize poetic lines and used to recite them in public. Uh, it might, I think this might be one of the reasons that she is a writer today of this century. Um, to tell about the poem, um, the whole poem talks about the real incident that took, pay, took place in Queens, New York, on 20th of April, 1973. Um, it's all about um, the policeman who was 37 years old, shot a young boy who was 10 years old because he was in black color. Um, and this line is also evident in the poem that he has told he has not seen the size of the boy or or anything else but the color. That color made him to kill that small boy. And, and the white people, that is the part that the policeman had, made him to escape from this case. And the power that the boy's mother had, the small boy's mother had, made her only to dig a graveyard for a child. It's big. Nowadays, it's not up to what um, what right or wrong thing that happens in the world. It's all up to who's powerful. The only powerful men, the powerful people actually takes what uh, decision should be. Mm, every like most of them believe that racism is what like color discrimination, this thing, they go like that. But every, like, when an individual is being affected or hurted by a word or an action, that itself is racism. With that, I gave an um, example that has taken place in India itself. Um, this poem is actually written in 1973, but it's not yet for, I mean, it's more than 40 years, but still the, there is also another racist attack, same as this poem. Um, we all remember that uh, Nido Tanya's attack in Delhi, 2014, and this boy was from Arunachal Pradesh. He was killed by shopkeepers because his hassle was different. Um, the shopkeeper, the, even the policemen did not stop them. They took that boy for two hours from there but don't know what happened. They brought him back again to the same place. And those shopkeepers bet him with a rod and they killed him horribly. So this is the same thing that had happened in Queens, New York also. 40 years had been gone, but then nothing had changed. And there are so many attacks, uh, racist attacks that have been taking place every day in our day-to-day -day life. And we only law and court cannot uh, eradicate them. But we can try to stop by starting from within oneself to our children and to our family. So I have concluded my paper with the Tony Morrison words that there is no such thing as race, none. There's just a human race 
scientifically and anthropologically. Thank you, Ma'am Kasa. Very good, uh, Sneha. Good presentation. I especially I liked your conclusion, concluding line. Very effective. I could say that a kind of a uh, vision or message through your presentation. Very good, Sneha. Thank now you. the room is open for uh, discussion. Any question or clarification? Good choice of uh, your uh, selection. It's good. Nice poem. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Can we move on to the next presenter, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. We'll move to the next presenter, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Kartikaini, uh, Mrs. N. Kartikaini and Dr. Lata Rani. Yes, ma'am. I'm ready, ma'am. Ma yes, ma'am. You can present your paper. Yes, ma'am. A very good evening to one and all present here. It is indeed my privilege uh, to present my paper on new image of woman in Chitra Banerjee Divakarni's before we visit the goddess. So begin with, I would like to offer a brief introduction about the author Chitra Banerjee Divakarni, who is a remarkable voice in Indian diaspora. Her work, works occupy a distinctive place in the realm of contemporary Indian diasporic writing. Throughout her creative career, she has produced a variety of literary works catering to the needs of both children and adult readers. And for children, uh, the famous work is The Conch Bearer. And she has written in different genres like poetry, uh, like everybody everybody would remember, Living and Leaving Yuba City, Dark Like the River. And Arranged Marriage is one of her famous short story collections. And uh, to talk about novels, she has written Queen of Dreams, Mistress of Spices, one amazing thing, etc. But all these works are based on different and varied themes. And that is the uniqueness of Chitra Banerjee. Having born in Kolkata, she has lived in India for 19 years. And this has really shaped her thoughts based on Bengali culture and tradition. Like among other modern generation immigrant writers, she occupies an advantageous position. Because having lived in India throughout her childhood, has uh, given a personal experience to the culture of India and uh, that provides her with more authenticity and authority. Like any other diasporic writer, she also talks about dislocation, homelessness, adaption, acceptance and assimilation. And we all know that these diasporic experiences are quite complex and they are related to the roots of the native land. But all these writers, they strive for acculturation and assimilation of their characters which has a very great impact on the psychological and social well-being of an individual. Chitra Banerjee's work addressed the major concern, the diasporic discourse related with displacement and the painful experience of the immigrants who seek for knowledge or job opportunity. All her women characters are generally architects of their own life and destiny. Here I am reminded of uh, Panjali of the Palace of Illusions who makes a series of choices of her own. And of course, she is in no way less or uh, inferior to that of Bhim or Arjuna. Most of the works of Chitra Banerjee are uh, autobiographical. Having lived in a multicultural world, she makes an amazing synthesis of both East and the West in her novels. She also offers a clarion call to women of all sexes for awakening and empowerment. Like in my novel, Before we Visit the Goddess, she talks about three generation of immigrants. Like first generation of immigrants, uh, they, like, they consider relocation as a painful process. Uh, they suffer owing to identity crisis, cultural estrangement, rootlessness, and unfulfilled desire of their native land. The second and third generation immigrants, they oscillate between past and present. So naturally, they could not fix themselves either as Americans or Indians. In Before We Visit the Goddess also, she presents three strong women, namely Sabitri, Bella and Tara. All the three belong to three different generations 
and they also strive for self identity acceptance and recognition in the male chauvinistic society this novel centers on the diverse struggle of women in india and us chitra banerji displays a deeper understanding of the female psyche and she also points out the patriarchal oppression of women in this world she also assures that women in the world are capable of fighting all forms of subjugation moreover they are also aware of the ways and means of relieving the fetters or the shackles that uh, devoid their liberation this novel proclaims that proper education and self confidence are enough for women to emerge as liberated and self reliant individuals to exemplify the fight for social political and economic norms she has portrayed sabitri as an icon of emancipation of indian women initially sabitri is portrayed to be docile and obedient but she evolves to be decisive and assertive at the end of the novel hardships and failures in life make sabitri mature enough to accept reality but not only exception she also fights against the patriarchal regime which determines the life and choice of an widow even in the mid 19th century Bella and Tara are portrayed as interpreters of dislocation, alienation, and marginalization of immigrant women. Unlike Mother Sabitri, Bella is not a prudent decision maker. She is very much emotional and vulnerable, breaks down easily, and is unable to withstand infidelity and deception. Throughout her life, she is tormented by the childhood guilt of separating her parents. Like I would like to remind. Uh, bella who actually she was the person who revealed about her mother's affair with another person because of that her parents were divorced so uh, this guilt remained throughout her life and tormented her and it also affected her education which naturally brought about a physical and psychological trauma for her in the new land in spite of all that she strives she explores for new possibilities realization reconciliation and fulfillment through these characters Divakar ne emphasizes the importance of education for women emancipation of women both inside and outside their houses or india or any part of the country seems to be her fundamental focus sabitri bella and tara all the female characters they redefine feminine archetype initially she presents them as normal human beings with their own strengths and weaknesses but as the novel progresses uh, they really establish their identity Divakarni herself has stated in an interview with the Times of India that her protagonists emerge out of a desire to portray women as powerful and intelligent forces in the world. The, her protagonists fight subjugation and they move beyond frontiers built around them. At this juncture, I am reminded of Simone de Beauvoir, who propagates in the second sex that to gain the supreme victory. it is necessary for one thing that by and through their natural differentiation men and women unequivocally affirm their brotherhood of course divakarni uh, before we visit the goddess is also a perfect example for this like all the three women characters sabitri bella and tara have their male counterparts to lend them a supporting hand in their times of distress Uh, divakarni also confirms that this dream is not too far she believes that men or women are complementary to each other for instance sabitri's bipin bella's kenneth and tara's venkata chalabadi are typical representative of this great vision sabitri is a perfect example of women who enjoyed the first first wave of feminism in india her daughter bella represents remarkable change of 1980s of indians who flooded the west in search of promising job opportunities and portals of higher education tara represents a daring american woman of the millennium who exhibits specific qualities of second generation immigrants the main focus of the novel is about the growth of women from ignorance to enlightenment and this enlightenment is given a clear picture in the novel of course there are certain pangs of uh, being an exile but in spite of all that there is a ray of hope the novel points out the necessity of education which is the foundation of women empowerment and i understand that chitra banerji has resolute interest on that sabitri stubbornness in continuing education and the bitter experiences of sabitri in leela mai's uh, house who discovers her relationship with her son uh, she was literally thrown out of the street but there was one bipin who actually helped her who lended her a supporting hand and enabled her to continue her education and he is a mathematics professor 
and uh, uh, this was uh, this was uh, easy enough for her to gain her empowerment she fought she even at one stage she even fought against her husband's company who refused to pay compensation after his death in a fire accident and that was considered to be a very brave act in that century and it was even published in the art newspaper as an article along with her photo sabitri even begins a sweet shop and becomes an entrepreneur she names the shop after her mother durga and becomes a very successful business woman but soon disturbance comes to her in the form of her daughter bella who risks her own life and flees to america in order to marry her uh, sanjay and for that she even discontinues her studies both sanjay and bella struggle a lot in usa because of their illegal immigrant status and that represents the plight of middle class women in the west who went abroad without professional qualification she even took up the job of a job uh, a babysitter her daughter sara overcomes the challenging situation caused by her father sanjay who actually deserted her mother bella as uh, she was at the verge of uh, discontinuing her education but then she got the help or uh, the association of dr venkata selapathy another economic professor from india who visited states for some academic pursuits the unexpected compassion that she received brought about a change of attitude in sara's life so here i would like to remind that uh, by portraying the characters of two professors once again chitra banerji Uh, insists on the necessity of education and the role of educated people in the society so uh, like where as pointed out earlier all the three women sabitri bella and sara had their own setbacks but soon they regained their consciousness and they explored the ways and means that would help them to come out of their shackles and emerge as new men, new women and uh, this is pointed out in or uh, mostly in all of the novels of divakarni uh, though her uh, women have their own drawbacks but soon uh, they they realize their potential divakarni's aesthetic sensibility merges with her social commitment and this makes her more insightful of all the diasporic writers her entire writing is viewed as an approach towards life she believes that literature should be inspirational it should not only reflect reality but should also inspire people to create a new reality and this great vision is the central focus of her writing she has achieved excellence by creating realities that enlarge and widen possibilities of dissolving even man made boundaries and i also understand and i also firmly believe that her novels are not only preachy but she believes that mutual love and respect for one another would definitely make this world a beautiful place to live in that is what i wanted to share today thank you so much for this opportunity thank you ma'am excellent presentation kartikeyani very good thank you so much ma'am nice. thank you a detailed analysis of uh, chitra banerjee divakarni's um, work before yes, that your way of uh, the way you began your introduction and the way you carried especially with reference to you mentioned uh, samandi bova second sex it's good yeah, okay this is how yeah. the research scholar should present the paper i Thank wish to acknowledge uh, your reference with that it's really nice good keep it up and all the very best for your uh, research further Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank yes. you, ma'am. Very good. Very good. Really I enjoyed your. Ma'am. Yes, yes. I enjoyed your presentation too. Very good. Thank Everything so is much. very nice. Good. Keep it up. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. Thank yes, you, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. So only appreciation. Any other uh, comment? Okay. So without taking because of the time constraint, we are moving to the next presenter. Yes, ma'am. Next presenter is. Uh... Parmar da Dathri, B.A. English, Ara yes, Mopara Arts College. Yes, ma'am. Dathri, are you here? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Yes. You can start your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Is my presentation visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Okay. A very good evening to all of you. Uh, my name is Thatri Parma. I am a student of Bachelor of Arts last year from R R Motor Arts College, S P I M K B. Today, my topic of the presentation is racial bias and social discrimination in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Here is a, a table of content. 
talking about the present time society continues to make discrimination based on ethnicity race sex or gender or other characteristics that should have no bearing on people's achievement or well being the plot of novella heart of darkness by joseph conrad center around the sea farer named marlo and his journey up to the congo river and his exploits there during a time of imperialism once marlo joined the company as a captain for a ship heading the congo to trade he encounters intense of oppression of the african natives by member of the company in the recent years the state of marlo and even conrad's opinion on race have been questioned due to the thematic element of oppression of black and white presented in this work though heart of darkness by joseph conrad to be a novel with a racist understone and offensive view of african imperialism it illustrates the discovery of a new world and a new people by european in 19th century with the imperialist take opposed to the racist when marlo arrives at congo river he is exposed to the corruption of imperialism by witnessing the destruction and torture in the inflicts on the africans his journey is not only into the heart of darkness geographically but also into human devilish nature as marlo considered the savagery the utter savagery all the mysterious life of wilderness the steers in the forest in the jungle in the heart of wildness this dialogue represents the reality of the heart of darkness it also reveals the darker side of western civilization as well such as kurz says terrifyingly the horror the horror if we are talking about what is racial bias and social discrimination racial bias is when you are biased against someone due to their race for example when white person has a racial bias against black person when all other things are equal we cannot discriminate people or we cannot be biased by someone without any just a race a thing like a race uh, talking about the social discrimination social discrimination is defined as a sustained inequality between individuals on the basis of illness disability religion sexual orientation or any other measure of diversity which is totally uh, natural or we can say that it is a totally geographically conditions we cannot discriminate people by that if we are talking about particularly in the novel where is the uh, some of the uh, dialogues and the incidents where the reflect uh, reflection of the racial bias and social, social discrimination is constantly showing that when marlo arrives at congo river he explores the dark side of the uh african peoples uh, whatever the company's people are doing with the the people of other western floated says that marlo is of course a subdivision of conrad's personality it is quite ironic that kurz is asked to make a report on international society for the suppression of the savage custom even though he is the one who is oppressing kurz is the most brutal among the all colonizer he places natives head on the stakes because of participating in in unspeakable rights and says exterminate all the groups at the end of his document on the civilization marlo supposes company's mission on civilization in africa as mere phased but he also think that empires cannot be built without the activity that he is witnessing in congo visuals and auditory images such as pilgrims gunfires broken leaf dotage possibility of sudden onslaught and massacre brutal instinct all these words are suggest dread senseless devastation and inhumanity to man and imperious to desire of this person particularly in the novel if we are talking that marlo's one of the dialogue in the novel is that uh, marlo described the appearance of european as a light stretched collar white cuff snowy trouser clean necklace varnished boot hair brushed oil while on the other hand he described african as he implies that the black shadow of disease and starvation lying confusedly in the greenish gloom dying like flies all the situation of the african is just because of the company's uh, whatever the uh, operation which was uh, doing at that time on the uh, african people so in this marlo with this help of this dialect we can clearly see the discrimination which is uh, showing by this dialogue of the marlo 
native thinks that the curse is their god they are like god like power and he is in reality he is the mon- monster is to them they have no power to the rest because they are somewhere like a subaltern if we are talking about the russian trader one of the, his dialogue is that you do not talk with that man you only listen to him which implies that the weak can only survive by compromising the power native expect the region of terror of curse without having the strength of challenge he is colonized monster who is thirsty for ivory raids villages steals ivory shoots rebels and make them example of the rest curse is obsessed with his ownership as he say my ivory my river my intended my station at the end of novel marlow say the tranquil waterway which exhibit african silence over disastrous occurrence of uh, racism and imperialism we can see that marlow used a uh, disparaging word for uh, describing african under personalities such words like unspeakable rights stenic italy brutal monstrous figureful implacable insurable evil and this kind of uh, words are reflecting somewhere that uh, contrasts uh we can say that conrad's discriminative mindset or social discrimination are still going on the throughout the novel on the one hand joseph conrad plays trick with the language of portrays african as beast while on the other hand humanizes european in the political novella heart of darkness it compromises words that are unable to express reality due to uncertainty of the language such as marlow's this word are representing the uh, racial mentality or uh, social discriminate mentality of this uh, in this we can also say that in the conclusion we can say that eventually throughout the novella discrimination reflect and it show that it happened not even 19th or 20th century but still in the present time in the novella african are judged by their color lifestyle and language in the novels african were subaltern and had no like we see the russian trader and other africans they are not able to speak against the authority of kurz and marlo or as a company's people color is fact and it is just because of a geographical condition language is also a natural factor we cannot discriminate in the basis of color lifestyle or language so the people have right to their life without any oppression or in freedom so the color is basically the fact or a reality so we cannot discriminate people or we cannot be a uh, bias through their uh, color or their language so here is i'm uh, concluding my presentation here is i'm putting some their work references and uh, thank you so much for providing me today's of presentation very good presentation parva datri thank you ma'am a good presentation and i think you are in your undergraduation right Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. this yes, is my yes. very first experience oh, of uh, very presentation. good, very good. Always first is very special. Very good, very good. Yes, really ma'am. good analysis. Okay, I wish to I wish to appreciate regarding your uh, presentation. Good, you have uh, selected some of the pictures to convey the meaning of how uh, Marlow has undergone or the suffering of Marlow. It's been very effective with your uh, pictures which you have included in the presentation, and I would like Thank to you, appreciate ma'am. on your uh, part. of there is where you have dealt with the narration it's very good because uh, as you will agree parva everything the narration is very important right the, with the way yes, we yes. narrate okay so very good choice that you have elaborated on that especially you have taken all the words which uh, effectively conveyed the pain or the suffering of marlo very good i wish to appreciate that and yes. one suggestion datri since you said this is yes, your ma'am. first uh, presentation yes, one suggestion uh whenever you're going for presentation uh regarding the slide no maybe you can concentrate on uh, instead of giving a kind of paragraph like or many lines are continuing right so instead of that maybe you yes. can go for a synoptic outline of what you wish to convey okay this is again okay, a suggestion okay, for your betterment okay since you said this is your okay point. okay thank you ma'am Uh, yes, it will uh, help me oh yes yes that just for that okay, okay. very good uh, presentation that we keep it up thank you ma'am thank you so much yes yes so we'll move to the next presenter shamila yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am
Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Yes, ma'am. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers and chairperson for allowing me to present the paper in this platform. My topic for today's presentation is the quest for identity, the reconfiguring the self in Preeti Shanoi, the secret wish list. Preeti Shanoi is an Indian author and also a poet. She is a multifarious writer. Her focus is on both fiction and non-fiction. She is one of the author among the top five highest selling authors in India. She has honored with Indian of the Year Award by Brands Academy and she has received Business Excellence Award by New Delhi Management Institute. She has been nominated for the Forbes Long List of the Most Influencing Celebrities of India since 2013. Chennai has authored around 15 novels so far. She has made human relationship as a center of her fictional subject. The Secret Wishlist is a gripping narrative that many married women in India have experienced. The reader can easily connect them and sympathize with the protagonist, her suffering and her quest for individuality. The narrative depicts a woman's struggle in a patriarchal world where her own desires have no place. Marital disharmony and gender discrimination. Women have been discriminated in society as a result of the perception that they are weak, delicate and sensitive. In the name of gender disparity, women continues to confront injustice, humiliation, trauma, harassment, oppression and subordination. A marital life can at times help women to achieve her dreams and sometimes it may lead her to the worst conditions. Women nowadays have almost everything at home except for freedom and self-fulfillment. Women serve their husband as maid servants rather than as life partners. They want to be self-sufficient. They are not entirely concerned with family responsibilities. The very fact that a woman, may it be a doctor, a wife or a mother, is accepted to be always the giver. They are expected to sacrifice every bit of their desire if it doesn't satisfy the male section of society. Shanai highlights the problem, of, the problem of marital discord and marital rape, which majority of Indian women silently suffers without complaining just because of the fear of the society. Women are taught to uphold the marriage customs and act in ways what the men demands. A woman's aspiration may occasionally be reinforced by marriage, but it may also lead to the worst issues such as despair, psychological trauma, and sexual harassment. In this particular, no particular novel, The Secret Wishlist, Diksha is the protagonist. She takes whatever is imposed upon her, first by her parents and then by her husband. Her husband Sandeep is an insensitive, traditional and self-centered guy. He has no emotional connection neither with his mother nor with, nor with his wife or son. He is portrayed as a chauvinistic man who only thinks about his own interest and disregards those of his wife. Diksha was a clever and open-minded girl when she was a teenager. But her life has changed completely after her marriage. Being married in almost 15 years, she is always at home to take care of the house, doing household things and raising the kids while her husband became the breadwinner. She is entirely dependent on her husband and subservient to him. She didn't have time for herself to make friends and do the things she wants. So she thought her life was worthless and meaningless. As an Indian wife, she is unable to protest, discuss or even speak to her husband about her marital troubles or difficulties. Through the character of Diksha, Shana shows the helplessness, irritation, anger, frustration of Indian women in a conservative society. Quest for identity and reconfiguring the self. A sense of self and a distinct identity are lacking from Diksha. She would rather be recognized as her own self than as the daughter, wife or mother of another person. Apart from these roles, she is truly nothing. The connection between a husband and wife is portrayed as one of ruler and slave. In reality, marrying a woman grants the husband the freedom to do anything he pleases with or without her permission. Due to an early marriage, Diksha is not getting an opportunity to complete her education by her parental pressure. Here, the author wants to highlight the bitter reality that many women 
being in conventional families are not allowed to make their careers or pursue their education. Shanai also depicts the life of an educated and independent woman through her cousin Viba. On the other hand, Diksha, who couldn't complete her education and got engaged into responsibilities. But she was supported and encouraged by her mother-in-law when she wanted to learn salsa dance. Diksha became aware of her aspiration after conversing to her friend and she wants to accomplish her goals and strike off all the things in her wish list. As time has progressed, she has started her quest for individuality and personal identity, shoving aside the traditional self-sacrificing and self-denying women. The term a new woman in today's culture is categorized as someone who doesn't fit into conventional circles, who is independent of thought, capable of making decisions, ready to guide others, and above all, who designs her life to be the best. Here, Diksha turns out to be so expressive, gains confidence, and ultimately finds her voice by the end of the novel. She takes control over her life and decides to leave her husband because she is psychologically affected by her husband's expectation. But at last, she recognizes the value of self-discovery and wants to live her life on her terms. Thank you, ma'am. Good presentation, Shamla, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes, a uh, nice choice too. Wish list, good. Uh, detailed analysis of uh, what happened to the protagonist, good. Uh, again, ma'am, the suggestion uh, to you also the same. Uh, when it comes to PowerPoint presentation, uh, better you can avoid sentence and you can go for uh, hints, ma'am, for your further okay, presentation. Okay, ma'am. Okay, yes, okay, yes ma'am. Ma ma Fine, ma'am. Really good. Nice presentation. Thank you, Shamala, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So we are moving on to the last presenter, Devendra Kumar. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You can begin. Yes, yes, yes. A very good evening to all of you. And I am very grateful to Chairperson, ma'am, and Mahalakshmi, ma'am. My top, I am Devendra Kumar Yadav, a research scholar from Lalit Narayan Mithila University, Dharbhanga, Bihar. My topic is the problem of cultural and religious identity in James Sinzay's plays. The contribution of us and Lady Augusta Gargari are too well known to need further comment. The agenda was set by W.B. Acts and Lady Augusta Gargari to revive the glory of Ireland through the revival of Irish legend and its ancient importance and followed by subsequent seas decline. However, they wanted to stress the importance of Irish drama on aesthetic ground without dealing with politics, agitation, and leanings, without overt politics. Singh was advised by us to return to Ireland and visit Aran Islands and write about the people of living in those coastal areas. Singh took the advice seriously and gathered detailed information about the impoverished peasant, marginalized character, tramps, tinkers, and other wandering people. Because of hostile and unpredictable weather, however, a close look at Sinjay's place showed that he did not follow SA's guidelines completely. Hence, a close study of Sinjay's sixth place is quite necessary in order to have a close conception of Sinjay's own outlook and attitude to the Irish people living in seclusion and facing various problems of identity crisis and cultural shock. He had, of course, studied the European playwright of of his time, like Ibsen, Brecht, and Metterling, as well as the Elizabethan Jacobian playwright of England and some Irish experimenters and patrons who insisted on writing in local dialects. Singh, however, followed a mixed course and wrote in English. 
but captured the rhythm of spoken Irish syntax and expression and addresses methods of evocation, sharing and repeating creation expression, and also using some typical Irish phrases which were actually spoken by inhabitants and wandering beggars, farmers, thinkers, and occasional visitors. If we took at Sinjay's dramatic career and early influence and interest, it becomes clear that from the very beginning, he had a magical sense and sensuousness imagination. Similarly, he was equally aware of the dilemma caused by the decline of Irish aristocracy and Catholic beliefs. His first play was failure, and it was strongly criticized. But he took the criticism seriously and tried again, and this time his first play, Shadow of the Glen, was a modest success, and Matthews has shown and T.R. Hen has concurred, he was still criticized for his dramatic language. And he was called a present writer as well as follower of English dramatists and misrepresenting Ireland. But the fact remains that Singe was constantly experimenting his one act, two act, and even three act plays and writing problematic comedies, tragedies of both Greek and Shakespearean Jacobian kind. Not only this, the re, not only this, he re, reinterpreted old stories and folk tales and legends, but set his plays in remote period of history and created a fusion of local and universal elements in play after play. Hence, it is different to classify his plays, his plays within fixed dramatic norms in the shadow of the grain, riders to the sea, and the well of the sand. He uses some local stories and beliefs and transforms them into a world of enduring beauty and deals with certain marginalized and wandering tramps, thinkers, and impoverished people who are unable to cope with the civilized norms of town people. He uses his sense of comic imagination and produce a character and scenes which would now appear to be unreal and primitive, but since use such material for exploring the possibilities of human existence by producing a sense of conflict between man and nature, dream and reality, and wish fulfillment of Christ's illusion. Consequently, his place becomes at once real and Symbolic. Now I am going to conclude. This is true of his best place, his riders to the sea. It is related to man versus nature, the will of the sense. It is related to magic and reality. And the shadow of the gleam, it's related to the tramps and ill matched couple. And his masterpiece, The Playboy of the Western World, it is a satire of Western civilization. And his last play, Deirdre of the Sorrows, uh, it's the um, father of Irish uh, legend like Kuchulin. His characterization of both male and female characters like Nora, Maria, Pegin, Mary, and Sarah, all those are female characters and male characters like Bartley, Dan, and Christy Mahon show his creativity and originality within a narrow range. Similarly, 
his evocative poetic language is at once lyrical and dramatic and shows a happy combination of dramatic prose and poetic prose in terms of dialogue and soliloquy. So that's all, ma'am. Thank you. Good, uh, Devendra Kumar. Nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, good analysis too, especially with the characters. It has been nicely brought and you have justified your title too. Good, good presentation. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes, you. thank you. So uh, as Shakespeare, a myriad-minded uh, dramatist climbed all swell that ends well, we have come to the end of this technical session. Uh, I'm, I really I would like to appreciate the effort taken by all the presenters, uh, Sneha, Kartikeni, uh, Parvar, Shyamala, and Devendra Kumar. Really, all I think tried your best to come up uh, and justify your title uh, for your papers too. Uh, I wish to appreciate all your efforts, and I wish to and I am wishing you all the very best for all your academic endeavors. Uh, for your further uh, research and present more papers and enlighten us as you all did today. Uh, thank you so much, all the presenters. Thank you. And as you all said, okay, let us all stamp our identity, whatever be, okay, because you all said we, we, we need to appreciate our identity. So let us all appreciate our identities, whatever be, and let us all enjoy life too. So with this note of positivity, even though this uh, conference is on subaltern studies, let us move with this positive note that let us enjoy our life, whatever be, let us accept the flow. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the presenters and all the listeners too. Thank you. And I wish to register my heartfelt thankfulness to uh, the management, Department of English, AVP College, especially special thanks to Mahalakshmi, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. I could understand the hectic schedule for uh, of yours for the past two days. Thank you so much, ma'am. Really, I wish to appreciate that too. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Actually, we yes, have to thank you. You have spent a valuable time with us and you shared your know, experience. It's a pleasure, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank yes, you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I thank yes, all the presenters of this session. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Now, let's move on to the next session. Uh, next session, Chairperson, Dr. Bhakya Lakshmi, ma'am. Bhakya Lakshmi, ma'am. Welcome you, ma'am, for this wonderful session. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now I, uh, you know, let's have a small intro about our chapels in Bhakti Lakshmi, ma'am. Uh, Indu. Yes, ma'am. I have the great privilege in introducing this session's chairperson, Dr. Bhakti Lakshmi, Research Department of English, Tripur Kumaran College for Women, Tripur. She has more than sixteen years of teaching. In she has produced six MPhil scholars and currently she is guiding six PhD and three MPhil scholars. She presented papers in various national and international. She published more than 10 articles in UGC careless journals and in peer reviewed. She served as a member in board of study. Also serving as a question paper setter for Badal University and autonomous colleges. She acted as a resource person for a workshop on research methodology. Ma'am, you can now take over the session, ma'am. Thank, you. thank you, ma'am. Is it audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Good evening to all, all the organizing committee and all the participants. Let's move on to the session. First of all, we can invite Vishwapriya to present the paper. Okay. Vishwapriya, you can start. Good evening, everybody. This is Vishwapriya from Don Bosco College, Enigri. I would like to thank everybody for this uh, conference. And I thank uh, professors and chairperson um to give me this opportunity to present and my topic is voice of the subordinate woman in auto code detect poem my husband tangas peter domination with the high hand happens throughout the world 
in different ways and in different situations. Women were subjugated everywhere, both in families and in society. Even even the low caste people uh, subjugated in their families. Women are subjugated more; they suffer more. Uh, so I would like to uh, say the worries, the laments of Lionel in this uh, through this poem. A patriarchy is a term where men hold power over women and they remain subjugated. The author is an Ugandan poet. He is one among the African poets. He wrote three collections of poems, the song of Lino, the song of Okol, and two songs. The, uh, the, my husband, Tangus Peter, is taken from the song, uh, the song of Lino. The, it is an analysis of uh, Lionel's laments. He laments for uh, his own husband. He did not uh, respect her feelings. And she insults both her and her family members, parents, and even uh, he disrespects his own black community. Uh, in the fact, the fact is, he is he is also already a black man. He was civilized. He read uh, intensively, so uh, extensively. So he thinks that he is civilized. He became modern. Uh, so, so he feels that his own culture, own tradition, is utterly harmful. It's a primitive, and he he says that. Uh, his own, but she is not attractive, so he wants a mo modern girl. Uh, so she, he has an affair with a, a girl named Clementine. So she is also a black woman, but she adopts the culture of Westerners. She uh, put makeup, uh, lipsticks. Uh, so she, uh, the descriptions I have given, like uh, she looks, even she is. Um, uh, makeup, uh, but she uh, she feels that uh, it looks like open ulcer. Uh, the author the author gave the words that uh, her the, her husband given to us uh, like her. what he uses the words for her and her parents like he uh, uh, uses. Uh, abusive words, uh, both her and her parents, and he forgets his own culture is exploiting. He thinks is a, a, a culture tradition is uh, it's not fine because he is red. She so he moved to Clementine. So Lavano, Lino laments not only for her personal problems that his husband is not. Uh, Good with her, not respecting her. That that problem is aside, but she feels for the exploitance of her own culture, tradition, and so on. So I want to conclude that learning other language or learning other culture uh, is good for our future, but entirely uh, entirely using or entirely we. Uh, we can't change to other uh, culture because this is our culture. So we can't, if we are going, so we are betraying our own culture. So I have to pictureize that. Now we uh, we Indians are also colonized by, uh, by uh, colonizers. We, even we started like, uh, we adopt uh, some styles of Westerners some culture, some traditions like dresses, like uh, we change, but we have, we should have the thought, uh, have the thought that we, we, by generation, generation to generation, it can exploit. So we have to have aware of our culture, tradition. So that's it, ma'am. Thank you, Viswapriya. Very nice presentation and a good selection of text for this subaltern studies international webinar. Thank you.
so uh, the author btech or called btech uh, says that it is uh, it is a part of culture we have to follow the our own tradition and culture uh, to say our own tradition isn't it okay he expresses feelings through this poem okay thank you vishwapriya very nice presentation now we can call upon hari narayan deka thank you ma'am good evening everyone uh, the title of my uh, today's topic uh, presentation is uh, indigeneity and subalternity contextualizing tamsala house house and lust story so to begin with i would like to give a brief introduction of the author uh, tamsala house the contemporary a uh, creative woman from the northeast she was born in 1945 and died very recently in 2022 she is a poet and a fiction writer and an ethnographer from nagaland northeast india she is also the recipient of sahitya academy award for english writing in the short story category for her work leaven on for my head in 2013 She is also Padmasri Award of 2007 for her contribution to literature and education. Above all, she is a pioneer of the Northeast Indian literature in English. Uh, analyzing her uh, Ausanla's story, uh, I would like to uh, mention that in Ausanla's story, Tamsala Aus protagonist is an indigenous Au Naga lady. Uh, the plot deals with her personal journey from an early forced marriage up to her struggle to being a wife. daughter in law and a mother the protagonist ausanla is a girl loved to go to college and sought intellectual exposure her intellectual journey for self fulfillment has come to an abrupt end at her family as her family pressurized her uh, into marrying an older man from an affluent family devoted to her studies she fights back and tries to get out of this marital alliance but uh, is outnumbered by her family members who do not understand her her journey uh, for, of struggle goes on with patriarchy social taboos cultural barriers family problems and secrets and self doubt this book uh, gives the readers an uncomfortable and uh, helpless situation because of ausanla's character as a meek and obedient wife a voiceless subaltern disrespected even by her husband and her family uh, and adding to that Her adding to her misery, uh, the birth of two baby girls continuously, despite the desperate expectation of the in-laws' family for a boy, makes it a more uh, pathetic situation. Now, indigenity and subalternity, as observed in her text, uh, Ausanla's story is a fiction about an indigenous woman by an indigenous author dealing with women's uh, subjugation and patriarchal hegemony. This woman protagonist revolves around indigenous socio-cultural and socio-economic spaces within the realms of nationhood. The first half of the book gives us the sad but a true picture of the Naga society, afflicted by the belief and practice of ignorant traditions, customs, and superstitions. When Ausanla comes to comes close to forming a friendship with a uh, the family physician, uh, Dr. Kilang, the social taboos do not permit her to do that. with a man who is not a family member however the readers can rejoice with the changes or the transformation of the plot that takes place from the second half of the book when ausanla becomes more determined and strong to have a voice in the family as well as in the society uh, now contextualizing uh, indigeneity and subalternity her story uh, is a bitter experience of many women uh, for all the ages for all the places born in an unprivileged family a marriage to a rich man's son uh, was a, was an ideal choice for her dad to force his daughter to marry when she was yet to finish her college education so this story is not only about uh, an indigenous naga girl but of many women as it heartbreaks all human beings This fictional story depicts how tradition and customs can still exert mounting pressure on people's lives in this seemingly modern generation. This is a story of a woman whose journey to search for her true self gives the readers the confidence to be in control of the circumstances. 
The Naga society is essentially patriarchal. The males are always the decision makers. The rules assigned to women are strictly defined by the traditions. So gender-based regulations of Naga society uh, affect several of the important life aspects, their education, religion, property, politics, etc. So besides the Aonaga customary laws and uh, these customary laws they always uh, make the women deprived of their uh, various rights and positions in the society. So to conclude, ma'am, uh, Aosinla's story highlights the status of women uh, in the indigenous uh, and patriarchal Naga society. The patriarchal domina domination is evident in the Naga society where women have social subjugation and subordination. Tamsola House representation of the marginalized group definitely uh, unveils the miserable treatment of women in a society. Although the story revolves around the uh, incidents of Nagaland, but uh, they certainly have a greater relevance as this can be found throughout the Northeast region. Moreover, uh, these stories are the unheard voices of the subaltern from each corner of the globe. So Ausenla's story presents an interesting and thought-provoking team which might help one to clear the air of uncertainty hovering in the minds of many who sought the answer to equality and justice. So thank you, ma'am. This was from Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Harinara and Deka. It's a very nice presentation. And you have spoke on indigenous uh, stories of uh, Nagaland, especially uh, the representation of women in Naha society uh, through the Asunala story. Yes, Thank you, yes. sir. You have uh, given a very nice presentation and your ideas are uh, very much eagerly invited by the organizers, especially to this uh, uh, conference. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next, we can invite Mr. Devendra Pam Malikarjum. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. I'm ready, ma'am. Uh, I'm ready, ma'am. Yes, sir. You can yeah, start. Go. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my, 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 the, the title of the paper is The Resistance and Identity, a Post-Colonial Feminist Study of Ismail Chukta's Fiction. The major concern of this paper is to look uh, look Ismail Chukta's works through a post-colonial uh, post feminist lens who reconstruct the patriarchal culture and uh, patriarchal culture by examining the socio-political and economic uh, conditions of women and reconstruct the lost identity of third world women. So, Isma Chuktai, one of the dominant and uh, recognized literary figures in the Indian subcontinent, she has brought a new vision and created a new dimension not only in Indian uh, literature but uh, the world literature as well. Her art is the art of life sex, wherein she attempts to revolutionize the Indian society in general and the women's world in particular. Uh, uh, women's world in particular, hegemony, resistance, and revolt, identity, and marginalization are some predominant ideas and themes which uh, Chuktai debates in her writings. Born in uh, British India, Chukta raises the voice of double marginalized women in the subcontinent who is not only suppressed by her own people but also by the colonial powers. Chukta is through her narratives uh, demonstrate how th uh, the women in general and Muslim women in particular have been hegemonized by the patriarchal and colonial forces. Identity which, uh, which, which is very diverse and complex creation in the, uh, in the social and political discourse has been come under the question by the author. Through her, uh, through her characters, she attempts to show the resistance under the colonial regime against the male-dominated society. In her novel, The Crooked Line, she portrays the highly disturbing experience of the marginalized, marginalized masses. Uh, the character Shaman, who symbolizes the Chukta's own life and in, in this way, author uses Shaman uh, as her own mouthpiece. She revolts, resists and hits back to the colonial patriarchal system which has taken everything under their control. She is an innocent child. Who turns, uh, who turns to be rebellious and hy hyperactive when she is being ignored and marginalized. Uh, she never succumbs to be lies to uh, lies of others because someone felt as if she had been orphaned. She was feeded by wet nurse Una and was taken care by a uh, uh, buddy Appa. Uh, so portraying this kind of character of Shaman, Jukta indirectly uh, uh, slams the mainstream feminist who has been sidelining the uh, third world women and overlook uh, their marginality and suppression which has which is uh, harsher and crueler than the oppression which which the uh, western women uh, face the following lens uh, shows that male dominated oppression and the colonized women's resistance when the narrator says uh, i quote and unquote 
Manju cursed and scolded her. Shaman had been experiencing a desire to hit people. So, uh, suddenly, for no apparent reason, she was beset uh, with this uh, urge to hit, uh, urge to hit someone, to knock and crush somebody uh, with her chubby fist. She felt the urge to strike and uh, strike her doll. First, uh, first she gave it a few mild cautionary slaps, but then she lost control and began to pummeling and uh, kicking the doll with her hands and feet. Soon she was shredding with, shredding with with uh, with her teeth and nails, behaving as though she were face to face, to face with a uh, menacing adversary. Here. Uh, double marginalization can be seen when uh, shaman is being treated as other and ignored. She feels emotional crisis and mental trauma because the worst experience with, uh, which she gets from the uh, from her surroundings. She feels all the time isolated and dejected. It is the reason she turns out to be rebellious against the male oppression and feels that she would be seized with the desire to strike somebody. The author portrays the character of double uh, double oppressed uh, Indian woman who fears like uh, shaman and does, does does find a way to express herself the door of uh, women liberation of the west seems seems also closed for the such vices because they were not uh, being heard there uh, like someone who who wanted to be wife out the frightful marks and it is placed new line a neat uh, and calm line in this regard one of the uh, critic opens uh, op one of the critic opens in feminism and contemporary indian uh, women's writing uh, i quote and unquote the Indian women's identity is often riddled with a sense of insecurity. This is because in patri patriarchal, patriarchal society like ours, she is uh, denied rules even in her um, parental family. In most part of Indian daughters are considered pariah than an alien's wealth and excluded from her full membership and their fatal families after marriage. Even in her marital form, her rights are fragile. In case of breakdown of her marriage, she can be she can be easily she can easily be turned out of their home. So this is the condition of women uh, are facing even in a contemporary society. In her, in her another novel, The Masum, which is published in 1961, portrays the causes and consequences of society, uh, social setup and the inter interrelation between the different members of members of society. Uh, the economic cause is one of the major causes shown by the author during the time of colonial rule and how women be, uh, become a victim and turns into hair lot. Chukta exposes the male hypocrisy and grand narrative which has portrayed women a dangerous creature and uh, the bloat in the society. It is not women's true choice that uh, she, uh, she, she would choo uh, choose the profession of prostitution, but it is the male-dominated society which has compelled her uh, to turn into the into this operation. The narration uh, says, the sorry, the narrator says, I quote and unquote, uh, four months rent servant salaries amount uh, owed by shopkeeper electricity bill, washerman's bill, children's school fees, water rises above my head drowning, I float up and see my living breath 16 years uh, old daughter skipping rope with uh, with her young friends. The above passage indicates the different issues and matters uh, the woman has faced uh, face and her responsibility in the colonized male dominated society. The darkest narrative of uh, the novel uh, reflects the colonized operation of the women's trading women's body and gender inequality. According to the author, the uh, according to the author was at uh, pinnacle during the time of colonial era. The women in the masum experienced double and sometimes triple marginalized marginalization. The core association between colonialism and patriarchy has kept the woman under their thumb and she is deprived uh, her basic uh, right, uh, the basic freedom. Chukta vehemently slams the patriarchal nature of the society. One of the author remarks that uh, patriarchy as a matter of fact holds a potential to dehumanize, uh, uh, dehumanize the other half of history. Patriarchy is operating not only in the personal level but also at the political level. There is a serious interaction between the private matters and different power structure that coexist in the society. So, uh, women uh, who always, especially in the colonial period, become the worst victim of the male subjectivity, fail to raise their voice. Uh, Chukta narrates the tale of a woman who defines her terms in relation to male. Uh, to the male needs in the society. Uh, her social role and the position in society is also assigned by male dominated society. Women is not only looked at as an autonomous being which is free and autonomous but is, is and was dependent on her other beings. Agrawal remarks, uh, one of the critic Agrawal, he remarks, during the childhood, a uh, woman must depend on her father, during youth upon her husband, her husband being dead upon near kinsman of her husband. In default, uh, Upon those of uh, her father, it, uh, if she had no 
personal kinsman upon a sovereign a woman must govern herself as a as she likes uh, so i am concluding my presentation saying that not only masum are the crooked line but chukta uh, chukta uh, every narrative reveals the inner consciousness of the woman character who lives uh, who, uh, whose lives uh, resolve around their dreams and aspiration and they dependent on them uh, she highlights the violence which created by the colonized colonies colonialists and the patriarchs then reveals the concern with the theme of anxiety predicament and anguish and um, anguish by threats to individual identity and in relation to reality her characters find the real world too much insensitive unpleasant and complex there is, there are some intense uh, issues regarding the protagonist and their state of predicament which they are experiencing in their daily routine the women character of chukta's fiction as far for freedom and self identity from the male hegemony and uh, colonial oppression all uh, character of uh, chukta's need freedom and justice uh, to her personality and her individuality which the existing patriarchal setup with the uh, uneven power division does not grant her uh, they were as feroja jishuwala puts uh, in her poem uh, fractured none will hold women broken and fragmented afraid to afraid to touch cracked glass like a uh, shard of crystal glassware dropped in the deliberate abandonment of betrayals wrought by callous men grief is painful to contemplate in purple penisiness uh, this is uh, my concluding words now thank you thank you mr devendra pa mallikarjun it's a very nice presentation and i appreciate your work thank I you ma'am to your re research work for uh, for the proceedings and you have given the ideas of ismat uh, chukta's fiction all the feministic aspects of her fiction thank you so much your presentation is very neat and clear okay okay thank you ma'am thank you so much now we can invite mr gopi gopi are you there now we can move on to yes gopi yes you can proceed okay ma'am good day everyone the take love my but feminism is a Good day, everyone. The title of my paper, "Feminism in the My Aspen Tank is Better by Pocket Butter." The word culture is so important. Word that is playing its role in the society. Yeah, every culture expected and followed only by the own people, and every culture stands against one another by the own people. The culture itself, something that is being created and they they still believe that 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 hello ma'am am i audible hello yes sir the word culture is so, so important word this poem my aspen tank is written by pocket because the hukadan poet who most all all the time concentrated on his own tradition and culture after colonization in this poem actually taken from the collection of poems called son of lo you know that is the the poem actually taken from a collection of poems called song of love you know and it is been translated and widely read by the nations the theory of feminism where the main female character love you know is not given the respect and treated well by her own husband itself still still 
people that women has been face only the kitchen and they are meant only to sacrifice their happiness for people in the family this is what has been followed for years and centuries and still believed to be followed the conclusion of my paper the education an important case which affect in society and the same culture and the practice stands against the life in society it's, it's going to be the main answer of in this article thank you to all ma'am am audible yes gopi thank, thank you mr gopi and uh, all these research works and uh, studies are uh, made here just to say that we have to avoid the subjugation of women so it should not be followed in the forthcoming days or years or centuries yes ma'am yes ma'am okay now we can go for miss gokula nandini Google and Anthony. I think she is not here, ma'am. Okay. So, can we wind up the session, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Bhatia, ma'am, for spending your valuable session with us. Time Thank you, ma'am. And uh, the report of the uh, session. In this technical session, we have seen different genres, different texts of uh, notable authors of African literature, Indian writing in English, Urdu literature, indigenous literature of Nagaland, etc. We have seen a subordinity expressed in these texts, and I, I appreciate uh, the sincere efforts made by the participants to uh, come, out, come out with new findings. My best wishes to all the participants for their uh, great research career ahead. I uh, sincerely thank to the management department of English of AVP College of Arts and Science for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this international virtual conference on subaltern studies. I especially thank uh, Dr. Yal Mahalashmi to, uh, for thank inviting you. me for this session. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And also, I thank the presenters of this session. The next technical session starts, ma'am. Yes, yes, we can go with the next session. Yes, ma'am. Now, I am happy to introduce the woman behind us with motherly care, special and most important person, Dr. L. Mahalakshmi, ma'am, assistant professor and head AVP College of Arts and Science. She has 14 years of experience in teaching. She is the Senate member of Bardia University and she is also the member in English Language Teaching and Association of India. She, ha she has been the resource person, guest lecturer and chief guest in various colleges. She has also organized numerous guest lectures, seminars, webinars and faculty development programs. We are pleased to have that such eminent personality today. Ma'am, now I request you to move the session along. Thank you, Poitra, ma'am, for uh, your wonderful introduction given to me. Now I invite the presenter, first presenter of the session, Chandrasekhar Srivas uh, and N.K. Swami. Are you here? Next presenter. Kevi Binio Nugile. Yes, ma'am. The participants, presenters. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Will you present now? Okay. Uh, yes. Good evening, everyone. The title of my paper is Ecological Concern and Women's Space in Esterine Curie's Select Works. A poet and novelist, Esterine Curie is a prolific Northeast writer and who captures the attention of the readers through her works. Her writings revolve around the people and the environment of our hometown Nagaland. Son of the Thunder Cloud 2016 is about the traveler narrator, Pelevozo, 
and his journey to find a village of weavers. He is regarded as a carrier of regeneration because the moment he steps in the abandoned village, Ren sets in for which the ancient sisters have been waiting for 300 years. The work represents the picture or future of what will happen to our land if proper measures are not taken to protect the natural resources. Through the great famine that hit Pele's village and swipes away the entire villager, it indicates that nature is equally important for humans to survive. Concern for nature in this novel is presented through the lines, I quote, the earth was so dry that the soil no longer looked like soil. It had cracked apart, the brown color had gone from the soil, and if the traveler were to describe it, he would call it gray, that gray, unquote. The earth will therefore take no time to fade if proper measures to preserve it is not taken. Similarly, Kire presents the picture of nature or the earth when proper care is taken without being disturbed by humankind. I quote, it's called birthing. The earth has birthed trees, rocks, stones, and grain, just as a mother births her offspring. The trees and rocks are the sons of the earth. Take care of them and they will take care of you and your children, unquote. Kire, therefore, through the character Pele, projects that each of us is responsible to, for the smooth functioning of the natural world. An instance is where Pele was required to collect woods to build a house, but he was careful not to cut too many trees in the same area. He did not wish to disturb the fragile ecology. The vegetation was new and young, and he feared that any sudden disturbance of that newly found balance would cause greater damage than could be repaired. Therefore, uh, through this novel, it serves as a reminder to appreciate and preserve nature where it is still when it is still under our control. I quote, even the man would have to be very careful and remember to respect nature, unquote. When the river sleeps, 2014, presents the protagonist, Villiers, who goes out in an adventurous journey to achieve his dream. As the novel sta starts, Villiers states, the forest is my wife, to present the idea that nature provides everything for a man. On his journey, he was advised by the old man to take certain herbs like sienna or bitter wormwood and tierra a soft leafed plant with a rather unpleasant smell. Days without any food, he survived the long journey because of the food that the forest provided him with. The richness of nature and the way it proves to be helpful is projected through this work. Likewise, Sky is my father, 2018, is a beautiful blend of the human lives with that of nature and the environment. The novel brings forth the memory of the battle fought between the Briton and the warrior village of Konoma. I got Konoma nestles amid mountains, unquote, that are as high as 7,000 feet, a little village on a small hillock cradled by gaunt mountains that form a natural fortress. Kiri chronicles the effort of the villagers, the way they have preserved the ecology from the past till the present. The women characters here as well worked tirelessly in the field in spite of the heat and even in such state they did not complain but along with it, along with rain, it takes away all their weariness, unquote, a cold, but a little rain refreshes you and keeps you cool enough to work on, unquote. Uh, nature has been there for a part for long uh, of human life. When Ciso falls ill and prays to Kepenyofo, that is God, he thinks that he will die, but remembers the words of his ancestors. I quote, sky is my father, earth is my mother, I believe in Kepenyofo, unquote. Thus, looking into the three novels, one can say that Kire has needed ecology and literature together to put forward her thoughts and to warn the society of the consequences that may befall if our exploitation of nature continues. To conclude, uh, ecological concern has been one of the major issues that varied writers attempted to portray in their writings to spread awareness on the present environmental condition. Therefore, landscape in a piece of literature does not only convey the meaning of the natural beauty, but also the way man treats nature and how it functions. It is through this kind of works, we as readers are enlightened with what has to be done for the future world so that the next generation do not follow the same pattern. In other words, these works serves as a medicine for the illness that has affected almost all the people. Therefore, this paper uh, is an attempt to redirect the mind of the readers towards the value of nature for men and take into this kind of writing as an awareness as awareness novels. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, ma'am. That was my presentation. Thank you, Nubili. You have presented. Yes, thank you. You have wonderfully presented your uh, ideas on ecological con concern and women's space in the Eastern Terrace select works. Uh, very, uh, due to time constraint, you have very shortly and simply presented your thoughts and ideas. Thank you so much. Beautifully presented. Next, I'll move on to third presenter, Thank you. Aaron Theron. Aaron Theron is here. Aaron Theron from PhD scholar at some university. Okay, next, Mega Summon. Mega Summon is there. Akansha, oh. she's. Shri Darshini is there. Next presenter, Shri Darshini. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Shri Darshini, you will present your paper. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sri Deshni, and today I'm here to talk about the religion in our society. As we know, uh, religion has played a significant role in shaping our culture and history. It has influenced the way we think, behave, and interact with one another. Uh, religion has been around for thousands of years, and it has served as a source of comfort, guidance, and hope for people. Uh, across the globe, it has provided us with a moral compass, a set of values, beliefs that help us to navigate the complexities of life. However, religion has also been the cause of conflict and divisions throughout our history. We have seen how different religious beliefs have led to wars and discrimination. It is important to acknowledge the negative effect of religion and work towards promoting peace and harmony. In today's world, we see a growing trend of secularism. People are, question, people are questioning uh, the relevance of religion in the modern era. However, I believe that religion is still has a significant role to play in our society. It provides a sense of community and belonging. And it can be a source of strength during difficult times. As we move forward, we need to find ways to bridge the gap between different religions and promote tolerance and understanding. We must recognize while we may have different beliefs, we are all human beings with the same hope and dreams. In conclusion, religion has both positive and negative effects on our society. It is up to as to ensure that it is used for the betterment of humanity, let us work towards creating a world where all religions are respected and celebrated. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Shridhasini. You have presented wonderfully. Uh, and how to bridge the gap between all the religions and uh, how to avoid the inequality. Oh, really wonderful. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, next we shall move on to the next part participant. Neha Samant is here. Neha Samant. Am I audible? Neha Samant. Yes, ma'am. You are audible, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yes, yes, yes. You can present your paper. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You can present your paper. Uh, about spiritual crisis of identity of Leo Tolstoy's work. The concept of identity crisis talks about the stage of confusion one person started to feel in life, a phase of uncertainty in which a person started to question his identity, existence, and beliefs that he was experiencing and living with till now. The person started to question who he is and what is the purpose of his life. 
And this situation happens when the person is hit by certain things that shake the belief system in which he or she used to believe till now. Or when a certain big change occur in their life due to stress or mental trauma. This sudden occurrence of spiritual crisis happen after some events like a near death experience that Ivan and Ray and Perry exper uh, experienced that changed their way of looking at things, existential crisis, some ex uh, spiritual experiences and realization of their mistakes. And self-doubts are some of the reasons that an urgent need to search for a meaningful path emerges within them. In most of uh, his work, Tolstoy, in uh, Tolstoy, in most uh, in uh, most of his work, like Anna Karenina, Resurrection, War and Peace, and Death of Ivan Illich, presents the uh, presented the inner struggle of his character. Uh, all of a sudden, an occurrence of an event disrupt uh, the easy flow, easy going uh, flow of their life, which led them to reevaluate their purposes, beliefs, attitude, and conception of life, which earlier seems to be the only truth and correct way, uh, correct way of living. All of a sudden, after the disruption, seems to be a lie, and an urgent need to search for the real identity emerges within their conscience, and this spiritual ice, uh, crisis changes their whole identity. This new acceptance of their uh, newly discover, uh, discovered identity or self gives us spiritual salvation and eternal bliss as stableness within themselves. The sudden changes in their character's perception, attitude, and identity bring them towards a meaningful change and that enhances their ability to comprehend their actions. The spiritual crisis saved them by causing a meaningful disturbance that releases them from their inner suffering that they experience after recognizing their wrong deeds. Although in some characters' life, these crises do occur very late, it is this presentation of disillusionment and spiritual awakening realistically and factually that make Tolstoy's work more noteworthy and appealing to the majority of people who can find their replica in the characters' crisis, sins, and spiritual awakening. With this note, I, like to, I would like to end my topic. Thank you, ma'am. Hello? Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, thank you, Neha Saman. Uh, yeah, yes, you are audible. You are very much audible. Uh, you have given a beautiful presentation on Leo Stoltz's uh, work by mentioning uh, his famous writings, uh, Anna Karina and uh, War and Peace. And uh, actually, uh, he's an unbelievable writer. He changed the world through his writing. Yes, ma'am. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Am I out? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. That you're really your uh, title and your uh, explanation was thought-provoking and you have given good ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am.